with our, um, our committee karakia i noi tātou. Kia hore te mani no kia whakapapa paunami te moana hei hua rahi mā tātou e te rangi nei. Aroha atu, aroha mai tātou i a tātou katoa. Hui e tāiki e. So welcome everybody to, um, to our committee. Um, we have a, 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 a big agenda, but the best thing is we also have cooperation from everybody on this particular call because I know that they have read their agenda and all the attachments. So let's get into it. Um, Maya, I think we'll need to do the, the roll call. Yes, I know we've got a quorum, but it'll be good to see who's online. If that's okay, please, Maya. Kia ora, Chair. Okay. Councillor Bartley. Morena. Morena. Councillor Casey. Morena Maya. Lena. Deputy Mia Cashmore. Kia ora. Kia ora. Councillor Collins. Kia ora Maya. Kia ora. Councillor Coombe. Councillor Cooper. Tēnā koe, Maya. Tēnā koe. Councillor Dalton. Morena, Maya. Morena. Councillor Darby. Kia ora, Tato. Kia ora. Councillor Fletcher. Kia ora, Anna. Kia ora, Anna. Mia Goff. Morena, Tato. Morena. Councillor Hills. Kia ora, Koto, Katoa, Maya, and Chair. Kia ora. Morena. IMSB member Tony Kaki. Kia ora. Kia ora. Councillor Mulholland. Good morning, everyone present. Morning. Councillor Newman. Good morning, Maya. Morning. Councillor Simpson is online. I can see her there. She's not an apology this morning. Councillor Stewart. Good morning. Councillor Walker. Good morning. Morning, Councillor Watson. Hello, Mark. Hello. IMSB member Glenn Mulcox. Uh, tēnā koutou. Tēnā koe. Councillor Young. Kia ora, tāja tāo. Kia ora. Thank you, Chair. Kia ora, Namai. And um, uh, before we, we, we sort of move into... Um, the apologies. I just wanted to acknowledge uh, Sandra Gordon and also Sandra Utul, who is helping Maya um, with our agenda today. Um, also, I just want to acknowledge uh, the passing of our Rangatira uh, Matua Jackson, also of our Fire Fire June Jackson, and um, um, also Councillor Sayers, um, his mother. Um, just wanted to acknowledge those passings um, for us all and um, uh, I, I know that I think at the governing body there would be more acknowledgements in regards to uh, the mahi that, that, that each of those have played. And um, also, um, um, once we end up finishing the full agenda, there is a link to the confidential item. So um, we'll now move into the apologies and I've got an apology from Councillor Sayers. Councillor Henderson also got um, uh, an apology from Councillor Simpson uh, on council business, early departure uh, for Councillor Darby. And are there any others before I uh, move it? There is a mover and seconder myself. Uh, Councillor Casey as the mover and seconder will be myself. Are there any other uh, apologies? Mr. Chair, I'm also an early departure. Yep, sorry, Councillor Fletcher first and then Councillor Collins. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm I'm also an early departure on council business. Thank you. Oh, bye. Uh, Councillor no, Collins. Sorry. Thanks, Chair. I'll just be away between 12, I think 12.30 and 1.30 for a public service Zoom. Um. Mr. Chair, Linda Cooper here. I need to leave by five. Thank you. Kapai. Uh, Chair, Chris, Councillor Darby here. Um, yeah. I'm not. I'm not on council business. I'm on private business. It's uh, a in a meeting that's been long set down, unfortunately. No, kapai. 
Maya, just to uh, ask if you've got all those. I know they, they came sort of flying at you. That's all right. We do have them all. Okay. Give me one else, can, uh, Chair. Just can the, you, sorry. So, Matua Kake? Yeah, so 30 minutes, I'll be out from 11.15. Kapai, Councillor Fletcher. I'm just noting on council business, if, if Maya can please adjust that. Thank you. Kapai, it's on our screen, so I'll just, uh, I'll apply my three second rule and then we can uh, put the recommendation. As I said, it's been moved by Councillor Casey and seconded by myself for the apologies. Yep, three seconds gone. I will move it. All those in favour? Aye. 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 Against? Aye. Carried. Um, and Councillor Bartley has noted that she has to leave by 7pm. I think that's when we'll be having dinner. Um, Aye, okay. that's right. That's not beginning. Yeah. So hopefully uh, we'll be all done by then. Um, declaration of interest. Um, I think it's item 18 for me, Mr Chair, is it? The, um, around alcohol something? Yeah. Is it 18? Maya, can you that get noted, please? Yes, we'll note that. I hope I've got yeah. that number right. I looked at it yesterday, I might have. Yeah, and um, we know the one. Thank you. And also, are there further, any further? No? Okay, we'll move on. Um, on to uh, confirmation of minutes. Uh, I will move that. Councillor Casey, can you second? Yep, second, okay. Alfie. There's no discussion. Um, minutes for confirmation. I'll uh, put the recommendation. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Against? Aye. Carried. Um, in regards to item four petitions, I've spoken to Councillor Bartley um, this morning and um, Lorenzo. This, this particular item will be deferred to the next uh, committee meeting, which is in June. Um, so there's, there's no need to move that. So thank you, Councillor Bartley, for advising us in regards to that. And we look forward um, to, to hearing from Lorenzo um, in the next meeting. Sorry to interrupt, Chair, but we do need to move this. Oh, my humble apologies. So, Councillor Bartley, can you move and I will second um, the deferral of um, the petition to June? Happy to, to move or second? Thank yeah, you, Chair. I'll, I'll get you to move it and I'll, I'll second that if that's okay. Thank you, Chair. Okay, then. Um, so, the motion is on there to defer to the next um, PACE committee meeting. I'll put the recommendation. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Against? Aye. Carried. Public input, just to advise everybody that I've declined one um, public input, and that's from Boopsy Moran, Auckland Middle School Art Association. Uh, the reason I've declined is under 7.7.3D, um, just around reducing the public input, but also what I've done is advised um, Boopsy um, as of um, last night that um, um, her her request, and we we heard later um, that the request was for funding of um, an event, and also um, wanted to discuss. Uh, the lease um, with some of the uh, council venues and um, it was better for um, that request to go through to the process that we have for applications uh, for events, especially in, in this particular case, an, an art event for our rangatahi. And around the leasing, um, that has gone through to our director for Customer and Community Services, Dr Claudia Weiss, and also um, uh, Samantha, who I contacted both last night in regards to the email. So that's the reason for the, the decline. Um, we do, however, have public input, and I just wanted to make sure that Ian Short, Melody Mobsby, and Joy Marslin are on the call. 
Uh, yes, Chair, Ian Shorts. Join Alison. Uh, Melody's struggling to get in, but I think we can probably um, start when you're ready. Okay, then. Well, look, um, um, in, in regards to the public input, I'm going to get His Worship the Mayor uh, to move, uh, move this, and I will second and uh, put it on the table for discussion um, and, and for your public input. So um, to the three of you, um, if we have the three, I'm just going to leave it to you now to, to put through. Is that okay, Your Worship? Yep, happy with that. Thank you. Hilda. So all yours, um, Joy, is the whole three here now? Uh, yes, I'll, I'll, I'll kick off. So, uh, Tanakoto, I'm Ian Short. I'm chair of Auckland Foundation. And um, I'm joined by Joy Marslin and hopefully Melody Mosby, who's our, who's our GM um, soon. So just very quickly, I'm going to take you through um, uh, who we are, what we, um, what we do. Um, so Auckland Foundation is a community foundation. We're one of 17 in New Zealand and around 1,700 globally. And a community foundation is a not-for-profit organisation that's established to make it easy for people to give to things that matter in their city or region. As Auckland's Community Foundation, we've got a small executive, less than um, three FTE, and a, a very active voluntary board that supports generous Aucklanders through the provision of independent expert advice and easy tax efficient giving. So with our focus on making it easy for people to give to things that matter for Auckland and Aucklanders, uh, there's clearly strong alignment with the council priorities, including with those in the long term plan. Um, most community foundations globally have a close relationship with their local council and uh, in Auckland, um, we're no exception. Uh, over the last nine months or so, we've been working closely with officials to evolve this relationship so we have stronger alignment on focus areas and uh, that we can identify some tangible functions that Auckland Foundation can provide to the council um, as we're in, I guess, quite challenging times. And our board, we welcome this clo closer working and, and stronger alignment as a way of, um, I guess, really helping to increase generosity into, into the causes that matter in Tamaki Makoto. Without a little intro then, I'll pass over to my uh, colleague, Joy. Kia ora, everyone. Councillor, it's oh, lovely to see you. Thank you so much for the committee for uh, allowing us uh, a few minutes just to take you through this presentation before the um, recommendation is given to you later today. Uh, I was wondering if we could just slip, I'm just going to quickly uh, summarise the three slides that we've given. So if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, I, I, it's, it's our understanding that the council have supported the Community Foundation for Tamaki Makaurau on the basis that having access to public, private and philanthropic funds uh, will help the city prosper. Um, the foundation approved uh, its new strategy in 2019 with two main pillars. One is to encourage uh, generous Aucklanders to establish endowments for the long-term benefit of the city, and two is to fundraise for the areas of need in Auckland, uh, primarily aligning, as Ian said, to the long-term plan. And that was really the basis of the Hariki Gulf Regeneration Fund launch last year. Uh, our strategy has been somewhat constrained in the last two years. However, despite that, uh, we have been successful in managing our expenses and have continued to make some strong impact with our grants. Um, if we could just go to the second, uh, the next slide, please. This slide shows, um, really uh, illustrates our history. Uh, we, we are driven to, to attain financial independence. Uh, but to do that, of course, we have to grow. To this end, we've been growing our profile among our donors who can give, as well as continuing to support the communities in need. And you can see that by the amount we've been distributing uh, each year. We have managed to reduce our re um, reliance on council. We repaid a loan uh, that you were generous enough to give us uh, some time ago, and also no longer use the matched funding. Um, and, and we've focused a lot on growing the uh, new donors and also the bequest pipeline. I think one of the heartening things that we've seen, particularly this year, 
uh, is the tangible evidence that our profile is growing uh, because we're receiving regular unsolicited inquiries about our service now on a weekly basis. If we might go to the next slide, please. Um, building significant endowments for the perpetual benefit of the city will take time, but um, the value in having endowments available at times of crisis or in need has been really seen over the last uh, little while. Um, our ability to respond by providing early emergency response in our first lockdown was one of those examples. And more recently, um, showing Auckland City's uh, support for the Tongman community uh, when their homeland was devastated by the volcano. So our, um, what we're asking is, is for some uh, ongoing financial support, uh, but we want to do that by seeking a more effective and proactive uh, philanthropic partnership with the Council to align with, your, with the Council's goals uh, where we can clearly add value through fundraising uh, and granting services um, and, and encourage more genius Aucklanders to support that. I'm going to leave it there and just open up for any questions rather than uh, me talking, if that's okay for any time we have left. Look, thank you, Joy. I'm going to go to Melody because I see Melody there and I don't, I'm unsure if Melody has anything uh, further to say before I open up for any part though. Melody, I'm just going to offer you that. Uh, no, just echo everything that Ian and Joy said, and we look forward to a strong partnership with our council for the long-term benefit of the city. Okay, look, um, I'm going to open it up for any part, but I wanted to sort of see um, your worship as, as the mover, and I know this is unusual in regards to any comments, but do you have any sort of opening comments for Ian, Joy and Melody? And if you ha if so, um, please make them now, um, and then um, we'll get into our part. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thanks very much, Mr. Chair, and, and just to acknowledge the work done by the Auckland Foundation and uh, you know the potential that exists there to um, get a philanthropic contribution um, towards causes that are really important uh, to people in the city. Uh, much more common in places like the United States than in New Zealand, but it is growing here. And, uh, you know, we want you to do well and be part of that. Um, maybe I can just throw my my question in, uh, Mr. Chair, at the, at the moment. And, you know, you've, you've talked a little bit about, um, you know, some of the things that you're supporting, the, the COVID fund and I think we put something like uh, thirty thousand towards the the Tongan Relief Fund after the uh, after the volcanic eruption, but can you give us a little bit of a <clears throat> more of a flavour about the sort of causes, the one point six million that you're distributing, the sort of causes that that's going towards, and maybe within the limits imposed by privacy, um, give us a bit of a flavour of the sort of people that um, or the backgrounds of the people that um, are, are providing the funding. Uh, through philanthropic uh, giving. That would be really helpful. Thank you. Um, so the um, 1.6 is spread over a lot of grassroots charities with, with, within Auckland and like the donors who are giving, the recipients are quite diverse. So it's anything from scholarships, education, the environment, with the COVID times recently, a lot of immediate food bank type support, um, supporting vulnerable families, everything across the spectrum where our donors uh, want to give and support their communities, we, we help that process. Hi. I think I could add a little bit on the flavour of our donors because the there is a, a shift, I think, now. There's been a, a significant intergenerational wealth transfer, as, as you know, about, about to happen. And increasingly, um, we are seeing people, and in, in, you, you'll see that this in the Quest pipeline, recognising that perhaps not all of their funds need to go to family now, and that there is an opportunity for a part of that to be um, given back and so we are increasingly talking to who, who you might see as individuals and family officers at that boomer stage of their demographic um, uh, but also we are seeing an increased number of businesses looking to uh, support the city as well 
<laughs> right. Th thank you very much. That that helps. Um, you know, it's interesting that uh, the the baby boomer generation that's done pretty well, particularly out of property prices, uh, looking to see what they might uh, contribute back to. I think that's a, a fertile field to uh, uh, to uh, to discover. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, matua kake, I think, whakaro. Yeah, kia ora. Uh, I, I do have a question too, but I'll save that for the question time too, uh, Alf. Just uh, just a general comment. Good to see uh, Amokura Panoho on your, on as a trustee or as in your governance space. Um, I think, you know, just a general comment, anything we can uh, partner with philanthropy is, is a good step in, a, in the right direction because that's what true partnerships are all about. It's not just all government money or local government money. It's around, uh, you know, we're walking beside our, our generosity, the the partners. So just wanted to open statement around that. And, and you know, one plus one in these kind of situations will always equal 100. Kia ora. So look, um I've um, got no further questions or whakaro apart from um, a, a, as long because we've been um, in Auckland region, um, I, I, I think some people are protective and the south side is one of them, that it's not Auckland City. I, 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 just, I just thought I'd add that it's the city is the city from south side perspective and, and others. But look, it's just, it's just really, um, it, we, we are now um, Auckland Council, but more importantly, Auckland Region. Um, that's that's really Thank my you. Thank you. Yeah. On board. Thank you. Kapai. Now, um, Maya, I, sorry, was there not... Okay, Maya, can, can we include the three names um, in our recommendation, please? Um, just to thank Ian Short, Joy Maslin, and Melody Mobsby in regards to their presentation. Well done. Thank you. And it's been moved and seconded. So, again, thank you so much, Joy, in regards to, to you and the team with the Tongan Relief. Um, thank you so much with the funds and for those the closing comments from me was there was $25,000 out of the funds that were kept by Auckland Foundation. Thank you so much for that. 15 went to the actual uh, relief that was happening. Mount Smart and 10,000 went to the Tongan government. So Joy, Ian and Melody, thank you so much. Um, I will now put the recommendation uh, and it's on our screen. So all those in favour? Aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Thank you again. Thank you. Just want to then move into um, our local board input. There were five requests, none were declined. Um, our first one, and um, um, they know the rules in regards to, um, to uh, speaking time. So the first one is Kai Pātiki Local Board and John Gillen, the Chair, and Melanie Kenrick. Um, member, it's in regards to Chelsea Estate Heritage Park. Um, I have got a mover and seconder. Um, that will be Councillor Darby and Councillor Hills, respectively. And I'm just going to invite both uh, John and um, Melanie to present um, the local board input. Tēnā kōrua to you both. Tēnā koutou katoa, ko John Gillanaho, no kaipatiki aho. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair and Committee, for allowing Melanie Kenrick and myself to present to you today on behalf of the Kaipatiki Local Board on a topic that is very close to our hearts and the culmination of decades of work. Um, so do we have the presentation there, please? Thank you. Um, before we begin, we'd like to extend a huge thank you to the staff who have done a lot of investigative work on this on our behalf, reviewing legal aspects and historical information, and for creating a framework for assessment. They've kept in touch with the local board and given us several updates along the way. Thank you. But unfortunately, we don't agree with their conclusions, um, which we'll get to later. Uh, next slide, please. Many of you will be familiar, 
sorry, sorry. Yeah, many of you will be familiar with this view of a green oasis across the harbour, visible from much of inner Auckland. This headland is already a regional jewel, and what we are proposing to the committee is for much of this area to become a regional park. Uh, next slide, please. This map shows the entire headland. The green areas are the three local parks that we are proposing to amalgamate into a regional park. Cowrie Point Centennial Park, Chatswood Reserve and Chelsea State Heritage Park. The red area to the left is New Zealand Defence Force land and the orange area further to the left is Cowrie Point Domain, both of which could potentially be added to the park in the future. Uh, next slide, please. As much as we'd love to be able to take the credit for this proposal, the idea has been around since at least 1997 when Chirpa was formed and a campaign began to purchase land from Chelsea Sugar and amalgamate it with other parks to form a regional park. After much fundraising, the land was purchased with contributions from ASB Communities Trust, Auckland Regional Council, North Shore City Council and the central government and in 2009 was established as Chelsea Estate Heritage Park. However, despite this funding from across Auckland and New Zealand, Chelsea was established as a local park and not a regional park. At this time, the council also signed up to an agreement to fund the maintenance of the park up to a high level of service. And we've had advice from council's legal team, which I can't go into here, although it'll be available to you. But needless to say, the local board is finding it difficult to achieve council's legal obligation within our limited budget for that high level of service. Um, next slide, please, and I'll hand over to Melanie Kenrick. So recently, um, when the PACE committee consulted on the regional um, management plan for parks, uh, for the regional parks, this document provides a vision for the future of regional parks. And for this reason, uh, both Chelsea um, Chirpa and also the Kaipataki Local Board um, provided a submission on why we believe it should become a regional park. Now, some of the reasons are it has the most beautiful panoramic views of the Waitemata Harbour, Auckland Harbour Bridge, the CBD, right up to the Waitakere Ranges. At some point, Auckland are, is going to have tourists return to the city, and this would provide sort of an iconic uh, visitor experience. There are uh, um, extensive English estate um, parklands and picturesque lakes. It's also a park with a cultural story that reflects a lot of the human activities. On Curry, Curry Point, there is an existing par. Now, the North Shore, we don't actually have an extensive number of pars. Uh, there's a, one very significant one under the Harbour Bridge, which unfortunately, because it's had the Harbour Bridge sort of built over it, it hasn't allowed um, maybe sort of the amount of uh, respect that it, it deserves. So Kari Point has a significant Māori pa. There's the early colonial history with the establishment of the sugar works and cottages. These are all Category A listed heritage sites. There's evidence of gum digging and also the military site uh, further up. And then if you go right up to Hellier's Creek, there's um, evidence of Kari, Kari milling that used to take place up there. The heritage cottages could provide, could be used for ranger accommodation or visitor information. There's huge economic benefits that could be gained from Chelsea, um, both in tourism and revenue potential. There's educational opportunities. Um, I could imagine there's opportunities to learn about biodiversity. Um, there's a range of different uh, um, ecological uh, environments down there. There's been, I think, about 50 different recordings of, of various birds in the in the bush. There's extensive walking, trampling, cycling opportunities, as well as water-based opportunities. Chelsea Bay is a beautiful sheltered bay that could be used for paddle boarding. It's also got access to the uh, Waitemata Harbour, where there's often you, you'll see some people doing kite surfing out there. There's unrivaled biodiversity and wildlife opportunities. Um, people have long talked about the potential for kiwi to be introduced into, into parts of this bush. Um, it, it's an important ecological corridor which supports wildlife across Auckland. 
is often used as a stop off point for birds who um, who travel between both the, between the islands and also Waitakere ranges. Uh, it's also a park that's accessible by public transport. There's a short walk and there are tracks that go down to uh, from the Birkenhead Township down to the park. Uh, Chelsea Sugar, in fact, have actually talked about the possibility of opening up the wharf and the possibility of ferries being used and uh, increasing the access to the park through through that option. Sorry to interrupt. This presentation has reached five minutes. Okay. A park that's accessible to Auckland's population growth. We're expecting huge population growth both in Auckland and also around the Albany areas. It has the opportunities for financial partnership. Both you could look at Chelsea Sugar Works. It, um, the park has a history of attracting philanthropic philanthropic donations. Um, I'm sure the Auckland Foundation might be also interested in this as an opportunity. Including Chelsea within your network of regional parks would help you meet many of the challenges you have already identified within your draft report. So looking at some of the problems that have been identified within this report. The plan notes that in order to provide for a growing population, purchase of more regional parkland will be desirable. Population growth is planned to be concentrated around Auckland and Albany and Northwest. So this proposal does not require any further land to be purchased. The plan also notes that radical changes are needed in both how we access regional parks and the emissions from created from visiting regional parks. Our proposal would provide a regional park that is more accessible to the population than most existing regional parks, meaning, meaning less carbon emissions. The plan Sorry notes to interrupt again. The presentation has now reached six minutes. Okay. The proposal offers the opportunity for Aucklanders to access regional parks through walking, boating, cycling or public transport. And there's also um, huge um, opportunities for recreational development. I'll pass it over to you, John. John, just can you just give us an indication as to uh, uh, how long you've got left or um, whether you're wrapping up now, please? Yeah, my apologies. Could we please have an extension of time just by a couple of minutes? I just want to... Um, touch on the actual uh, present, uh, the, the assessment you'll be receiving this afternoon. I'm happy yeah. to move an extension of time. And happy to second, Mr. Chair. Yeah, so look, John, yep, if you just Thank go you. ahead with I'll, it. Go as, yeah. I'll go as quickly as can. Thank you. Um, so uh, next slide, please. Um, these are just pretty pictures. Um, so this afternoon, you may hear from staff that Chelsea doesn't make the cut for a regional park or is inconclusive. Have we note that the assessment has been done primarily on only Chelsea and not the three parks combined, which may alter the findings? The first issue that has been um, they've, they've touched on is that the Chelsea State Heritage Park is impacted by the ongoing operations at the Chelsea Sugar Factory. We disagree. The entire park and Chelsea Sugar property are together listed as a Category 1 historic place. The heritage nature of the factory adds the aesthetics, vista and history of, this, of the park. Chelsea Sugar allows park visitors to access their land, including the playground and car park. Chelsea Sugar takes a keen interest on in the development and upkeep of the park. When the three parks are viewed as a whole, the factory takes up a small amount of the headland. The second issue they identified is that Chelsea um, has limited recreational opportunities. Again, we disagree. The three parks together have a large network of tracks of varying difficulty, as well as ponds, open grass areas, recreation and picnicking, a large sandy beach in Kendall Bay, scenic lookouts and a connection to Chelsea Bay. There are also heritage features and an artwork. The next issue they identified is that Chelsea is predominantly used by the local board's residents, but the research actually showed that 40 percent of visitors came, only 40 percent of visitors came from the Kaipatiki local board area, which is not a majority, and that 40 percent came from further afield than North Shore and Waitakere. And why, regardless of that, the three parks are currently local parks are not promoted as a regional park, so it is to be expected that many visitors are local, and it is a conclusion that is likely to be reached for any prospective regional park. Um, with many prospective regional parks not attracting any visitors, 
The next issue is that visitor infrastructure is insufficient to cater to Auckland wide catchment. This will be the case for any prospective regional park. Um, however, the Chelsea Cottages and Manager House have the scope to be repurposed from tenanted houses to visitor infrastructure, heritage attractions, ranger accommodation, or accommodation for overnight park visitors. There is space around the toilet block for expansion if required. There is space to expand or upgrade the car parks if required. And there's grass space that could be enhanced with barbecues and park furniture if required. And the last issue is the reserve is not used to host major events. Um, and it's, it's true it is not currently used for events other than private weddings. However, it does have the space to be used for events and applications for such have been received in the past. Um, final slide, please. Um, we'd just like to ex again extend a thank you for having us here today. And we really hope that you do give this um, significant decision thorough consideration and that we will soon have a new regional park in the heart of Auckland. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Thanks, Melanie. Look, I'm going to go out to questions, and I, sh I know I should have put the uh, recommendation to extend the time. Um, but look, I'm going to go to the part time, make it short and sweet, please, because we've still got four more local boards uh, to present. Councillor Watson, followed by Councillor Walker, and then Matua Kake. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, a, a question to you, John, a, a very good presentation from the, both you and Melanie, and it goes to that key point you made on the assessment. I'm looking at the map um, of the very substantial headland here, uh, so I just want to reiterate the point that uh, your proposal would combine the Chelsea Estate Heritage Park, which is uh, bounded by the Cowrie Point Centennial Park, which actually goes up into Chatswood Reserve and uh, across to Carry Point Domain, leaving the, the New Zealand Defence Force. So looking at the map, that essentially amounts to all of that um, headland once the New Zealand Defence Force land is included. So that, that may or may not be a given, but, but certainly um, that key point uh, that you mentioned in terms of the extent of the land here involves all those three um, existing parks plus the Chatswood Reserve and at some point conceivably the New Zealand Defence Force. Is that correct? Uh, almost. So Chelsea State Heritage Park, Carry Point Centennial Park and Chatswood Reserve are the three that we're, we're asking for today to be amalgamated and turned into a regional park. Then there's the scope in the future to also add the defence land if that ever becomes available and then Carry Point Domain on the other side of the defence land. So this will be the first step towards achieving the entire headland as a regional park. As well. OK, th th thanks for making that clear. Councillor Darby to close it off. Sure, look, uh, thanks, thanks, John. Thanks for your... Do you um, suggest looking at... ...to... ...desirable to uh, defer this item pending further consideration? Um, having heard what you've said and mm -hmm. taking into account other... Uh, regional parks. I mean, for example, Shakespeare Regional Park has the defence land next to it that, while it's not part of the regional park, still offers, offers a, a, many of the conservation values. Um, so would you suggest that at the very least we defer this item or is there any other um, variation that you would um, voting uh, for these officer recommendations at this time? Uh, thank you, Councillor. Um, that is a decision for the committee, but of course the local board um, would dearly love to see this as a regional park. So you may need to take some advice on staff on how to respond to this report. Um, deferring may be the answer, um, but we would urge you not to agree with the officer's recommendations at this stage, please. Um, if that means further investigation, then, then that's what it means. If, if, if you're able to declare it a, res, a regional park today, then that would be fantastic. Um, but we would support something in that in that direction, please. OK, th through you, Mr Chair. The other question that I would put is, um, yes, there is um, significant support from the um, local board. I would venture to say that you would have overwhelming support from Aucklanders. Have you had any opportunity to, um, to gauge that at this point? 
No, but the, the staff did do um, some consultation on that. I, what I can tell you is that we have support from CHIRPA, which is the volunteer group at Chelsea um, State Heritage Park, and also we have support of the volunteer group um, that acts in the other two parks as well. And I believe we do have the support of, of the public as well. Thank you, Thank Councillor you, Walker. Kia. Yeah, kia ora. Councillor Walker's question was leading into where I want to go to, and that's uh, just to ask you. Kia ora, uh, John and Melanie. Thank you for your presentation, and what a beautiful part of Tamaki Makoto. What a beautiful part of uh, Auckland. And my, but my question is around um, your relationship with iwi, in terms of um, getting some of this over the line and, and your relationship with iwi. Could you comment on that? And also, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, Councillor Walker brought it up as well in terms of future intentions around the the um, army base and uh, the acquisition of that. And I just wanted to know well, what's the history there? Is that was that acquired under Public Works Act, or do you know? Kia ora. I'm, I'm afraid I can't comment on how the um, the Defence Force land was acquired. I can't recall that at the moment. Um, as far as our relationship with Iwi, um, on this particular issue, we have not discussed that directly with Iwi. However, the staff have done, and the results of that is in the agenda uh, report mm -hmm. that you have in front of you today. Um, there were some slightly different views from the different Iwi, but overall, I believe that they would like to see what is best for the park, and if that means to to go ahead with a regional park, then they would support that. Um, but there's a bit more detail in the report in front of you. Yes, yes, I read that, but it's about yeah, yeah. I, I think building a closer relationship if you want to get this over line is is important, which is why I'm raising it, and even more so with the future development around the or potential around the army base. Hey, you know, yeah, uh, I acknowledge it. Thank you, thank you. This Public Works Act stuff, um, there's it's a whole different game, as you know. Kia ora, Mato. Um, Councillor Darby, to close this this part off, bearing in mind there's another local board who's going to be talking on the same issue. Kia ora. Kia ora, Chair. Uh, kia ora, kōrua, um, Melanie and John. Thanks for that. Hey, look, I'll be, be quick there. Just following up on Member Kaki's line, that was my question too. So, in, in arriving at the board's position, it was in the absence of uh, engagement with the 12 Mata Whenua tribes that show an interest here. And then the staff have actually, uh, in building this report, have made contact. So is, are you confirming, John, that there is no relationship with the 12 Mata Whenua in arriving at, at your board view? That is that that is partially correct. Yes, um, we haven't directly engaged with Manafenua on this particular issue. We do on other issues, of course, and we have we've met recently on Little Shoal Bay issues. But on this particular one, we haven't. This was um, this has come about now because of the recent um, consultation that that this committee has undertaken on the reserve. <laughs> Uh, management plan for your regional parks so we took the opportunity to submit on that so what we really wanted to do was to find out just so to, to put the idea on the on the table what we were hoping was that you would actually include it in your draft plan to go out for consultation and then we would hear from the wider public on that and mana Fena at that stage as well um, but i understand that's not that's not how the process has worked out um, but look we, we are happy to take this to mana Fenua as well um, we would like to hear what the, the committee here has to say too. Okay, and I do note that one is relatively comfortable, their very words, so look, and, and two have responded at this stage, but they're really under a lot of pressure. Very quickly with the balance of the questions, and I'll allow um, yourself and Melody just pick these up. This is a reversal of the subsidiarity um, um, requests that we normally um, ask for. This is uh, taking it up and away from communities, so you might like to comment on that and any possible risks. And the other one, uh, John and Melanie, um, is the Kapatiki local board and the community, if, there, if this was to proceed and become a regional park, my expectation is the patronage going there would be far, far greater. Is the board and the local communities and especially local neighbours, do you think that they would be open to significant, quite significant growth in patronage uh, coming into the park. I'll leave the questions there, Chair, and thank you, John and Melanie. Thank you, Councillor. 
the local board wants what is best for this park and what is best for this park we believe is for it to be a regional park and we think it deserves to be a regional park and it has the has been a long campaign for it to be a regional park so we would like the opportunity there for it to become a regional park we understand that there would be an increase in patronage and that has already happened to extent when the um, Chelsea Sugar Factory opened up its cafe there's been a, a large uh, a greater number of people going down there and we've been upgrading tracks and so forth to accommodate that and we're looking at a car park there as well. Um, so look, we understand that. We understand there may be some changes in policy and that and we're prepared to work through that um, with yourselves. Um, the local groups are prepared to work through that as well. So we acknowledge there will be some changes, but what is best for the park in the long term, we believe, is for it to become a regional park. Can I just add in there, Chris, that I think it's an opportunity to have a little bit of a vision about how we actually, if hypothetically Chelsea were to become a regional park, you know, could it be designed so that it's, you know, primarily accessible by public transport? Um, could we actually put some, some things in there? I mean, it will be a good opportunity for Birkenhead businesses and there are um, some downsides, as, as you have highlighted, um, that we have been aware of. But you know, I, I think that there's an opportunity with a bit of vision to actually, you know, look at the needs that have been highlighted in your plan and actually tailor tailor the park to, to meet those needs. I mean, it, it could sort of address the issue of not enough parks accessible by the community for, you know, the disabled people or an ageing population and uh, how do we make it so it's only accessible by public transport? Okay, thank you both. Thank you, um, Councillors Independent Māori Statutory Board. The recommendation has been moved and seconded. I will put the recommendation. All those in favour? Aye. 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 Against? Aye. Carried. Move on to, um, thank you both. Thank you. <clears throat> Move on to uh, Rodney Local Board 6.2. Got the Chair Phelan Pitty and Louise Johnston. Um, Millwater Silver Day Community Needs Investigation. It will be moved by Councillor Watson and Councillor Cashmore. Um, so I welcome both um, Phelan and Louise. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll keep it really quick. Um, Victoria's got a, a, a presentation with some of the detail. So um, I guess we're in the unusual position of coming along, and I think it's the first time I've ever done this, where... <laughs> There's a report being presented and, and we're not happy with the way that it's been put together. And we're here to request that you consider uh, perhaps knocking back this report and getting staff to go back and, and have a careful look at how it's been put together. The primary um, overall con concerns that we've got with this is that um, particularly in Rodney, it hasn't included the entire future urban area. It's cut across it. So there's a large chunk of future urban growth area that, that hasn't been included. Um, councillors will probably have seen that memo that came out to us last week where it talked about uh, growth. Um, I see that Rodney local board is sitting just behind Papakura in 21% growth last year. Uh, this particular area that, that, that this... Um, piece of work covers is one of our fastest growing areas and is also going to be one of our biggest. The other issue um, is that the, um, as, as you discussed yesterday, I believe it was, or perhaps it's over the last few weeks you've been discussing this, is the National Policy Statement on Urban Development. We all know what's coming with that. And so a lot of these surrounding areas, particularly around Whangaparaa and, and Silverdale, are actually going to have increased density of urban development. And um, I don't believe that staff have really taken this into consideration. And uh, there are a number of other issues which Victoria um, will highlight. But as a board, we're not happy with the um, way this report has been put together and the quality of the information on it. Um, that's all I've got. Um, I'm I'm happy to take questions or you might want to leave it till, till Victoria's done her presentation. Uh, bearing in mind, Phelan, that we've got about three odd minutes left, I'll get uh, sure. the presentation done and then we'll go into Partai after that. Cool. Um, well, I, I, I've finished. That's me done. Yeah. So, so yep. Victoria, all yours. Or is it Louise? I think, Louise, you're going to 
No, it's, uh, no, Victoria, it's, Vic yeah. it's, it's Victoria. Yeah, no, I'm just looking at the chat bar, Phelan. So is that you, Victoria? Uh, yeah, I do have a presentation, Mr. Chairman. Uh, that a slideshow. Okay, uh, Maya's just made you a presenter. That's why I, I mentioned uh, earlier. Right. So you could then share it and do that from there. Um, okay. Sorry, this will just uh, give me a minute. Apologies. Victoria, the only option that you have is to send the presentation to Maya and then Maya can do it from her. Yeah, I can do that right now. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, how long is the presentation, Victoria, please? Uh, it should take you five minutes. Um, Hopefully shorter than five minutes. Uh, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Mr. Chair, our, our. Boards, <laughs> sorry, Mr Chair, are there two boards presenting? Do they get time each? Well, that's, that's yes, uh, they, they do with the two boards. That's why I'm hoping that this particular presentation will hopefully go into the next local board, but they still have their time allocation. Yeah, well, I think we were hoping to do it. We'll do questions together, but I think our presentation is just separately, if that's okay, Mr Chair. So I'll just, I've sent my presentation to uh, Maya. Um, hopefully she can pick it up from her end. Yeah, so just let everybody okay. know the process will be the next local board and then hopefully that'll tie in the presentation that we get now. will tie in with their presentation, but they will be given five minutes as well. Wonderful. Victoria, All right. it's on there. Can you see it now? Yes, happy, happy to start if that's okay. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, Next slide, please. So this report's premise is simple. Based on how we know facilities are used, i.e. the formula in the Community Facilities Network Plan, do we judge whether we have enough capacity in existing leisure and community facilities in a particular area to meet current growth? And will we have enough capacity over the next 30 years? However, local board has consistently pointed out serious errors within this report. Many of these errors were repeated in new iterations of the study and are still in the report in front of you. Based on these basic errors, the local board is left to question the conclusion in this report. On page seven, you'll see the beautiful privately owned Northern Arena mentioned is able to provide alternative aquatic facilities. What has not been mentioned is that this pool is not for recreation. It is a performance pool. Also, casual visits cost $25 per person. This facility is not at all like our council pools and the owners show no intention of wanting it to be used that way. Again, on page seven, you'll see four privately owned venues for hire listed. The local board has pointed out that two of these venues on the list have been sold and at least one out commissioned currently. And then leisure centres. A leisure centre should cater for 18 to 40,000 residents according to the Community Facilities Network Plan guideline, which is on page eight of the report. Yet, Stanmore Bay Leisure Centre already serves 45,000 people from the older areas of the Hibiscus Coast. So it already exceeds the capacity well before we even look at using it for the residents in the study area. Another quick example demonstrating the quality of the evidence is that our local schools were suggested to cover gaps in indoor and outdoor recreation. The four schools identified in the study have faced massive jumps in the role in the last five years, which after all is why we're conducting the study. The school facilities data in this report comes from an audit from five years ago. The local boards would ask that given that this is just four schools, that staff resurvey these four before concluding that there is available space. One positive note, however, is the note about Orewa Library. It is good that this has been flagged as a need of renewal a roof that leaks in every rainstorm in a library is not a good thing. Next slide, please. The Rodney Local Board covered the huge growth in population beyond what is expected. 
we'd like to point out some of the finer detail behind that growth that is masked by the total population figures. For example, there are two big growth areas that are just outside of the study area, but they are in the catchment of the area of the facilities that Silverdale, Milldale and Millwater residents, residents will use. Red Beach and Aaron Hills, pictured above, both have sprung up within the last few years. The residents shop, play and use facilities in Silverdale and Orewa. The lack of up-to-date population figures mean that this report hasn't included this growth, but it is thousands of new residents. Another development that is pictured in the bottom is the Botanic, one of the largest, if not the largest retirement villages in Auckland. It was developed as a result of a plan change, and it's so big it has its own childcare facility. These developments introduce a new demographic to the area of lower priced terraced housing and retirement villages. This major change in demographic has not been featured in this report, but the residents are already there. Next slide, please. We've cut out an excerpt from page 30 of the Community Facilities Network Plan. It demonstrates the part of key elements that need to be met to be tagged for funding. The highlighted sections are those that could be easily be said to be met in this area. Therefore, both local boards feel that it is important this report be redone. There are many gaps in this report. Facilities included that are not suitable and facilities not included that may be suitable and others that are mentioned that we cannot trust data on, such as the leisure centre and schools. For example, the local board expressly mentioned that there is a 3.5 million capex renewal budget set aside for an informal recreation facility in Silverdale, something that should be factored into the community provision. However, this was, has not appeared in any of the reports. We would ask that the team that produced this report collaborate both with Rodney and the Hibiscus and Bays local boards and start this investigation afresh. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you. Um, so look, um, I've got questions in about 30 seconds, so if there's no further comment from the local board, I'll get into our partai. So um, Councillor Newman, followed by Councillor Dalton, then Councillor Watson, and um, I will then put the recommendation. Kilda. Oh, look, thank you, Chair. Look, and thank you to Phelan and, Phelan and, and Victoria for, for the presentation. Chair, I wondered if if I can just um, get clarification. I, I know that uh, Claudia is is on the call in relation to item twenty. I've read that particular item, and I have, I have, I share some real concerns about the the methodology and the and the rigor in relation to the investigation that led to the assumptions in the report. Given what we've just heard. And given what I've just said and what I suspect will come up later on, I'm just wondering, Claudia, as the authorizer of this report that's on the agenda, if this particular report should possibly be pulled at this point rather than it coming up for investigate coming up for a discussion, because I'm I'm not hopeful that this is this particular item, given what we've heard today, and given what is clearly the, the gaps in the report, given the methodology or the limits in the methodology that have been applied that this report is actually appropriate for this agenda at this time. And I wondered if you could comment. Councillor Newman, I will comment on this is the political decision and that is it will go through to the agenda item and then we will have a discussion in regards to whether it gets pulled, whether it gets uh, passed, approved, but we will have that discussion at the agenda item. Kia ora. Well, thank you. Thank you, Chair. I, ho I hope that the senior officers are available because I don't want the the, 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 the policy analyst alone to be sitting there taking some questions on this. It'll need the senior officers to support. Thank you. Yeah, all the all the officers will be available for both reports and in particular this particular one. So they will be available um, when we get to the item. Uh, Councillor Dalton. Uh, thank you, Chair. And <clears throat> I'll have questions for the report too. I read it. And it was around the questions of methodology. So to the board, uh, both boards and good collaboration. The, the methodology when reading the report does not indicate that there were site visits um, or conversations held um, with um, some of those facilities perhaps that are non-council owned. Are you aware if they took place, if, if they did take place to get a good assessment of whether you can use schools, pools or, um, and you gave a good um, example, Victoria, of the pool that charges $25 and isn't for community use that was in the 
in the report. So are you aware of site visits took place? Okay, thank you. I'll leave the rest of my questions to when the report comes. But, sure, uh, I can you. just quickly, I can just quickly comment on that. We we asked that question as well, and we were told there were not the resources or or funding to do that. And in, as Victoria's pointed out, I was only talking about a few schools, so this this was not done as part of that report. Thank you, Kilda, Councillor Watson. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, a question for you, Victoria, um, in respect of your comments um, on the schools in the, in the first instance and the accuracy of information. Uh, two questions, really. One, why is Wentworth College included in that catchment? It's 16 kilometres at least away from Silverdale and Millward. It's a little private school in Gulf Harbour. So I'm assuming that's not in the catchment at all, but it's quoted there as providing indoor courts. And secondly, um, in respect of the sco other schools quoted like Kingsway, with, with the local board, for instance, the way that they're essentially the two Kingsway schools are gated schools, you can't get into them um, outside of school hours, they're locked off to the public. So I'm just curious to know as to the integrity of the information in terms of public access um, in light of both those instances there as far as the schools go? Yeah, so like you said, um, some schools were mentioned, some schools weren't. Um, and there are real concerns around some of these schools being able to actually facilitate a community to come in and use this, their sports fields, um, their indoor courts and everything like that. But Again, it was just a quick phone call. It, it, all it needed was a phone call to these schools to find out whether they could, um, you know, update the information that they had put in the report of whether they could use the the facilities or not. Um, yeah, it was it was really disappointing to see that they hadn't even tried in that sense. But um, again, there's real concerns around safety risk factors that schools have to consider to invite the community in, um, and then you've got after school activities. So it's this idea that you can use schools, um, I think is is long gone and I don't think it's it's even doable in this time. Hopefully that answers your question, John. Y yes, yes, thanks. So, uh, mm. I mean, just a quick follow up, Mr. Chair. I mean, was there, there was some negotiations with Kingsway mm. School four or five years ago that, that came to nothing and didn't end all that amicably to be honest but uh, i mean if that's the historic data then that's that's long out of date so it'd be useful sure. if that could be confirmed later thank you kia ora, john thank you um it's been moved and seconded 6.2 all those in i'll put the recommendation all those in favor aye 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 against aye, aye. against carried Thank you so much, uh, Rodney Local Board. I'm going to move to 6.3. Um, I'm I'm hoping that there won't be that much uh, said because of the combined Rodney and Hibiscus Bay's local <clears throat> local board, um, but it will be moved by John. Sorry, Councillor Watson and Councillor Walker. Now, Gary, I'm going to you, Gary, because we've seen the presentation. Gary, have you got any comments to make? Um, and I know that. The, the path I have been said, but I wanted to give you a, uh, an opportunity. Uh, we've seen the PowerPoint, so I'm just going to leave it to you, Gary, and then I'll um, um, most probably put the recommendation because the path I've already been asked, but I'll leave thank that to you, Gary. You, thank Mr. you. Look, um, <clears throat> thank you, members. Our main concern is um, I've lived in the area for a long time, 50 years now. I'd like to think I'm only 45, but it ain't going to happen. Um, and the development has been huge. Um, we are growing like you wouldn't believe. And Phelan has a very strong point about the urbanisation that's coming into Aaron Hills, Milldale, and the future for Dairy Flat area. They have to use our facilities. There's nothing there that's in, in place for the future. And the important thing is that if you can look really strongly at what can investments can be done in more community facilities. It's going to take the burden off that area completely. And that's important because we are absorbing what we can now. I think we're at 50 something thousand for Hibiscus Coast. Rodney is, is, is growing in that area, even though it's just across the road uh, to Aaron Hills. So please look at it favorably at what we can do to re reassess it, um, find what facilities there are 
a lot more capabilities of land that is available to actually build more items. And when the development comes for these developments, if you can look forward to where these future developments can be to allocate the pools, the, the community centres, the areas that can be used by not only our area, but um, Rodney area and the new dairy flat area that are uh, in the process for the 10 year plan. It's really, really important. Um, otherwise, we're going to saturate it and our infrastructure won't, won't handle it. So um, appreciate your time. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Yeah, thank you, Gary. Now, Victoria, I know you put the PowerPoint in, but I'm just going to offer you any closing remarks and then uh, I'm assuming, apart from Councillor Hills, there'd be no other pathway because we've gone through that with your presentation, Victoria. So any closing remarks from the local board before I hand it over to Councillor Hills for his pathway? No, thank you, Mr Chairman. I think I've said everything that I've needed to say and present on. So, um, tēnākwe again. Kāpai. Councillor Hills, pathway. Kia ora, Chair. Thank you. And thank you to um, the chairs and members, uh, deputy chairs, Speaking on this, I guess the question um, on a high level, apart from redoing the report, I guess, you know, when we have to balance up places like uh, Waitakere, West Auckland, which have one pool for 300,000 um, residents. And I just wonder, is this about the long term future? Because obviously we have to try and find provision for those current communities that are still under well undercooked in facilities. Is this is this more about making sure we don't make the same mistakes again, or just about trying to? Uh, I just guess the specifics, because um, we couldn't do it all anytime soon. Um, is it more about ensuring we're planning for the medium future? Um, I, I guess I'm just worried about what the expectation or the ability we have right now. If I, and is if that I'm, for um, well, um, either, no, either anyone? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm happy to, on. I'm happy to respond. Raylan, can you hold on two seconds? Sorry, please. sorry. Yeah, sorry. So, Councillor Hills, I heard you say to anyone, um, oh, yeah, but we are on the local board for hibiscus and bays. Apologies. Yeah. Um, um, but, <laughs> um, sorry. So, so, Gary, Gary, if 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 you um, want to. To leave that to fail, and I got no issue in regards to that. But like I said, we're on the item of hibiscus and bays. I don't normally get too pedantic, but I, I don't want to take the time off you, Gary, nor Victoria. So I'll leave Gary, I'll leave that to you. And if Phelan, um wants to say it, that'll be your answer as well, Gary. Um, I think Phelan is basically going to say, look, we can't leave it much longer because, uh, thank you, Councillor Hills, when you look at it, if we have a um, if you look at the report, it was looking at a 10 year plan, then it would come to the local board and then you've got to discuss and what the future plans will be. That could be another five years. You're looking at 15 to 20 years. I don't think we can waste and wait that length of time. I think that, Phelan, can you just agree with me, uh, agree with me on that one? Thanks. Um, well, I, what I was actually going to say, this isn't about swimming pools, so I don't think we should, that this, that the concerns that we've got are about the quality of the report and the information at the end of it. I don't think we should get hung up on whether this is about funding swimming pools. Those things are a long way away, but this has an impact on all types of community facilities funding yeah. over the next decade. So I, I wouldn't want councillors to think we're here because we're we're going to start spruiking for a swimming pool because I know I, that is that is not that is certainly not why we're here from the local Rodney local board. We're just concerned that the quality of this report is poor and it will have very long term implications on okay. funding. So we'll we'll get to that discussion um, in regards to the quality in regards to the quality or not. That's a decision that we will end up making um, in regards to when we get to the item. Um, Councillor Hills, any other part? I am going to put the recommendation. No, that was all. That was a clarification I needed. Thank you, Chair. Kilda, um, it's been moved and seconded. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Against? Gary, thank you. Thank you, Mr Chair. Much appreciated. Kilda, thank you. Gary. Cheerio. Um, thank you. We're moving to the next item, and we've got um, <clears throat> 6.4, Mangadir. <clears throat> Excuse me, Mangere Otahu Local Board, um, Malo Lava, Lo Fionga Lemonga. Um, also, congratulations uh, in regards to the journey um, in Parliament. So, Lemonga, it will be moved and seconded by myself and Councillor Collins, but um, I'll leave it open to you, Chair Kilda. 
Oh, tēnā koutou, uh, Chair, and thank you very much for the opportunity just to uh, present our very short presentation and then be in a position to take part tai. Uh, thank you. Um, so, uh, councillors uh, and local board chairs and members uh, just really wanting to present a, a, a viewpoint perspective from Māngari Ōtāhuhu. Next slide, please. Uh, yes, the background. Uh, so, in 2020, under emergency budget, initially the local board, Māngari Ōtāhu, we did support, uh, given the constraint on finances. In May 2021, we subsequently rescinded our support, in particular of one of the reserves, and we requested PACE to consider the same. And we then presented August 2021. Next slide, please. Uh, the local board requested a copy of the hearings report uh, to the final views to the PACE committee. Uh, staff re refused at that point, uh, and then we refused to provide further uh, recommendations or resolutions to the PACE committee. Uh, at that point also, we did have Councillor Alf and Councillor Fatnana explain uh, their position, and that's why I'm here today, uh, and apologies from Tawan or our Deputy Chair. Next slide, please. We do not dispute as a local board governing body as a decision maker in terms of, res of reserve, reserve revoking. Hearings report is primarily, uh, but not exclusively, for the benefit. And uh, what I do want to point out is reserve revoking of reserve and asset sales. We have had uh, a number of cordial with iwi uh, and our communities locally, uh, and we take all of those matters into consideration. So we do not dispute that. Next slide, please. So PACE Committee, whilst um, what is important to our board is simply that we require the information so we can make an informed decision. Uh, we have um, been asked to provide views without the report uh, and we were informed uh, by staff that once it's public, then the local board would uh, receive a copy of that report. Although not specific, we do agree with the principles, which is pointed out local boards are part of governance structure rather than the stakeholder and then the access to information. Um, and just on that, um, uh, next slide, please. So what we're asking of the PACE Committee uh, today, and I've got a couple of reasons when I uh, answer any part I, is uh, what is the harm that we're seeking to avoid in providing highly relevant and important information to local boards? Uh, and the issue of reserve revocation is we are concerned uh, that the current report, that the recommendation, which is further discussed by PACE, uh, is to uplift the reserve status uh, because it's no longer required. So we would um, oppose those recommendations recommendations that you will see further in your meeting and is there a process that can be accommodated with a principle of giving local boards further information we need. So just for your information, uh, members, uh, myself and our Deputy Chair, uh, we sat in on the hearings uh, where one specific uh, reserve, which was Ferguson Street, uh, that was a, there was a strong case put forward. The hearings panel did put forward the recommendation to be considered uh, that the reserved, if it is not in the list of reserves, um, then it be considered for the family who have been caring for it since 1979. Uh, subsequently, also the other two reserves, uh, iwi have provided their perspective in regards to why uh, keeping those reserves in the council asset um, list is important to our local community. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Happy to take any part. I. Yeah, um, and, and just to get some context, because I know that you mentioned the fact that Councillor Councillor Collins and I were at uh, the local board meeting. Um, just to the uh, committee members, um, <clears throat> the process was explained and understood by the local board uh, that we are the decision makers, as in the PACE committee, are the decision makers for the revocation of reserve status. And as a result, we will get the reports before we make our decision based on the recommendations from the independent um, the independent commissioners. So that was explained to, to um, uh, the board. Um, also, there was um, an email that I sent to the board, uh, to both boards, in fact, um, 
uh, both local boards in the Manukau ward from Julie McKee, our hearings uh, coordinator, and um, explain the reasons why the decision needs to come to PACE committee before it, 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 it goes to the local board. I did uh, explain to both local boards that once we end up getting it at our preprint agenda, is that I would share the result of the independent commissioner's decision with the relevant local boards if they requested uh, prior to um, it going out to the public agenda. So th that's just some context to, to the reason why um, Le Maunga mentioned um, myself and Councillor Fessel going to our, our monthly local board um, meetings. Councillor Collins, uh, Pātai. Oh, th thanks, Chair, and you've um, pretty much answered what I was going to ask, so I do appreciate that full and thorough um, res uh, uh, a piece of sharing that you've just given us. But I wondered then if I could put the question to the Chair that given that particular process, which you both, I remember you, you outlined it very clearly at the local board meeting and you did welcome a response uh, prior to the uh, public notification. The Chair, I was wondering if that was a, if that worked for you, if that was a process that you thought was enabled the local board to consider the information. It may have felt a little bit tight, but do you think that that was an idea that maybe got us around some of the uh, kind of um, legal law or regulatory parameters that Councillor Alf invited you to participate in, in or get the, the information in front of you as soon as possible? Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Fanana, for the question. I guess to be um, frank is what we understand as local board, when uh, reports are being considered by uh, various committees and governing body, it's important to capture uh, the views of the local board and they may not be agreed to. We may have different opinions and I'm, I'm hoping I'm answering your question correctly. It's important that because so, so just to give a bit more context, the grower that a number of other local boards at this time have mentioned, we're quite worried as a local board as to the impact on our local facilities. And we see the reserve revoc revocations in Māngari in Ōtahuhu really um, something that we oppose strongly to. We've had a number of comments uh, from iwi, our iwi engagement, and also our communities. And in particular, what the three reserves in this report, um, uh, is, it is important for the local board to receive all the information that we are privy to though, so that we can make an informed decision, we can provide some recommendations. And at this point, staff withheld that. I know that it was uh, the report was available through other sources, but in particular with local board business, when we are at a business meeting, it is important that A, we've considered the reports, B, that we have the opportunity to provide our own recommendations with the guidance from community uh, and in particular iwi. I'm not sure if that answers your question, um, Councillor Fatnana. Oh, no, that, that's absolutely fine. And I guess what I was trying to, to get at was just making sure that we've had some kind of process, which Councillor Alf tried to be, I, you've yep. tried to be yep. as amenable as possible, Councillor Alf, given uh, the restrictions that were placed on that. So thanks for that. And you, you, I won't ask my second question, but I was going to ask if you could tell us a little bit about Ferguson Park, but I think you're, you've touched on Ferguson Park and its value to the community. So thanks uh, so much, Lemonga. Thank you, Fatnana. Councillor Newman. Sorry, yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, sorry about that. Um, yeah, um, good morning, Leo Monga. So, um, uh, Ferguson Park, that's 5 uh, Ferguson Street, that correct? Yes, yes. Yeah, interestingly, I mean, I just I just wondered, yeah, I, I'm finding this whole thing to be a bit confounding. Um, I mean, I, I've read the report myself, um, and I've got, I've got, I mean, officer comments in relation to one of the submitters here, it was for, to Mr Sykes, it said, this property is not considered, et cetera, et cetera. Suggestions can be made onto the local board for consideration for other parks in the area. Um, I don't know if you've seen that reference. What what does what does that statement mean to you? I'm not quite sure how to interpret what I'm being told here, other than um, the recommendation is for for revocation 
um, the local board can go and sort this out and change its position. Um, how do you interpret this? So if I could uh, just think about uh, the statement from Mr Sykes is what the local board is doing, given the constraints uh, and the levers that we've been advised with the reduction of revenue as the whole Auckland Council, the local board has uh, what we've undertaken is we're looking at all uh, of the local parks. And I think what Mr Sykes could be referring to is there could be uh, a trade-off of other uh, uh, parks, small pocket parks, for example, small green spaces, rather than uh, putting those up for asset sales. Um, so, so from memory, um, he's asked us a number of questions. He's a very concerned uh, resident in Mangere East, uh, and the, and the fact that um, this, this particular one in Ferguson Street has come up. Uh, I'm only assuming uh, in in the conversations that I've had offline with him. Uh, is the real pushback uh, against asset sales. Thank you, Leamonga. Leamonga, just, just one part though from me. Um, did you did you say in, in your presentation, your opening remarks, that you presented in front of the independent commissioners? Uh, yes, uh, we were given the opportunity in that okay. hearing uh, just to provide a local board insight, uh, okay. whether we were in support, yes. Yeah, for Tay Lover. Look, there's no more partai uh, Lemonga, so it's been moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Collins. So I'll put the recommendation for Tay Tele Lover. Um, all those in favour? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Against? Carried. Thank you. Move on to next item, um, and that is 6.5. And, oh, where is it? 6.5, Fow Local Board. Um, it um, will be moved by Councillor Maholland and myself. Um, so Jessica Rose, a member of the Faux Local Board. Um, tenakwe, Jessica, and I'll um, invite you to, to say um, what you need to say. Kia ora. to interrupt sorry to interrupt chair but i think um you i'm on mute, to show on mute. yes yeah <laughs> glad that wasn't only me uh, i was just saying ten akwe and kia ora koto and thank you governing board for having me speak today sorry that i don't have a presentation i didn't know i could put one together um i mean i know i can put one together i didn't know one was necessary for today so we'll just have to paint a picture in our imaginations if that's okay I really could have put together a, quite a whiz-bang one as well, because um, it's quite a picturesque topic. So I'm going to take my agenda item as read on the play streets, and I just want to set the scene for why the Faux Local Board urge approval for the guidelines for play streets. Later in this meeting, there is going to be an item on play streets for the governing body's review, and I'm certain there'll be a lot more detail on what the guidelines out outline and what they're asking for. But for our part as a local board, we'd like to communicate why. In FO, we were grateful to be host to one of Waka Kotahi Innovating Streets projects, a play street held in Waka, Waka, Waka Fiti Loop in Avondale. Residents were so thrilled about the trial being held in their cul-de-sac, and then the community outcomes experienced for them, their children's safety in play, connectivity with their neighbours, things that empowered them to go forward and care for one each other, care for one another, that they have asked for a second one. Well, no, they did ask for a second one. They'd like to have a third, I should say. Um, Whaka Fiti Loop is a reasonably new development with townhouses. People have smaller backyards and a lot of spaces dedicated to sort of uh, double storey or three storey households, really um, circling uh, a road space in between, just to give a bit of a picture of what that space looks like. In Avondale, we are close to a city bound train line. And because of that, we're facing the exciting prospect of significant housing intensification. In one lot, for example, one house will become 19. Across the road from that, seven houses become 104. In town, our local town, 42 residences now become 500. This is great news for much needed housing. However, along with this, there isn't a correlated increase in spaces for community to use or children to play. 
I think everyone around this table is keenly aware of the finite limit of available land in our cities. That is unless we consider now and then diversifying the space of the streets that we use for transit. I'm thankfully of an age that I can remember growing up in the 80s and 90s and having street parties at Christmas. In Beachlands, where I spent my late childhood, these were organised by neighbouring parents and usually meant some of the dads parked lengthwise across the street ends and we all ran across the street from house to house while everyone else talked and ate on the street berms. It was an equaliser for people from different backgrounds and norms while we shared from what we had in each other's households. The centre of the road was a safe space for games under parental observation. People who sought to drive on the road this day would just turn back and go around. It wasn't a big deal. And some of you may even remember the movie Wayne's World, where the primary characters set a scene playing hockey across their street, which they regularly interrupt to let a car pass, and then recommence. The idea of playing outside in this space isn't a new one. Yet somewhere in the last 20 years or so, we've lost this neighbourhood aspect in our residential streets. When in a time of intensification, COVID restrictions and changing climate, we actually need it more than ever. I'd just like to reiterate that the key features of a play street are that it's resident-led and organised. There's short, regular road closures. It's free, child-led play. All neighbours are consulted and included. The road is legally and safely closed to through traffic. It is stewarded by residents. Car access can still happen at a walking pace. It is simple and normal. It doesn't have to be a street party. At Faux Local Board, we want to protect our community's well-being and right to public spaces now and into the future, especially regarding the great increases of intensification and pressure on our public spaces. So simply in closing, if I come back to Whakawhiti Loop, considering the success and enjoyment from that local community as a result of their place street activation, this community has asked if they can do this again. And the question that I put through is, what are we going to tell them? I'm happy to take any part time. Look, thank you, um, Jessica. I've uh, put the the ask out to see if there was any part time, um, but nothing's come through. I think it's because it's self-explanatory in regards to the agenda item that we have. But I just wanted to to say thank you um, so much. I'm going to wait for my three second rule to to kick in, and then um, we'll move on. Yeah, no, look, Jessica, thank you so much. Um, and um, I'm going to put the recommendation as moved by um, Councillor Mulholland and seconded by myself. So thank you again. Thank you for your advocacy. So I'm going to put the uh, put the recommendation. All those in favour? Aye. 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 Against? Carried. Thanks, Jessica. Um, Claudia, I just clicked while you were talking because I didn't know my mic was off. <laughs> it, I thought I was going to get through it without the mic on, but that didn't work. So, look, we're going to move into our agenda. Um, we'll move into number seven. First, extraordinary items. There's none that have been raised. Um, and so before we start into the the actual agenda proper, I just wanted to, to outline um, the, the whole day. Um, so, look, I'm looking at having a break at, at 12 o'clock for five minutes just to get a cup of coffee, and that's two hours after our 10 o'clock start. So for those that want to get a cup of coffee and everything else and have a break, we'll do that at 12. Um, we'll then, um, depending on how we get on, break for lunch about sort of one o'clock, and then um, we get back into the agenda. That'll be for half an hour, and then we'll have dinner about seven. Um, so look, we'll just move into um, the agenda now. And agenda eight, um, that is the summary of Park Arts. Um, it will be moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Casey uh, to be put onto uh, the table for any discussion part I. I'm going to apply the three second rule. There's no part I, no facado. I'm going to put the recommendation. All those in favour? Aye. Against? 
carried. Move on to number nine, regional arts. Councillor Casey, if you could move this, I will second. Um, and then I'll invite Catherine George. It's the okay. regional arts culture grant allocation, round two, 21 to 22. Catherine, um, all yours, my friend. Uh, kia ora tato. Uh, yes, so this is the second round of the um, regional arts and culture grants program for the year. So this is the concluding round. Um, as we all know, arts um, organisations have been really impacted by COVID over the last couple of years. Um, and then at the beginning of this year with the red setting, that pro has provided more cancellation and postponement of um, programmes and projects. This funding round, this was reflected. We had less audience development, which are our programmes that are going out to the community, applications, uh, but we did have a lot more business and capacity development applications, which was really great to see. This is from organisations who are looking at either improving their strategies to change with the ups and downs of what's happening, improving websites for connecting and those kind of, of programmes. So, um, look, that's that's about it. We've the other, I think the other thing probably to note is that it will later on in the year be providing some um, reporting on how things have gone. A lot of organisations have still got grants that haven't been used from the last funding round or the one before, but we've been fortunate to not have any that have had to return the funding because things have been cancelled full stop. Organisations have either pivoted to on online delivery or are still going once they're able to um, effectively do so. So uh, that's it from me. Thank you, Catherine. Um, I'm just going to, again, wait to see if there's any part. I think it's straightforward. Thank you so much uh, to you, to the staff, to the actual uh, panel that we have and which has been outlined uh, in the report. So I'll just wait. No, looks like there's no part. So um, thank you again for the report. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, all those in favour? Aye. Aye. Against? Aye. Against? Carried. Kia ora, Catherine. Thank you so Good much. Up. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to item uh, 10, review funding agreement with Auckland Foundation. Um, His Worship the Mayor will move. I will second that, um, not unless somebody wants to, but I just put that just for ease of, of getting through our agenda. And I will invite... Um, uh, Lucy and Bryce to introduce the team doing this report. So it's been moved and seconded it's on the table. Tēnā kōrua and just invite um, the introductions of our team, please. Kia ora, Bryce. Tēnā koutou. Thank you. Um, thank you, Councillor Alf. Um, yes, so just to, um, to outline briefly, the purpose of this item is to uh, relate to the ongoing funding support for the Auckland Foundation. Um, uh, the Auckland Foundation obviously made a presentation in the public input um, portion of this agenda um, or this committee meeting. Um, I'd like to introduce um, the author of the report, Lucy Petherum, who's a, um, a customer community partnership specialist. Um, and uh, Lucy will take you through some of the main points in terms of the presentation um, and um, options considered in this item. Kia ora, thank you. Over to you, Lucy. Tēnā koe, Lucy. Kia ora, thank you. Um, before I begin, can I kindly request Maya if I am able to please have access to share my presentation? I've just made you a presenter. Oh, thank you. Um. Sorry, I'm still just having some problem loading this. Oh, thank you, I've just received approval that I can share, so I'll just load the presentation. Wonderful. So uh, this report is a review of the funding partnership with Auckland Foundation to provide recommendations to the committee going forward. 
I will be taking that the report has been read and today I will provide a brief presentation to describe the recommendation and the rationale. Um, since 2008, Auckland Council has provided funding support in one form or another to the Foundation and the current agreement will end in June this year. However, ongoing operational support of 250,000 per year is budgeted in the long-term plan until 2031. With the current agreement concluding, there is an opportunity now to consider a shift in council investment to align more to more specific community outcomes and the challenges considered through the long-term plan. This shift would require a transition period to enable the foundation to more directly support the council's expectations. Based on the context around this partnership, uh, there are three options put forward for consideration by the committee. Option one would be to conclude funding to the Auckland Foundation at the end of the current agreement term in June this year. Option two would be to extend the agreement and continue funding the Auckland Foundation with similar objectives and conditions in the, uh, as is in the current agreement. This would include a commitment of 250000 per annum for a further three years. And during this time, Auckland Foundation would aim to achieve $25 million raised as funds under management, which would be aligned to a new fundraising plan, $75 million as pledge bequests, and $2.25 million distributed as grants in 2025. In addition, this extended agreement would include that the Foundation provide Council with a forecast and financial plan to break even in their operational expenses by June 2025, a revised fundraising, marketing and communications plan, and that they submit quarterly updates and annual reports that capture and report on the agreed indicators. Alternatively, option three would be an interim funding agreement to update the strategy and focus of the partnership including the establishment of a new community fund. This option would be a commitment of 250000 for an initial 12-month term. During this period, Auckland Foundation would provide Council with a forecast and financial plan to their break-even and operational expenses, complete and confirm a jointly developed strategic approach by December of this year, including uh, defined objectives, uh, structure, fundraising plan, targets, as well as marketing and communications plan. They would also appoint a dedicated full-time fundraiser or partnership manager to support the launch of a new community fund. This community fund would be available from March 2023, uh, and they would continue to submit quarterly and annual reports um, on the agreed indicators. So taking these three options into consideration, option three is recommended to the committee because it presents the best option, uh, the best opportunity to utilise the Auckland Foundation services to attract donations that support the key council investment priorities. Uh, it also enables the foundation to capitalise on the emerging sector trends while supporting the foundation to become a more impactful donor and trusted vehicle for philanthropic activity. This option provides both partners with the time to work through the implications of this shift uh, to develop an aligned fundraising strategy and establish a strategic community fund after the next review period. Uh, and we're proposing that this transitional period would be reviewed to consider the options going forward in February 2023 with an opportunity at that point to extend the agreement for a further three years from July 2023. Uh, thank you for that. I would also like to add just finally that the mayoral funds uh, will also be reviewed during this period to consider how they might be restructured into the updated partnership agreement uh, to promote and attract further donations. Um, and just to reiterate what the Foundation mentioned this morning in their presentation, that they have provided feedback on the three options that have been presented today and in the report, and they've confirmed their preference for option three. So in summary, this option would be a win-win for both partners. Thanks, I'm happy to take any part on this.
methodology for all of oh. them of this type. Sorry, Bryce, is there anything um, further, Bryce? Uh, no, thank okay. you, Mr Chair. OK, then. Um, so I'll open it up for um, any part and Councillor Newman. Uh, thank you, Alf, and, and thank you very much, Lucy, and, and you're amazing. And I just want to acknowledge um, you for the fantastic work that you did through the COVID response last year, and I appreciate your uh, the organisation acknowledging you. Lucy, in relation to this report, um, what is the risk here that what we're doing is, is talking about a relationship with an organisation um, which which primary purpose, of course, is, is is fundraising for philanthropic activities which align with us. But really what it's having to do is competing with, against other charities that are in the marketplace, all competing for the same dollar, isn't it? I mean, this is, you know, we, we live in, in a world which has been affected by COVID. Everybody wants a salary. Everybody wants funding for charitable purposes. And the real issue here is that there is just isn't enough money to go around. Is that is that really the challenge that that's facing the Auckland Foundation? And and really, however we we, we dress this up, underlying the matter, underlying the challenge now is that there just isn't enough money uh, to meet all the calls for the few dollars that we have. Thank you, Councillor Newman. It's nice to be connected with you again. Um, in response to your question, um, when we look at the philanthropic sector and the giving sector in New Zealand, there are a number of uh, emerging trends that show while there are very limited and restricted funds around um, giving and donations uh, that charities are competing for, we are seeing a considerable growth in both pledge bequests and um, donations from high net wealth individuals and their families. And this is reflective of not only trends in New Zealand, but also internationally. So as the foundation mentioned this morning, the um, growth in uh, this sector is only expected to grow massively in the next decade and beyond. Um, and that's where the foundation has positioned themselves to target those donations. So the current financial status of the foundation, which has um, about $9 million in funds under management and uh, $44 million in pledge bequests, is consistently growing. And that's the money that they're relying on for um, the majority of their distributions and grants that they give out. And that's also the money that they would be looking to attract for this community fund and, and through this partnership with council. I hope that yeah, so, answers your question. Okay, no, that, that that's fine. So aiming at that particular, I mean, that that's yeah, that, that high end of the market in terms of the pledge. Um, so your expectation is that they're focusing in that particular space, and that they're focused in terms of where they target their their funding, which of course they didn't have to go out to you know, to their, their high net worth people and who are looking to make, um, you know, targeted donations, is that, um, that the focus is on stuff which complements um, Auckland Council's priorities through the Auckland Plan um, as a way of augmenting the support that the Council can give us. Is, is, have I summarised, have I, have, I, have I clarified that correctly? That's correct, yes. Okay, um, thanks, Chair. Yeah, look, I, I mean, I'll support. I'll support the option as recommended, but, but really, the actually, I'll, I'll resume my right to speak. Thank you. Cut by Councillor Newman. Councillor Dalton. Thank you, Chair. Um, it, it was. It's a pedantic question, and now that I've heard Lucy's answer to the leverage, it's probably perhaps the question is in C. Um, we've got with a view to approving the presentation Lucy had with an opportunity. It's a subtle difference, um, but it, it is a difference considering the financial environment that we're in. But um, yes, listening to how you were just talking about the leverage of that money um, probably makes it a bit redundant now. So thank you. Cut by Councillor Dalton. Um, 
there's no further partai on the chat bar, so I'm going to open it up uh, for any whakaro and leave the last comments uh, to close with His Worship the Mayor, if he wishes. Councillor Newman, you reserved your right to speak. Yeah, look, Chair, I, I mean, I'm comfortable with what Lucy is recommending here. The challenge for me actually is to ensure that, um, you know, as much as, as we're sort of wanting to partner with the, with the philanthropic sector um, around uh, planned giving, um, targeted requests. Uh, I, you know, I, I believe in, in philanthropy. I think that I think it's um, fantastic. I'd like to see a lot more of it. Um, my real challenge is to ensure that actually council does meet its fair share uh, in terms of helping to support the community through the development of our assets and facilities. I don't think we do as much of that as well. We, we don't do as much of that as what I'd like, um, but we don't do as much of, of that as what I'd like because of our financial situation. Um, but as, as fast as, as people who are generous can pour money into the bath, um, you know, I don't want, I don't want us to use um, this sort of uh, planned giving through the philanthropic sector and the generosity of, of high net worth donors uh, to be an opportunity for us to lower our contributions, which is what I always worry about. You know, I'm involved uh, with a licensing trust in my ward where we're going to be making significant contributions potentially over the next couple of years. Um, we're doing that in part to try and fill the gap. And the gap is caused by, in my view, council exiting that gap. So, um, thank you, Lucy, for what for this report and for your recommendations. But the challenge here for council is to not lean so hard on the sector to fill a gap that that is being created in part because, in my view, we're exiting it. Um, the challenge will be to ensure that that we don't, and maybe the discussion that will come up in relation to. Silverdale and Millwater later on will, will crystallise some of the problems around that. Thank you, Chair. Kapai, Councillor Newman. Uh, Your Worship, the Mayor, um, if you wish to close, if not, I can put the recommendation. Kilda. Uh, kia ora, Mr Chair. Just a, a very brief comment. Um, yeah, look, I, I think the Auckland Foundation does play a, a very worthwhile role. Um, it, it has expanded the money uh, that it that it has available to it and the amount of money that um, uh, it's got through um, people uh, bequeathing money uh, following their deaths. Um, the sum of money is, is reasonably significant, as Lucy has said, uh, $9 million uh, in the money available uh, at the, under management and, and $44 million in uh, uh, bequeathed money. Uh, we never have enough money in council to do all the things that we want. Uh, Councillor Newman's quite right. And, and it's hard to foresee the day when that's going to change radically. So if we can expand our ability to give support to worthwhile causes through working uh, with uh, high, high value individuals and not just high value individuals, but a whole generation of baby boomers who, as we heard this morning, you know, um, have done pretty well out of uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the increase in property values. Um, their kids are doing pretty well, so their kids don't need all of the money uh, that they may leave uh, after they've passed on. Uh, I think we should tap into this area, and provided we have confidence in the way the Auckland Foundation is being run and that its objectives are parallel with our own objectives as set out in the, the Auckland plan and our other documents, uh, then we're getting a very good return for the investment that we're making uh, in providing support for their fundraising efforts. I, I don't think it is a, a totally a zero-sum game. I think they can add to the amount of money that is available. And in particular, um, and I've discussed this with you, Mr Chair, uh, I'd like to see a way in which we can revive uh, the mayoral funds, uh, particularly yeah. for dealing with uh, Pacific nat natural disasters. I, I, I think it's fantastic uh, that we were able to give 25000 to Tonga, yeah. uh, and that was hugely appreciated, both by those that uh, were the beneficiaries in Tonga, but also by our Pacifica communities. And we are going to have, particularly with climate change, ongoing and increased need with more cyclones, more events of this nature, uh, our ability to do more 
uh, both locally and in our our Pacific backyard, I think is really important. So I, I endorse the officials' uh, recommendations. Uh, that we support uh, option three. Uh, I can only see uh, positive upsides from doing so, and I'd commend that to my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship, for your closing remarks. And again, just to echo your comments around thanking the staff as well as Councillor Newman. So, look, um, I'm going to put the recommendation. All those in favour? Aye. 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 Against? Aye. Aye. Carried. Thank you to you both. Tēnā korua. Tāra, thank you. We'll move on to item 11, all the legs. And um, it will be um, moved by Councillor Hills and seconded by Councillor Coon. Um, and I'll invite Tania and Sarah um, to uh, present uh, this uh, agenda item and then get Councillor Hills and Coombe to comment before Councillor Hills um, closes the debate after any party. Tēnā kōrua tāne, just introduce the team please. Yes, kia ora. Uh, Sarah as well. I'm just sharing my screen. I'm not sure if Sarah is with us. Tēnā koutou katoa, ko Tanya Atli tōku ingoa. Yes, I'm here to present this proposal that's been put out by the Ministry for the Environment to transform recycling in Aotearoa. So we're especially excited about this because it includes a container return scheme, which is something that Auckland Council has been advocating strongly for over many years. So we're here to um, recommend that approval of Council's submission is delegated to those councillors and an independent Māori statutory board member, but I will just quickly step through some of the key highlights of the proposal for your information. So, sorry, the first part, as mentioned, is a container return scheme, though you might know it by other names like a deposit ref refund scheme. Um, they're very common overseas. They're, um, they're used throughout Australia now. So essentially it's the system where you pay a deposit when you buy a drink and you get that deposit back when you take the empty drink container back. So the scheme would include most types of drink containers, which is um, really positive as per the pictures on this slide, and it would be a 20 cent deposit up front. There'd be regulation to support a mandatory network of retail locations like supermarkets where you could take your bottles back to, um, and of course our community recycling centres could also participate. The second proposal is for changes to household, oops, sorry, household curbside recycling. So there are two headline proposals um, as part of this. The first is to have a standard set of materials collected nationwide. So no matter where you lived in New Zealand, you'd put the same things in your recycle bin. So that strengthens the ability to do that nationwide education and, and reduce contamination. The second proposal for curbside collections is that all urban populations would have a food scraps collection and that fits very well with what we're doing in Auckland of course to roll out, roll out our food scrap collections region wide. And the third proposal of three is about separation of business food waste. So that's a requirement for businesses to separate out their food waste by 2030. And there's various ways that the ministry might look to phase that in um, and also how they would look to support businesses to do that. And finally, I've just got a slide here with the timeframes. The closing date for the submission is 8th of May. So we'll be, um, obviously we've gone out to local boards, but we're talking with Manafina and we're asking for their input by the 21st of April so that we can incorporate it in the submission to go to delegated members for review and approval at the end of the month. And that's the key elements of the proposal. So I'm happy to hand over for any questions. Kapai Tani, I'll go to questions first and then if there's none, I'll then invite the councillors to Fuini Fakaro and I'll get Councillor Hills to close. So, uh, Councillor Bill, um, our Deputy Mayor, has 
three questions. He's got three question marks in the chat bar. So your first one of the three, Councillor uh, Cashmore. Thanks, Alf. I've actually got two. I've got a, a jittery finger, put it down to old age. Um, so my question is, we have been strongly advocating as a council for as long as I can remember since I've been here for this, which is great news, it's taken forever. What about the um, fibre recycling plant so we can be New Zealand can be resilient in its own fibre recycling and also a product stewardship for our appliances, our furniture, our IT equipment and so forth? Um, is there any signals that this is going to be the next stages? Sure, uh, um no signals that I know of around fibre recycling um, plant at the moment. Um, certainly, though, in the product stewardship area, the Ministry has put out priority products for product stewardship, which includes electronic or batteries, etc., but uh, not so much on the large appliances that I know of at the moment. Um, but they do have that mechanism in place with, I think, five, uh, sorry, might be five or eight different priority products. Thanks. I guess we can, can but wait, hope and pray that Wellington moves with a bit more uh, speed and clarity around this area because it is being ridiculously slow. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, matua kake. Uh, kia, ora. kia ora. Thank you for the report. And um, uh, my, my question is really around, you know, this will be quite significant in terms of the submission um, and getting views from Mata Waka. Can you... Tell me a little bit more about uh, what's intended there, and and if you have done so, what um, what, what part will Matawaka play in the inclusion in the submission? Sure, that's a, a great part. I, um, because of the tight timeframes, our focus at the moment has been on the mana whenua side and looking at um, what we already know from Mata Waka in terms of what we've heard before and what we know from our engagement with Mata Waka organisations like Parakore. Um, so we're intending to use that and we can reach out to Parakore as well, for example, um, to, to see what their views are to incorporate them. I have been looking at their recent submission on the waste strategy as well uh, to get further insights into those views um, to incorporate. Further question, Mr. Chair. Uh, would it be possible to get a bit of a summary of what, what, what you know, it sounds like you're going to do that, and, and I acknowledge the time frame, eight to May, and blah, 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 but um, offline, can, can I be sent that summary? Is that possible? Sure, yes, I can send you. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, and I acknowledge what you're saying about uh, mana whenua, but um, I think this this is a big one for Matawaka, actually, in, in terms of getting their views and how they can be involved, actually, so... I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Kia ora. Ka pai, pātai, uh, Matua Wilcox. Matua Wilcox. Ka tai ku te rongo? Ai. Oh, ka pai. Um, yes. Uh, I think it's important. I think uh, Tony mentions a really good corridor there because in our waste submissions and our waste minimization um, plan submissions, Matawaka and Māori in particular were the largest group of, of submitters. So I think it's really important that we follow up what uh, Tony Kaki asked for. And I suppose I just wanted to know um, because we've been going along this cope up for quite a while now, as, uh, as the deputy mayor said, are we looking to pull back, pull up some of that stuff that we did way back early on in council, or are we just going to move forward with the stuff, more current stuff? Thank you. Sure. Um, sorry, I'm not sure of the earlier stuff that was referenced there. Well, we did some we did some stuff back in oh, was it two thousand waste minimization plan yeah yeah we did a lot of that stuff way back then um, so I'm just wondering are we going to pull some of that stuff up as well right okay um, just looking back at that earlier feed input 
into the from those mana whenua mata waka input. If I understand you correctly, we can do that. Sarah, I see that you've come on online now, Sarah. So have you got any whakaro in regards to the part I find um, Matu Wilcox? Uh, your microphone's on. Sorry, Sarah. Yeah, just um, yeah, kia ora, and just um, apologies for being so late. The agenda suddenly rushed forward, and I was just sorting something out of family issue to sort out. Apologies for that. Um, just catching up on the um, the patai there in relation to are we taking into account um, previous um, informa um, information that we have been um, heard from Manafenua? Was that the question? Yeah, uh, mana whenua mata waka in regards to the waste minimisation yeah. that we did earlier. Yeah. And, and uh, Madam uh, uh, Chair, through you, and, and because we did get a lot of stuff early on in the piece from Papa Tuan and Good Marae. Yeah, kapai, Sarah? Um, Yes, and, and um, yes, we have had before. We have had a lot of engagement before, and yes, we will be taking that into account. We will be. Um, we are very mindful of what we've already heard, and making sure that we don't repeat and ask the same questions from what we already know. Um, we've taken on board um, specific um, um, observations around litter and um, around the the opportunities then for the CRS, uh, the Container Return Scheme, to address that. Um, and we've also um, taken on board specific interests around um, food waste minimisation as well. Um, and so there are opportunities there um, to feedback on um, the proposals from central government around food waste provision for both businesses and from um, households. Kapai tera matua. Kapai. Kia ora. Um, Councillor Coombe, we, there's no more, there's no further part. I just wanted to see if you had any whakaro and then I'll invite Councillor Hills to close as the mover. Oh, tēnā koe te hia mana, nā mihi nui ki a koutou. Um, tēnā kurua, Sarah and Tanya. Um, Hey, Tino Rawe. Um, I'm super excited too, and just really awesome that we're finally going to get a container deposit scheme. It's been a long time coming, so I just wanted to make that comment. Kia ora, Chair. Thank you. Kapai. Um, Councillor Hills, closing comments, and then I'll put the recommendation. Uh, kia ora, Chair, and thank you. And um, as many have said, the, this uh, is not our plan, but it's a submission to um, changes with, from the Ministry for the Environment. Um, and we will be ensuring uh, that all the consultation um, material from the past is incorporated to ensure we aren't wasting people's time because we have very good, as uh, Member Wilcox uh, pointed out, very good um, submissions on Te Tārake Tafri, which a big focus was waste. On the waste minimisation plan, we have our submissions on the plastics um, that we did a few years ago and on the container return uh, deposit return scheme, we've also uh, submitted on. So this will, um, it's a bit unusual because it comes between committees and this, thank you, Chair, for having this at pace today. Um, so everything will be incorporated from our current views. There will be no surprises in the, um, the submission, so people don't have to worry about things that um, uh, pop up that we haven't already agreed to. Um, but it does, you know, it's a big step forward. We have been pushing for these things, as Councillor um, Cashmore said, for a very long time. Um, on the fibre, I know that the, you know, a big step forward was the uh, shovel-ready funding that we got for the improvements to the optical sorters, which has improved the, the quality of the fibre that we can um, you know, use some onshore, but mostly offshore. We still don't have, I think the issue is the market for the packaging that would come onshore at this stage um, is the big concern. The other thing around the changes to curbside recycling, that doesn't mean, and I have had some questions about that, that doesn't mean we will have to change the way we do it. The, the, the improvements are more around what we are recycling and a nationwide kind of standard of the types of things because it is different in every area, whether that's tops on, tops off, types of plastics we can and cannot um, recycle, the confusion for the market, confusion for producers of the waste. Um, it is a whole 
this is you know part of a much wider um, process around waste. So I just want to acknowledge um, yourself, Chair, um, previous Chair uh, Penny Hulse, uh, Linda Cooper for her work on the uh, Waste Advisory Board for Government, um, Councillor Cashmore, Member Wilcox, and many others who've who've been on this waka this journey for a very long time. So these are more steps um, to improve the situation we have with waste, which is a significant uh, part of our emissions, um, and also just extremely poor for our whenua and for the environment. Um, we are still having to build landfills, and so these types of big moves um, have a, will have a long-term effect and improve our waterways and um, what we are chucking away that sits underneath the dirt for centuries. So. Kia ora and um, the, the, this, the thanks to the waste team who are superstars and, you know, the Ministry for the Environment continuously say that our staff are pretty, pretty amazing and do a huge amount of work and have contributed significantly to these changes in the last couple of years the government has been rolling out. So, kia ora. Tēnā koe um, e ho. Um, thank you so much for those words, especially to our staff from both yourself and Councillor Coombe. Um, and the environmental space in is, is in good hands with both you and Councillor Coombe. So I'm going to put that uh, the recommendation. All those in favour? Aye. 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 Against? Aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Um, so look, it's 12, uh, 6 past 12. If we could come back in um, at 11 minutes past 12, just to have a break, grab you a cup of coffee, grab you... Um, uh, zero percent wine um, and then um, we'll see you back at um, 11 minutes past 12. Kilda.
to our next item, and that is uh, item 12, just a dozen, license to occupy the Ministry of Education at Three Kings. So I'm going to put it on the table and I'll ask um, Councillor Casey if she could move. Councillor Fletcher, if you're on the call, would you uh, like to second this particular item? I think Councillor Fletcher is still offline. Um, so look, I will move that to put on the table for discussion and I'm going to invite our staff, um, Tamara and Ellen, um, if you could introduce the staff online, please, and introduce the item. Tēnā kōdua. Thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, my name is Tamara Zonik. I'm from Land Advisory within uh, Community Facilities. Uh, the purpose of uh, this report is to rescind uh, the decision made by the Regional Development and Operation Committee back in 2012. The decision authorised a land exchange between Auckland Council and the Ministry of Education. Uh, more specifically, a small part of Robinson Reserve uh, was to be exchanged for the part of adjoining land owned by the Ministry of Education that is currently occupied by Central Auckland Specialist School. Uh, there are three reasons uh, why this decision should be rescinded. Uh, first one is that uh, due to substantial costs involved in such land exchange, Auckland Council and the Ministry of Education have instead agreed to enter into licenses to occupy the respective pieces of land. Second reason is that in February this year, uh, Pukete Papa Local Board um, passed a resolution to grant a license to occupy to the Ministry of Education over that small part of Robinson Reserve. And a third reason is that there are now two decisions in relation to the same piece of land. And in interest of avoiding any risks of confusion in the future, the best, the best option is to rescind this decision from 2012. So I hope that this uh, information is sufficient for the committee to consider rescinding this decision. Um, that's pretty much all from me, unless you have any questions. Kia ora, Tamara. It, it, it's, it's more than sufficient. It just explains everything. So thank you so much for the report. I'm going to um, apply the rule. For any part type? Oh, too hard. Yeah, sorry. Too too hard to push the button. Um yeah, I, I'm reading it, I'm still kind of unclear. What makes it so difficult to do this transfer? Land exchange, uh, because um, both Robinson Reserve and Ministry of Education's land required to be surveyed, and costs of doing that were quite substantial, and on top of that, costs were to be covered by Auckland Council. Thank you. So, yeah. Goodbye. Um, I'm going to invite uh, Councillor Casey, if you have any comments to close the, if not, I can put the recommendation. Kilda. I'm all good, Alfie. Okay, I'm going to put the recommendation. Um, all those in favour? Aye. 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 Against? Carrie, Tamara, thank you. That's, that's, it wasn't sufficient, it was actually better than efficient. That's thank why it's gone through so quick. Thank you, Tamara. Thank you. Okay, we'll move to our next item, and that is item 13, unlucky for some. That's the development of Play Streets Gardens for Tamaki Mokodo. The mover will be Councillor Mulholland and Councillor Casey, are you okay, you okay to second the recommendation? Delighted. Thank you, Alfie. No problems at all. So it's now put on the table. I'm going to invite um, uh, Jacqueline and Mace. And if you could introduce any of the team members, Jacqueline, Kilda. 
Tēnā koutou katoa, ko Jacqueline Collins tōku ingoa. I'm not actually sure whether Mace is on the call. I think he is. Um, let me share my screen. Uh, there's no other team members on the call, um, so let me just share my screen. One second. Goodbye. Thank you very much for letting me come and present this re report to you. It's um, a piece of mahi, which is a great passion for me, so it's excellent to be able to share it with you all. Uh, what the purpose of today's presentation is, is to uh, pretty much close the loop on the Innovating Streets for People Community Play Streets for Tamaki Makaurau project, which was approved uh, for submission by members of the governing body when uh, in 2020, when we were deciding which uh, projects would go for to Waka Kotahi for consideration for funding. Uh, so the purpose of today is to close the loop on that uh, pilot project and to talk about the next steps. And the goal is to have the approval to develop um, our pathway to permanence for the project, which is some Play Streets guidance to enable this activity to continue. So just a really quick uh, reminder about our Play Streets pilot because we've detailed it in the report and in the attachment. It was funded by Waka Kotahi and the activation budget. It was delivered in 2021 and it was done in partnership with Auckland Transport and with the community partners, um, the Cause Collective and Healthy Families Waitakere. And we worked on a very devolved uh, management style for this project and that we expected the two community partners to really take the lead at a local level and that worked very well for us. Uh, we delivered the project at, at uh, seven different sites in West Auckland and South Auckland, and we ran a total of nine Play Streets events. Uh, the pilot was a, a really big success, so I'm very pleased to say we had nothing but good feedback from everybody involved. And as Attachment 1 uh, details, the uh, measures that we tracked to uh, measure the success of the pilot resoundingly indicated that we achieved our goals of increasing access to play, uh, strengthening community cohesion and providing a process which residents would actually be willing to engage with again, which is obviously our goal. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, our pathway to permanence for this pilot was in part to figure out how we can do this on an ongoing basis for Aucklanders. Uh, as I, I won't go through everything I've gone through in the report regarding the context, but the big goal in this is to think about how can we as Council uh, create mechanisms or enable opportunities for play to be something that we support beyond just building playgrounds. Playgrounds will always be hugely important to Aucklanders and to us to provide, but they're very expensive. We can't necessarily put them in some areas very easily when areas are already very busy. And also they're only one of many, many ways that children like to play. So what I wanted to just do uh, is really briefly talk about the scope and scale of Play Streets as we mean it for the purposes of this discussion. Because it is a phrase, or Play Streets is a term that gets used quite often and it can mean different things to different people. So when, when we talk about Play Streets, we are very much in line with Waka Kotahi's guidelines for the temporary restriction of traffic to Play Street events, and our pilot project actually fed into the development of those guidelines. So we're talking about the temporary restriction of road traffic, so Play can be used, can be um, enabled to take place on residential streets. So this is a temporary short term kind of thing we're thinking about. It's maybe two to three hours on an afternoon. It is very local in its focus. So it's intended for the people who live in the street. It's not intended to be a big community event with a cast of thousands invited. It's meant to be for the people who live on the street and maybe right next to the street. Uh, it's not meant to be something that we as council kind of parachute in and deliver for communities. Instead, it's about us creating the mechanisms to enable communities to run these events themselves if they want to. Uh, the reason why we need to look at the mechanisms and what we were trying to kind of establish through our pilot was uh, currently and to date, the only way to temporarily restrict traffic to a street is to do a full transport management plan and um, a full event permit pretty much. So it's a very, very, very elaborate, expensive and time consuming process to enable somebody to shut a cul-de-sac for two hours so the kids can have a play. So what we were trying to test in our pilot was a much more simplified process which was more proportionate with, re with regard to the risk and the scale of event. Um, we aren't trying to kind of give communities permission to have, I don't know, massive 21sts happening all night in a cul-de-sac. This is very much about enabling play. So while there are amazing community cohesion benefits, the focus certainly from my perspective is very much on creating more space, time and opportunity for children to play. I think that this project will be a really low cost way that we as council can support more access to play for children. Uh, there's not really any ongoing costs because once we've trained residents in how to safely close their street to traffic and manage that process, and after we maybe provide some cones and some high vis and some signage and have done the traffic management checks at the beginning of the process, 
that's pretty much it when it comes to costs. It's not about us going in and providing stuff. It's about us just providing the space and enabling residents to claim back their neighbourhood streets as spaces that can be used for other activities than just parking and driving. And obviously it's super low carbon because if kids are playing in their immediate street, they're not getting driven anywhere. So my presentation is very short and sweet and I just wanted to end it with some photos and quotes from our pilot because I think these capture really well what a play street looks like and what the lasting benefits are. So these quotes are really lovely. They're from um, some of our play streets participants in West Auckland. So Healthy Families Waitakere have gathered them for us. I think the one that I really like in particular is the second one about kids playing in different locations more because I think that's the way that play streets enables more play. So obviously on the day when the street is closed, there is more opportunity to play but by having an event like this and letting neighbours get to know each other I as a parent would be much more likely to allow my children to go down the road and play at somebody else's house if I've met those parents and know them so I think that just creating this opportunity for people to get to know each other with this real play focus will just lead to more opportunities. And similarly, um, the community cohesion elements have been amazing and we knew that they would be, but it's been really marked because our play streets happened before our big lockdown last year and several of the um, participants commented that having those stronger social bonds before the lockdown was hugely beneficial when the lockdown happened because it meant that um, they knew each other, they could keep an eye on each other and people were sharing food and resources, which wasn't happening in these streets before these events took place. So. In short, that's pretty much my presentation. Uh, we would really just like approval to move forward and um, work with Auckland Transport, who is primed and ready to go, to um, develop some guidance with um, the involvement of our communities as well, so we can make a, figure out a way to take our learnings from our um, pilot and basically make this something that we can provide for all the time. So I very much welcome any questions. Kia ora Jacqueline, um, I, I just wanted to say when we asked you to uh, do the PowerPoint and put some photos in, you went overboard and ended <laughs> up getting all the kids one that everybody loves just to get support for your item, so well done for that. Um, Pātai, I'm going to go to Councillor um, Dalton first and then um, I'll go to Fakado after that if there's no more Pātai. Jacqueline, well done. Thank you. Tanak koe te. Kia ora, Jack Kia ora. Kia ora. Um, I attended the ones in Takanini and uh, Te Vrihana, and they were amazing. Um, my question is <clears throat> around the sustainability, or the two questions perhaps. So how do you work with the tension of children not going and playing in the street when there isn't that control around? And um, to the sustainability. So is the intention when we're not there that um, the, the local residents will take, um, yeah, they will, they will take responsibility for the play in the streets? Okay, so I'll address your first question first. Um, this is something which often comes up from play streets and really the best thing that I can do is refer to the experiences and the learnings from play streets projects that have been running for a much longer time. So in Britain, for example, there's been a movement called Playing Out, which has now been running for a few years and it's something they address and they feel quite strongly, and I must say I do tend to agree, that children are actually pretty good at differentiating between when the street has been closed for them to play and when that hasn't happened. Uh, Obviously, the involvement of parents is crucial in this. So play streets doesn't mean just open your door and shove your kid out and let them get on with it. It very much requires parents to still be there supervising. Um, and I think when we come to train residents around the health and safety and risk management elements of running a play street, we would also be making sure that they understand that they're going to need to also educate their children about the fact that a play street is one thing that doesn't mean that the street is a site for play all the time. Although what we have seen with the streets that we ran the pilot in is that the residents on those streets have become much more conscious of children in the space and are driving more slowly, are keeping an eye out more for children. So that's another good outcome. So that's that. The second uh, question of yours regarding the sustainability, the answer, I mean, we need to do a co-design process with AT to think about how the guidance will actually work in practice. It will be very much aligned with Waka Kotahi's guidelines, which as I say, we, we fed into a lot. Um, I have a very clear idea in my head of how the process could work to be very sustainable, but we still need to go through a co-design and there might be many better ideas. But yes, certainly the short answer is absolutely. The, my goal is for us to develop guidance which makes sure that streets actively choose to participate and that they have a good representation of the neighbours who live on that street all being 
you know, signing up to it and being happy about it happening so it's not being imposed on people. And that they have a good little core of volunteers who know that they will need to be involved in running the events and that we then provide them with the training, the knowledge, the safety equipment um, and the signage, and then that we give them the autonomy basically to decide when they run their play streets and how often. So some people may decide, okay, every Wednesday after school, we've got three mums available and we're gonna do it. Or some people may say, okay, it's gonna be the last Sunday of every month, we're gonna do it. So yeah, our goal is to really empower residents to do this for themselves. Kapai. Jacqueline, um, forgot to mention our executive officer as well, Samantha Sinton, who wanted these photos. So um, I know she loves them as well. Um, <laughs> Councillor Dalton, I'm going to go to you for Fakad also then. Councillor Mulholland, who um, moved this particular item, can close the debate. So, Councillor Dalton, there's no other part, so I'll go straight to you. Oh, kia ora, Anna, Chair. Um, I was a real sceptic of this program when it first came out, thinking of kids playing in streets. And um, even if we did go in and we provided everything that was required, then what would happen? Would they just continue to go out and play in the streets, especially in the cul-de-sacs around some of our communities? But I did attend the events, and in particular the one at um, Wari, Te Wari Hana. Seeing the neighbours out there playing, uh, talking, actually, the adults, um, the, the real important part about this is that it is community-led but and also through the Cause Collective. The Cause Collective really know how to engage with our, our people and it was an incredible, incredible day that uh, was had there. And I agree with Jacqueline that that really set them up for lockdown, that set that community up for lockdown and I, I bet they were resilient during that time. So um, I'm a supporter, or more power to <laughs> you, Jacqueline, to find that sustainability, to get kids back um, playing together and parents talking and getting to know each other so they can go and play at each other's houses safely and without concern, and that we can get back to, you know, the old days when everyone played together. So Thank you. Ora. Thank you. I support this item. Thank you. Kia ora, Councillor Dalton. Jacqueline, before I go to Councillor Hills, I just wanted to make my, my little short comment in. Um, this this particular item is, is a younger version of what I used to do quite a bit with neighbourhood policing way back in the day when I was the community cop from 1984 in Mangere. Um So look, well well done, Jacqueline, and, and it is, this is a younger version uh, of, of the neighbourhood policing. And um, Councillor Dalton, I also... I um, want to acknowledge um, the Cause Collective um, when um, Jacqueline came through with, with the initial uh, concept with this. So um, totally support as well. Uh, so Councillor Hills, I go to you and then there has been um, a call for a division on this particular one. But um, I will get um, uh, Councillor Hills to go next and then if there's no further, I'll get Councillor Mulholland to close. Kia ora. Sure, Jacqueline, and thank you so much for this. Thank you and the team um, for working on what uh, our communities hope is a flexible plan for them to have fun. Um, and I guess it's going to make me sound old now. When when I was a kid, we um, we lived on a cul-de-sac in Glenfield, and we used to play with no traffic management or anything. And we just one of us would stand at the end of the road where the cars come down, and we'd all go car, um, and everyone would scatter off the road or get your bikes and get. Um, your sports equipment and whatever off the road. But I remember those nights, those weekends, those um, moments where you did get to know everyone. And of course, the adults um, on the street got to know each other because the kids were all like, I'm at, you know, whatever's house till whatever time at night. Um, and, you know, I think that there are not every, not every street in our um, communities will work, obviously. But I think if there are opportunities and to be as flexible as possible, I really hope that we can continue. I know it's important to have safety around it and training, but I hope there are ways that we can move to a more trust-based model with communities because we know that parents, you know, on the whole and, and kids actually want to protect each other and want to, to have fun and not ruin it for everyone else. Um, so I hope that we can move to a framework where we don't have to have too much of an onerous process on those neighbourhoods. Um, you know, put the structure in place, you know, even the two to three hours or you know, having daylight saving could go a bit later for street barbecues and things because actually some of our community groups already do this probably illegally 
in Kaipataki <laughs> and Devonport Takapuna now. Um, and I've been to some of those events, but um, and that's just because of the trust of the street, um, and that's going to grow. So I um, I think this is great. Um, hopefully it can roll out and we can see more opportunities. Um, and I think it does create a wider behaviour change of those adults understanding kids on the street, um, slowing down in the rest of the community, and also um, the safety. Once you know your neighbours and once you know who to call or yell out to, um, or you know, notice who they are. Then that creates those bonds for life, and it also makes the whole area safer. Um, and also, like you say, this will also reduce emissions, give people more things to do in their local area. If there's more intensification, the roads are going to be, unfortunately, sometimes um, the parks and recreation spaces. So, um, yeah, I think this is exciting, and thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Kilda, Councillor Mahollan, to close the debate. And then I'll put the recommendation. Well, I won't put it. Uh, uh, Maya, there's been a division called, so I'll let you do that once Councillor Maholden has closed the debate. Kilda. Oh, Kilda, and thank you, Chair, and um, thanks to Jacqueline and actually a wider team over a very long period of time to support this. Um, I want to acknowledge that the FAO local board um, have contributed towards um, this by way of feedback and quite some years ago, um, well actually it's not that many years ago, but um, I attended um, a street party and helped with the um, team that we could establish this at the request of community. Um, I'm just going to say a few no-brainer things because one has to say it although I think it's a bit PC, but, you know, safety first, we all know that. The team have done a lot of background work. We all want to protect the interests of our um, youth. So I think it's a fantastic idea. One of the things I particularly think are good, and I've been fortunate to have my home for about 28 years, and I've got the same neighbours. Well, actually, not all of them have been here that long. I sort of, I probably need to move on. But, you know, we have a great network of relationship building and caring for it. It's actually older community. And what we forget is our older people, um, they love to be connected to the young people as well. And so we haven't talked about them, and I think it's critical that we um, have our older community sharing um, and as mentioned, and I totally agree, it is certainly not suitable for all streets, but I know you've all done a lot of background work. I've seen it work. I'm very supportive. As I say, it's a no-brainer on the safety issues. We are not dictators, so we should be enabling this type of activity for our people because it is about our people. Um, so I fully support this and I acknowledge um, all of those people who get together and connect. And as I say, around my neighbourhood, I can name my neighbours. We support each other. Um, I'm now, because I've been growing tomatoes, been able to give them vegetables, you know, and people love that. Or if you know someone's unwell, you know, and I think those sort of activities um, do engage and support a better connected, loving, kind community. Um, so thank you, Chair, for allowing um, this report to come up. I think it's very important. And I know there's actually a very big team that are working on this for a long time, Jacqueline. So um, thank you for this. I do support it, of course, but I'm a bit of a safety girl. So I do support it mm -hmm. with all those safety measures and work you've done. So kia ora Thank you. Could I just make, could I just oh, make a really quick sorry, point? Uh, uh, Jacqueline, just to let you know why we go to part time first and then um, to comment is that after all the part I have, have been said, um, it's important that our staff then uh, for their safety don't get involved with comments only because sometimes the comments are aimed at them. That was previously, but it was for your safety. So um, I, I know that your comments would have been complimentary to 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 what um, Councillor Mulholland was going to say, but I just needed to to sort of point out why I've been the bad guy and sort of interrupted you um, was only because of the reason why we ended up doing that was for your safety and others. So my humble apologies, Jacqueline, and I know you can ring Councillor Mulholland after this and 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 let her know. So my apologies. Um, so look, there's been a division called. And uh, Maya, can you carry out that division, please? 
Okay, Kia ora councillors, you're um, voting on Fakai approve Auckland Council staff to work with Auckland Transport and relevant stakeholders to develop Play Streets guidance for Tamaki Makoto. Councillor Bartley. Uh, four. Councillor Casey. Yes. Deputy Mayor Cashmore. Aye. Councillor Collins. Councillor Coombe. Aye. Councillor Cooper. Four. Councillor Dalton. Four. Councillor Darby. Four. Chair Philipina. Aye. Mayor Goff. Aye. Councillor Hills. Absolutely, thank you. I must be member Kaki. 100% for. Councillor Mulholland. Four. Councillor Newman. Yes. Councillor Simpson. Councillor Stewart. No. Councillor Walker. Councillor Watson. I must be member Wilcox. Aye. Councillor Young. Four. You need to stop. Thank you. That's carried 15 votes to one. Kia ora. Thanks, Maya. Um, we move into the next item, and that is um, Kia ora Tamaki Mokono, item 14. Um, and it'll be moved by Councillor Dalton and seconded by um, Matuakake. So I'll invite uh, Hedewini Te Koha Director Māori Outcomes, Ashley Walker, Practice Lead Māori Outcomes, and Luan Ballantyne, Head of Māori Strategic Outcomes. Tēnā koutou katoa. And I'll leave it to you, Matua, um, to uh, introduce the item. Kia ora. Kia ora koutou. Um, tēnā koutou te he mana o tēnei o tātou komiti. E te kura matua uh, me ngā hoa mema uh, kato o te Committee of PACE and colleagues. Um, yes, as pointed out, we have uh, uh, joined by our colleagues Luann Ballantyne and Ashley Walker uh, for this item uh, in case I go off the rails. Um, but uh, we are asking uh, the committee to receive the six monthly uh, update and we're really pleased to provide it to the PACE committee. Um, you'll be aware that uh, um, the Kia ora Tamaki Makoto framework was um, adopted by PACE in July last year, um, pretty much at the start of the uh, current operating year, um, and that sets up a, um, a regime of six monthly reporting uh, back to PACE, and this is the first um, of those reports. It's the inaugural six-month report uh, covering the period 1 July through to uh, 31 December, um, and the annual report will come to PACE, uh, the first such report under the um, guidance of Kia ora Tamaki Makoto uh, in and around September of this year. Um, so um, with the with the inaugural report, um, I just would like to um, take um, the members through um, the uh, highlights, and Ashley's kindly put up the, the summary slide um, that talks to uh, the update report submitted to the committee. Um, the, uh, the highlights for the period, so we're, it's just early stages, uh, first six months um, of um, uh, activity aligned uh, to Kia ora Tamaki Makoto. Uh, so of the 10 key outcomes or mana outcomes um, that are um, uh, 
built into uh, or that are the basis for Kia ora Tamaki Makoto. We've got a range of um, good through to um, need to work harder. Um, uh, six month uh, status reports to provide the committee. Uh, but in terms of highlights, um, as is noted here, we do have the framework. It's providing uh, the ability to um, uh, to guide uh, contributions and performance across Auckland Council Group. Uh, and um, uh, we continue still to uh, further work on that guidance and give further definition as we go forward and learn more uh, over the first uh, six months of, of implementation. We've got good uptake and goodwill across the group, uh, and we can point to um, a range of progress, either positive um, or um, initial, uh, as part of the six-month report. But in terms of uh, the period in review, uh, we've got the, um, you know, the cross-cutting challenge of uh, the impact of COVID-19 that slowed down some progress, particularly around our capital projects that we're supporting. The Marae infrastructure projects are understandably uh, de delayed due to um, COVID restrictions and um, supply, um, supply chain uh, challenges that have arisen. And um, um, we um, note the, the ongoing uh, challenge of uh, mana whenua engagement across this work and um, testing back to make sure there's broad alignment uh, with priorities um, with mana whenua and wider Māori audiences. Uh, and, um, and to that end, uh, keeping in good uh, contact with uh, colleagues at the IMSB. Um, early days, but we're also uh, looking to push on and uh, raise the profile uh, and visibility of Kia ora Samaki Makoto and expected contributions uh, across the Auckland Council Group. Um, and to marshal that effort, we're doing work uh, to um, uh, bring together a, a roadmap, an implementation strategy uh, to support uh, the, um, the contributions across those um, 10 mana outcomes. Um, if I can just briefly say, of the 10 mana outcomes, we've got four that we that we would um, um, uh, advise the committee are showing pleasing signs of progress. Uh, those are Kia ora Te Umanga, uh, the business and enterprise and economy outcome. Uh, kia ora Te Reo, um, again, in terms of recognition and support for Te Reo across council groups uh, and um, how that um, lands in terms of the experience of uh, Tamaki Māori uh, groups and users of our, our services across Auckland Council. Uh, kia ora te whānau, which is focusing in at the whānau level of wellbeing, and hāngai te kaunihira, uh, which are the internal arrangements with council. So um, uh, fair to say, some of that's more light green than deep rich green, but uh, it's pleasing to uh, see the progress on four of those 10 spaces um, because we've got activity underway, We've got um, leadership of those outcomes that's uh, pushing that work forward, supported by um, their initial plans, and that work is coming together. We've got another four that are in the middle band, the uh, amber band, um, Kia ora te kainga, Kia ora te marae, which I talked about in terms of uh, really good work there, but the COVID disruptions are an understandable uh, impact on the pro progress of that work. Uh, kia ora te taiao, and Kia ora te honunga, uh, which is the, the issue of, um, of getting strong, consistent and good quality reach uh, and engagement across Tamaki, Māori, Mana Whenua and Mata Waka communities. Lots more work to be done there. And uh, two of the, uh, the other two of the 10 outcomes, uh, Kia ora te ahurea, uh, Māori culture and identity across Tamaki Makoto and Kia ora te rangatahi. Uh, we do have issues there with getting um, uh, reportage underway um, and also there may be question marks about whether or not we've located those particular areas and lead responsibility uh, in the right areas across the council group and whether or not we need to have a bit of a rethink on those um, on those particular outcomes. So early days, some work ons, but pleasing to get the first six months under our belt and talk to uh, more positive uh, progress um, while also seeing uh, some areas to work on. Um, now, councillors might, um, and, and seeing the full written uh, progress update, um, uh, have the question about whether or not this is comprehensively capturing uh, all of the positive activity and contributions for Māori outcomes across council group. 
Uh, the short answer is we're reliant at this stage, at this very early stage, on what the um, the leads, the mana outcome leads, are able to collate and bring together into our reportage. So there are no doubt uh, relevant activities uh, going on that we haven't yet um, caught within the net of Kia ora Tamaki Makoto and the reporting arrangements we have at this early stage. But again, that's one of those areas that we'll be working on with successive reporting to make sure we've got a fuller contribution, a fuller scorecard to report back to Council. Um, nonetheless, we appreciate the work that those leads are putting in to help us put together the first six-month report uh, to PACE Committee. Kia ora koutou. Tēnā koe te rangatira. Um, just seeing if uh, Ashley or Llewellyn, I'm assuming that um, you've taken the lead and they are your support crew. Matua. Um, I'll go to Matua Wilcox. Matua, if you're still trying to push that button. Yeah, kapai. Karo? Yeah, kapai. え、みんなけ the Kororo me ngā whitiwhiti Kororo ki tā mana whenua. Uh, I mea mai, i mea mai koe, uh, he wero tēnā. Uh, he a te, te take he wero i te mea mohiana au uh, lima te kau mano nā te, te nui o te pūtea mō rātou. Ma, I, pā, I, I, I pānui au i te, I te kaupapa nei o, o tēnei komiti. Uh, tata, ki, tata ki ngā huri, ngā kōroro, ngā, ngā kōroro, ngā tono ki ngā iwi. Ngā, horakau rātau e whakawitu, tērā te take, iti noi ho ngā pūre. E a te hakaaro tēnā, nā, me, 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 me piki ake tēnā. Tēnā tahu pātai. Oh, sorry, was I speaking in Māori? Kei te pai, tēnā koe e te mema. Uh, sorry, sorry. Te matu e Glenn. Uh, it, it, it was right through the chair to uh, reply to the to uh, te pātai ko pātai ngia mai e koe. Um, you're quite right. Uh, the capacity building program we have within uh, Council has been um, a program that uh, goes back to uh, just after amalgamation, so uh, 11, 12 years and counting, and it has remained fixed at an annual grant to uh, the um, mandated iwi organisations of $50,000 per entity per annum, and that uh, magical sum is meant to cover a whole range of engagement, uh, either expectations or invitations and requests put out by all parts of the Auckland Council Group uh, to um, each of the iwi entities involved. Uh, for some of the large mature organisations, um, iwi entities, they're very much um, comfortable um, picking the issues that they wish to um, uh, muscle up on and have deep engagement with council. Uh, but at the other end of the spectrum, with our much smaller, with the much smaller iwi entities, the fledgling organisations, um, it's a lot of ground to cover and. Um, the $50,000 grant that we are able to make under the current program uh, probably doesn't um, uh, recognise the, the full transaction burden um, that uh, is placed on uh, iwi from year to year. Alongside that, however, I, I do, um, uh, I am aware, and, and members should note, uh, that there are a range of um, uh, forum and fees type arrangements that uh, go alongside that. Uh, whether or not they're properly marshaled, coordinated, and um, and satisfactorily respond to the capacity challenges that uh, the iwi entities um, are faced, 
and th and this is not even speaking to the to the um, parallel uh, challenge of engagement with um, Matawaka voices and communities of interest across Tamaki Makoto. Uh, um, we've got uh, a challenge uh, to to uh, look at that work alongside how to make the engagement more effective, and certainly, as the member alludes to, part of that is um, is looking much more um, um, openly to how we can understand the capacity challenges here we face and 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 reasonably respond to that over and beyond what's been a static program after the over the last uh, twelve years. Kia um, yes, uh, apologies, Chair. I didn't realise I was talking to Māori. I was just bumbling along. Um, no, no problems at all. Um, I think my question is, but our committees, and I'm talking mainly about this committee, are we getting the proper results from that, the value, not the value, because we can't be, because a lot of the responses, even in this in this. Uh, in this agenda, uh, no objections, no court at all was received. So what I'm trying to ask is, I'm concerned that we are getting very poor consultation and very poor, um, very poor results of that consultation. In fact, I'd almost put it as tokenistic. Um, unless an iwi or a hapu is, you know, it feels strong enough to respond and to, to council who are who's trying to do its statutory obligations but the but the but the crown partner is struggling i mean it's been yonks since i saw a presentation like i saw presentations from local boards from iwi why is that because they have no capacity so i'm wondering whether we're getting the the quality that we should be getting in order to make proper decision making. So that's the question I'm asking. Are we getting that quality into these into these agendas? Because it seems to me that we're not. Thank you. Matu, what I'm gonna uh, so I'm I'm assuming that question was aimed at me. Um, no, no, that was that was to to hit it with me, but um, oh, I mean, okay. I'm, I'm asking him whether he's whether whether Matarai believes because they're our council Maori experts. Whether Matarai believe Matarai believes we are getting the quality of consultation that enables us to make the proper decisions from our crown partner. Look, I, I, I'll only speak from, from um, our directorate, but also the PACE committee, um, and I can say yes. Um, we, we, we are in regards to any of uh, the issues that, that, that come through to, to the PACE committee. Um, I can't speak on the other committees, but I also know um, that, that uh, the committees of the whole and all the committees um, have and, and and will be consulting with Māori. So I can only speak for this particular committee and I know that everything that comes through our way, one of the key things is around consulting not only Mātāwaka, but also mana whenua. So I can speak on this on behalf of, of the director, um, uh, not only Claudia, uh, but also um, Matua Hedewini. So that's, that's Matua, I, I don't know if you've got a, any any comments to, to to pass through in regards to the part I but that's that's it from this committee. I know um, what what we end up doing around cons consultation with Māori, whether it be Mata Waka um, and also Mana Finua. So I leave that to you, Matua Hedimini. Kia ora. Uh, if, if I can just say, look, uh, um, uh, the fact that we've got. Um, such a wide range across Auckland Council Group of different ways of coming at the issue of engagement with mana whenua and mata waka, that they are not coordinated and that the end result um, uh, raises questions as to whether or not these engagements are well informed, uh, timely and therefore uh, generate quality participation from uh, mana whenua and mata waka is a live question hence the reason for an uh, all of group review that we have live at the moment.
Matteo Wilcox? Um, look, that's all I have to say on this. I might have a comment later on. Um, but that's, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Kapai tera. Um, Matteo Kake. Yeah, kia ora. Uh, kia ora, Heruini, and I uh, just want to first of all acknowledge that this is a implementation update, and uh, and you know from your perspective, you identify the mana uh, outcomes as uh, you know you've you I think you've been uh, tick up and puno with us around uh, the the areas where you think are progressing well, and the areas that you think we aren't progressing well, uh, and your colour coding on that previous slide, so I, I acknowledge that, and the, and the, to be honest, bro, this is a hiding to nothing. Uh, in these these kind of situations, see, we we can we can engage, we can engage and engage, and there'll still be whole heart people that say you haven't engaged with me, you know, or you haven't heard me correctly. So I just need the to support the council staff in terms of continuing to try different things. I know you tried to contact me the other day to try and talk about this Kopapa too, and and I I'll, I will contact you, uh, Hiruini, to give some advice, particularly in the Tamaki Makau Tamaki Kite Tonga Matawaka space. I feel that I'm obligated to 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 have that corridor well with you around that that area, but um, but just to acknowledge, you know, there's there's I guess the the you know, uh, Matu Glenn raises some good points in terms of some of the stuff that we've been uh, I guess having to sustain for nearly 11, 12 years now in terms of that whole re relationship with Mana Finua, Matawaka, different kettle all to, all together, but uh, acknowledge you you know I think the Mana outcomes are a, a, are a good start. If we can advance some of those uh, those areas and getting good definition around what we mean by outcomes and articulate that in the reports, then we can start to say, yep, we've we've um, we're we're progressing well. But uh, your version of uh, um, of good progress and iwi um, perception of good progress are totally two different things. Sometimes they say that's the bit that I think you're on a hiding to nothing, right? That you'll never get 100%. But uh, just just talking at the table and understanding each other's views is, is I think, is a good outcome. We're all about relationships. We're all about relationships. Not adding I'm here to Kiaqui. Um There's no further part, I. Um, so, Matua Wilcox, if you have any whakaro, ko koe, and then I'll get Councillor Dalton uh, to close the debate. Kia ora uh, Thank you, Chair. And, yes, these the mana outcomes, they're a positive direction for, for the way that Council is moving, and I support them totally. E hara tēnei he kohe te mō te katoa. But, it, but there are issues that I think need to be raised. And the, the one that, that concerns me most and that I'm focusing on this today has been the lack of support and hence the lack of response from many iwi, let alone mata waka, of, of, of to questions and pātai and all that corridor that's come that's, that's flying at them from the council. In my own case, I have seen myself where, because since 2010, I mean, that was almost, you know, that was almost a lifetime ago, you know, where we were talking about 5,000 5, resource consents for the whole, for the whole <laughs> quarter kind of thing, you know. I mean, we've, we've gone way past that now. And... Mana whenua are struggling under the burden of having to respond and having to just investigate whether they need to respond to them. So that challenge that I'm laying before you is that they do need help. And look, bottom line is 50,000 in 2010 certainly ain't cutting the mustard today. And the second part of my quarter was it's not only, as Tony said, it's not only... Mana whenua. Mata waka, our marae are being asked all kinds of kōrero. And sometimes they are just overwhelmed by the amount of questions, not only from council, but from the government in general. You know, that's why our people are tired of being asked questions. And that was the purpose of my kōrero, my pātai this morning to the, um, to, the committee, uh, to the committee when we were talking about the waste minimisation and the recycling kaupapa, because we've we've been done to death. We've been partied to death. I mean, you tell me one Aucklander who's not sick and 
sick and tired of submitting on something. So I think, you know, there needs to be some way of, of upping that so that we get quality responses. To get responses that, and they're littered through just about every committee, we received no response. We received no response. It's not good enough. And I think we need to kind of get more quality of response so that we get a better understanding rather than waiting for the for the cliff, to, for the hammock at the end of the cliff. So I support this Kopapa com- completely because it's the way we start. You've got to start off with small steps first. So thank you for that and thank you. Thank you, Chief. Um Councillor Dalton, um you to close. Kia ora, Chair. And firstly, I'd just like to thank Hirawanui and Hirawani and the team um, for the work that they've been doing and for the six-month progress update on Kia ora Tamaki Makaurau. It's great that through the Auckland Plan and through Kia ora Tamaki Makaurau that Council has stated its commitment to the Treaty of Waitangi and to better Māori outcomes. But I speak from a position as Tangata Tariti, and that is a treaty partner, and that is to listen to what Member Wilcox just said and how we take that for Karo and do something with it. And the same as Member Kake too, you know, we must do something with it. So Hirawini, um, this is what you're tasked to do, isn't it? And this is something we have a framework now that provides us with that clarity and direction as you have said and we must continue to build on it and through the Auckland Council group we have a commitment and we must do this as partners um, in this in, in Tamaki Makaro to make sure that we actually do deliver on outcomes that are meaningful. Just the um, Fakaro around consultation, it is a topic of conversation. It was mentioned in another workshop this week. It's too much. It's way too much for everybody, and that's across everything that we do. So we need to work our way through that as a council. Um, Perhaps through legislation is probably the the outcome there. But in terms of this report, um, I commend it to the committee. And thank you, uh, Namaturai, led by Hirawini uh, on this kaupapa. Kia ora, Chair. Nga mihi. So I'll put the recommendation. All those in favour? Aye. 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 Against? Kerry, tēnā koutou katoa, Hirawini, Rawako, Ashley, Luan. Kia ora nā. And um, look, um, I'm going to... Uh, I know I said at one o'clock, but I think item 15 is one that um, hopefully touch wood and um, is is actually quite simple. Um, it's been supported by the local board, so I'm going to put item 15 um, before we go. Um, and thank you, uh, Councillor Collins, for uh, coming back online. You're just in time for this last item and then lunch. Um, So item 15, it will be moved by um, Deputy Mayor Cashmore, and I will second it to put it on the table. So I know that Moira um, is is not feeling well. So Letitia, I know you're doing this particular item. Can you please pass on um, um, from our committee for her to get well soon? So Letitia, I'm going to invite you to to talk to this particular item, and then I'll go with... um, Pātai and then Whakaro, and then I'll put the recommendation. Tēnā koe, Letitia. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair, and kia ora, everyone. Uh, yes, attending this on behalf of my colleague Moira for Moi to, uh, today. Uh, this item was previously considered and approved unanimously by the PACE Committee in May 2021, Uh, with the PACE Committee approving the submission of a request to the Minister of Conservation to uplift the reserve status of two properties in Beachlands. Iki Panuku subsequently lodged the reserve revocation applications with the Department of Conservation. Uh, In October 2021, the Department of Conservation completed its preliminary review and advised Iki Panuku Iki Panuku and the minister, um, that the Minister of Conservation had received two submissions directly. 
uh, and sought Auckland Council's consideration and views on these additional submissions. All submissions have been reviewed by Auckland Council, uh, Council's Land Advisory Services Team, Community Investments Team, um, and presented to the Franklin Local Board who fully support the uh, revocation of the reserved status of these two properties. We're now reporting the results back to the PACE Committee, see seeking approval again to submit a final request to the, the Minister of Conservation to uplift the reserved status of these properties. And just to note that these two properties were progressed um, by way of service property optimisation at the request of the Franklin Local Board. Happy to answer any questions. Kapai Leticia, thank you. Any partai, I'll apply the rule. Any whakaro before the Deputy Mayor speaks to close the debate? Deputy Mayor, your choice. Just to say words, I'd say, I'll excuse the local mob going past. Um, that the Franklin Local Board has been very good at putting properties on the market that are, they, they deem surplus to requirements, sometimes a bit of angst from the community, but I thank them for their integrity in doing so. Kapai, uh, Deputy Mayor. So I'm going to put the recommendation. All those in favour? Aye. 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 Against? Aye. Carry. The time is now 13.07, so we'll be back at 13.07. 37 team, and then we'll get through our items before our dinner at seven. Kilda.
just uh, running around the kitchen looking for my lunch. So, you know, that, that was a good experience running. So um, let's get into it again. And um, I just want to make sure, Maya, can you do a roll call, please, my friend, just to make sure that people are still not eating? All right. Okay. Councillor Bartley. Present. Councillor Casey. Kia ora, Maya. Deputy Mayor Cashmore. All right. Councillor Collins. Kia ora, Maya. Oh, sorry for lateness. Present. Oh, there you go. sorry. Yeah, what's the one? What's the one? <laughs> sorry, Chia, sorry. <laughs> um, kia ora, Anor. And can I just note, please, that I just need to duck out at four o'clock to speak at a council event. Um, sorry, Chia, I should have mentioned that at the very beginning, but I might have been too optimistic about when we would be finishing. I can come Got back my... again by five. Yeah, either that or we'll see you at dinner at seven. Kia ora. Okay, sorry about that. Kia ora. Councillor Cooper. Aye. Councillor Dalton. Present. Councillor Darby. Aye. Councillor Fletcher with an apology. Mayor Goff. Kia ora. Councillor Hills. Kia ora. Oh. IMSB member Kaki. Aye. Councillor Mulholland. I know you were there. Pre <laughs> Present. Council Apologies, Chair. Someone just turned up, so I've been thrown out. Sorry. Goodbye. Councillor Newman. Good afternoon, Maya. Councillor Stewart. Present. Councillor Walker. Councillor Watson. Good afternoon, Maya. Thank you, Councillor Watson. I must be Member Wilcox. Councillor Young. Present. Thank you, Chair. Kia ora. Thank you, Maya. We'll move on to item 16. Item 16, now I, um, I will move it. Councillor Casey um, will second, not unless Councillor Collins would like to second the um the report councillor casey will second um so i'm just going to invite invite carl and introduce the team that's here in regards to item 16 so it's on the table now for discussion so carl I invite you to introduce the team please Um, and with me are Letitia Edwards, the um, head of uh, strategic asset optimization, and my colleague um, Anthony Lewis, um, who is the senior advisor on um, asset recycling portfolio and um, portfolio optimization. Um, I've just shared my screen. Um, can everybody see that, uh, Mr. Chair? Yes. Ah, excellent. Okay. Um, well, I'm I'm presenting the report on the uh, of the independent commissioners on the proposal to reverse six reserves uh, three in the um, three in the Mongaki by cursor now and three in the um, in in the Mangari Utahu local board area. Um, the Finance Performance Committee passed a resolution on the 16th of July 2020 to dispose of the six properties as part of the emergency budget, budget asset recycling list uh, subject to required statutory processes, which in this case um, is a reserve revocation. Um, Eke Panuku, um, on behalf of Council, undertook iwi and public notification in January and February 2021 in accordance with Section 24 of the Reserves Act 1977. Um, for these six reserves, uh, we received a total of 14 site-specific submissions um, and a further 56 uh, submissions that uh, covered the wider Auckland area. Um, 
In May 2021, Eke Panuku recommended to the regulatory committee that independent commissioners be appointed to consider the submissions and to hold public hearings. Um, this was duly done. Uh, the public hearing for these six properties uh, was held online um, shortly after we went into lockdown um, in late August 2021. The commissioner's report has been submitted in Appendix D. Um, in a nutshell, the commissioners support the proposed revocation of all six reserves, um, although they have noted that in the case of 5R Ferguson Street, um, it would be appropriate to explore disposal um, options in whole or in part to the adjoining owner that has been um, encroaching on a part of the reserve since 1979. We therefore recommend that the committee accept the recommendations of the independent commissioners to forward a request to the Minister for Conservation to uplift the reserve status of these six properties. Thank you very much. I'm open to questions. meeting yeah okay all right Al. Cheers, okay thanks. look um hum humble apologies um um I'm, I'm assuming carl everything's done um and i'm just going to open it up for part time uh there's none i'm going to end up opening for any fakar or is, is that is that where i'm up to maya correct thank you so much um, so if there's none, and there doesn't seem to be, it's been moved and seconded, um, I'm going to put the recommendation. All those in favour? Aye. 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 Against? Against. Okay. Do, do you want it uh, noted, um, Councillor Bartley? Yes, please. Sorry, okay. Mr. Yeah, that, that's an against from me to Tony. Oh, yeah. Matua Kake as well. And Against and Councillor Mulholland. Okay. In anybody Collins. else? Collins. And, and Collins. Kapai. So those four have been noted. Um, so I uh, will move on. Thank you so much, team. Um, we, we'll move on to the next item, and um, uh, the next item is seventeen, and that's the homelessness work program. Uh, progress update. I've got Councillor Collins and Councillor Casey who will move this particular item 17. And I'm just going to invite Bonnie uh, to introduce the team, uh, Taff, Ben, and Caroline. Kia ora. Uh, kia ora, councillors. Uh, my name is Ben Brooks. I'm the Senior Policy Manager in Social Wellbeing Policy, and I've got Bonnie Epps, who is the Senior Policy Advisor leading this work, uh, Caroline Stevens, who's also in the team, and then Taff Wakaira and Dickie Humphreys, who are from Connected Communities. Um, so Bonnie will do a short presentation, and then we'll be happy to take questions. Kapai. Thank you, Ben. Um, I'll start by um, with a brief recap on the decisions made before today on the Homelessness Work Programme. So in August 2017, Council decided to contribute to the vision that homelessness is rare, brief and non-recurring by supporting the sector, developing a cross-sectoral approach for Auckland and strengthening levers. In August 2020, Council endorsed Kia Whai Kangatatu Katoa Auckland's Regional Cross-Sectoral Homelessness Plan to provide strategic leadership and cross-sectoral coordination for Auckland. Council offers backbone support to the homelessness sector under this plan. Council also approved an implementation plan to strengthen levers and agreed to take an adaptive approach for COVID-19 impacts and to report back in 18 months. This 18-month update report Progress on Council Actions provides information on the nature and scale of homelessness in Auckland and seeks approval of the next implementation plan. The figure on the right here illustrates the monitoring and evaluation framework for Kia Whai Kainatato Katoa and how we are, 
we've restructured our update report. So the framework includes monitoring progress on actions, system outputs and long term outcomes. COVID-19 has impacted people who are experiencing homelessness and the homelessness sector. This has also caused delays to some strategic mahi. Our partners among the sector have been focused on public health responses. Despite this, two council lead actions are complete, two are in progress and three are in hold. 15 council only actions are BAU or in progress. For system outputs and long-term outcomes, staff collated data from central government and publicly available data over the last 18 months. This is an attachment B to the report. So we cannot measure the specific impact of council's actions among a complex system of multiple contributors. Instead, we use the collective impact evaluation model to evaluate progress, speaking with agencies and service providers in Auckland. In the early years of collective impact, these core competencies are the focus. Many in the sector told us that continuous communication and common agenda are present. Feedback on mutually reinforcing activities was mixed. Several organisations, including Auckland Council, provide backbone support, but no one entity provides full backbone support for the sector. Staff also assess the strengths, weaknesses and constraints of Kia Fai Kainatato Katoa. It is still the only regional cross-sectoral plan in Auckland, it has embedded council's role and enabled the delivery, delivery of council-led actions. Weaknesses include low engagement and identifying priorities for collective work. Um, when asked what council can do in 2022 and 2023, the sector confirmed council's current role should continue and suggested some new actions within this role. Council will continue to offer the backbone support it currently provides and to investigate how this might be strengthened. Staff seek approval of the new priority actions in line with Council's role in Attachment C. We're happy to take any questions and I'll pass back to Ben to coordinate these. Thank you, Bonnie. Um, so I don't think there's any part time. Any further of the team to say anything? If not, um, it has been moved in second. Oh, here he is. No, Matua Kake Patai. Yeah, kia ora. Thank you for the report. And I acknowledge, um, you know, this is not a not an easy one to to address. But um, just can you be a bit more specific in terms of the significant impacts on homelessness on Maori and what's intended there? So I hand that one to Bonnie. So, um, Māori are overrepresented among those experiencing homelessness and, um, you know, COVID-19 has had specific impacts on this. Um, the service providers that we engaged um, spoke about those impacts and um, also some of the changes in the, um, in the sector that are going on, including um, more emphasis on Māori-led and um, initiatives and Māori lead strategy. Yeah. Can you be more specific? Like, like you know, it sounds like we. So, are we? Is our approach to actually work with these other uh, Māori organisations? Is that, is that what you're essentially saying? Yeah. So, council's role again in, in the attachment is just highlighting that that yeah. uh, I guess Kaikoe called it role, the facilitation coordination role. Is that is that it? Is that is there any, would you, well, no, I was, I was going to ask you about funding, but that's probably not fair, actually. Yes. Yeah, kia, um, kia, kia ora matua kake, uh, he kanoe hau hau i, i roto i tēnei uh, tari, um, but I'm the yeah, regional um, partnerships lead in homelessness uh, in this mahi, and um, just picking up your point around uh, our connection and, and mahi with um Fano Māori, we um, we're in the process of um, distributing the homelessness funding for those um, outreach services that connect into our most vulnerable. So that's um, yeah in train um, as we speak, uh, and there's some um, sensitivities around where that funding's going. But um, there are um, some Māori organisations as as a part of that um, process, uh, and also we're looking at. Um, uh, lining up the Kafai Kainga Tato Katoa strategy with um, Kia ora Te Kainga um, outcome under 
um, in Kirotamaki Makoto, and we're um, engaging in a feasibility study around um, marae led uh, emergency housing pilot um, and um, commissioning that around the practicalities of marae facilitating um, Māori whānau to transition into um, housing and what that might look like. So just getting the scope of Māori, uh, marae to housing ecosystem, the limitations around that and, and what that potentially could look like. Hey, thank you for the response. I, you know, I remember when Mayor Goff was uh, in a subcommittee when this all started again, when in, under the new council super city regime. And and to be fair, it doesn't sound like we've advanced it that much. Frustrating, I, 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 I feel. Oh, bye. Uh, Councillor Collins. Kia ora, Chair, and thanks uh, for the opportunity to ask some questions. Thanks also to Ben, who um, was, made some time available to me to um, to explain some of the report. Uh, I've just got a couple of questions. <clears throat> uh, firstly, under point 53 of, um, sorry, 55 of the report, the collective impact evaluation, I was wondering if given the uh, comments that were made and that if this might be the, an opportunity for us to reconsider how council might assist in leading some of this activities. I know these activities. I know when we spoke, uh, Ben, uh, our, our, we've got a real support function, and I just wonder as we might uh, get to the point where we're coming out of COVID and groups are starting to come back together, if this might be an opportunity to lead, or if the team see it as let's continue to play the support role to allow leadership to come from within the groups. Kia ora, thank you, Councillor. Um, so I think we do play a leadership role for some items, um, but we also do fundamentally collaborate with the sector. So even where we are taking a lead, we want to do that uh, in collaboration with the sector. But Bonnie might be able to um, build on that answer a little bit. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Um, the, you know, when we, when we spoke with the sector through the engagement that we did with the sector for this update, um, we did ask the sector, you know, what can council do um, in 2022 and 2023 directly? And they were really, you know, the, the partners that we spoke to really understood our role um, and are supportive of it at the moment. Um, and some of them have indicated interest in getting back into some strategic work. And we're here ready to kind of take those opportunities um, as, as we come, come out of the, um, the emergency response. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. I've just got two other quick questions. Uh, point 53 talks about how COVID has impacted on the strategic mahi, and we're all very aware that there's been a lot of on-the-ground work, which many of us appreciate. So thank you uh, to each of you. I was just wondering if, uh, given the question that Matua Kake has just asked, if you feel this is the opportunity to um, allow some of the strategic thinking to come to rise again, this will give us the opportunity to do that, given so much of the focus has been on on the ground work. That's another one for you, Barney. Yes. Um, so, I mean, I did. We did sort of speak with the sector when they had indicated some interest in getting back to um, strategic mahi, and um, you know, made the forum available um, for that again this year. Um, unfortunately, the Omicron sort of outbreak happened right right at that time, and even at that meeting, um, the ability for people to engage was low. Um, so we are we, we will just keep really working and listening to them and 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 making the group available when when the right time comes. Yeah. I think it's just to build on that, so just to reinforce Bonnie's point, the sector has indicated that they are really keen to work in that space. They don't want to always be in the urgent responsive phase. That has partly been a, a reaction to COVID and needing to um, to operate in that space, but they are keen to work with us in that strategic space, um, but recognising that that really relies on them having the capacity to do that. And at the moment, that's a challenge for them. 
Thank you. And just my final question is, I wonder if you might elucidate just a little bit further on points 48 to 50 around antisocial behaviour and how, how well you believe we understand that. You'll know uh, we are in election year. There's, there is some politicisation in the media around antisocial behaviour and connecting it uh, almost unfairly to those who are homeless or rough sleeping. And I just wondered if you might just give a bit more uh, of an explanation so that people are clear that we are not talking about when we're talking about the homeless community and rough sleeper community, we're not immediately associating it with antisocial behaviour. Kia ora, thank you, Councillor. So um, one of the issues that the sector talks to us about and is a priority for Kiafai Kainga Tata Katoa is around stigma of the homeless community. Um, so we're keen in whatever we do to not uh, exacerbate that issue. Um, we have had numerous reports around issues around antisocial behaviour in the city centre, but also in other parts of Auckland. Um, it is an issue where we have lots of people telling us what the causes are. Um, when we talk to the homelessness sector, they say that it is not just um, a, an issue of people who are homeless uh, engaging in that kind of behaviour. Um, and more others are saying similar things, but we are also getting reports that it is um, at least partially people who are homeless. So one thing that we are looking to do is can we do some work with um, central governments, some of the key central government agencies, as well as the broader sector to actually really dive into that? Because at the moment, I think we are receiving lots of anecdotal reports on what are the drivers, um, but it's very hard to put in place proper solutions to these types of issues without actually having some really robust evidence to make those those kind of calls. So that's what we are working on at the moment. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Collins. Deputy Mayor. Thanks, Alf, and thanks, team, Ben, um, Bonnie. It seems to be forever that we've had homeless on Auckland streets, alcohol, drug problems, um, mental issues. And I sort of keep getting the thing we're not succeeding. How well aligned are we with the private philanthropic sector and the Crown on a, an agreed plan and a way of getting out of this um, problem, solving it, and um, working to make these people's lives better? Or are we just on the treadmill? Uh, kia ora, uh, Mr Deputy Mayor. I think we have some good alignment in the sense that we now have some plans in place that weren't previously, and there is an extremely good alignment between them. So we have the national plan, and we also have Kia Whai Kainga Tātou Katoa, which is our regional Auckland plan, which has been endorsed by uh, councillors the last time we spoke to this committee about um, these issues. Those plans are in good alignment, and we engage very regularly. I think um, it's fair to say, and I think you'll see this in the report, that it's not perfect, and there are some opportunities to improve that, which is one of the things we're working on. Um, we're also keen, I guess, to play our part as council. So councillors have made decisions about the role and focus that we will have, um, and we have been working on that, um, and also working with the sector to make sure that what we are doing is as supportive and productive as possible, and we're getting some good feedback about that. Um, I think we have been partially sort of derailed a little bit by COVID, but also it has created some opportunities. So we've seen, we saw um, for a while at least some quite substantial reductions in the number of people rough sleeping, which has been positive. Um, some of those people have now returned to the streets, which is an issue, but there have still been some positives even more broadly around um, some of the health responses and being able to support people and also some of the work bringing the sector together and the level of sort of connection and collaboration between not us and the broader sector, but also within, within central government and some of the other key players. So I think all of us would have liked to have seen more progress, um, but I think we have seen some good progress and I think there is a real will and some real, um, some good foundations. Um, not that we would have wanted to have gone through COVID, but it has put in place some things that I think put us in a good place to build in the future. Thanks. And I do recognise, Ben, that you and the team are, are not in control of the situation. You're one of the people trying to solve it. I wish you all the you know, power to your arms. I wish you all the best. Um, but it has to be monitored, it has to be ch checked on for levels of success. Uh, otherwise, we are just a treadmill and we need to, can't have that. Thank you. Okay. Right. See you later. Bye. Bye. Sorry, um, Matua Glenn and then Councillor Bartley. Thank you, Chair. Um, my first question, I've just got a couple. 
um, is there's quite a bit here about Māori homelessness. I'm struggling to see a mana whenua whakaro coming through here with regards to that. Did you interact with any mana whenua? Are we interacting with any mana whenua? Um, yeah, we uh, um, have linked ourselves with um, a number of uh, Māori providers that um, work at the, the pointy sharp end of the of the mahi um, in helping our most vulnerable whānau um, accessing the services that they need, particularly uh, in this housing um Housing environment. So, um, so in terms of that, we're speaking with Te Runga o Nati Fatua um, and uh, some a number of the other um, marae across um, Auckland um, that um, provide those um, support services to our to our most vulnerable. Um, yeah, and and I guess within council too, we're looking at some of the um, staff practices around engaging. Um, with our front-facing staff um, in um, uh, the approach uh, around um, connecting with um, homeless that are intersecting with front-facing staff on a daily basis. So that's around developing a more um, relational and collaborative solutions orientated way of working. So all of that is sort of connecting into um, addressing some of the issues that our, our Māori whānau are facing. Yeah. So you've been dealing with Ngāti Whātua, is that through Kahui Tukaha or, or just with Ngāti Whātua Direct? I with Kahui Tukaha and with um, Te Haoranga. Okay. So my question is, are there other mana whenua here that are in this space? Do we know or have we discussed this with any other mana whenua? Um... Only the only the ones that are on our sort of um, yeah engagement list through the Rough Sleepers steering group. So um, yeah, I mean Nati Fatu is the big ones for us. Yeah, yeah, but I'm sure the, the Rough Sleepers aren't all Nati Fatu. No. Um, so so yeah. my, That's a, it's a work in progress. Eh? Yeah. So my question is is the statement number seventy five. Um, the key focus for Māori service providers is on is on by Māori for Māori strategy collaboration with service delivery. Are you saying that the Māori service providers are only delivering to Māori? Um, I might, might answer that one just quickly. So um, the Māori service providers that we engaged for the report, um, you know, gave us that information and spoke to us about the um, that focus. Um, so that's Kahui Tukaha, Te Whanau Rangimarie and Peak Body for Māori Housing, Te Matapihi. Um, uh, I don't believe they're only um, providing services to Māori. It's not exclusive services, but they are um, the Māori providers. So they're not actually, they're not only providing services just to Māori, is that, is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, so then 75 needs to be changed a little bit, right? Or why are you saying that's their only strategy? I'm, I'm just trying to understand, are Māori providers only looking after Māori? Or are they following on Manaki tanga, tikanga, kaupapa, of looking after everyone who comes to them? Kia ora, member Wilcox. They are doing a Manaki tanga process, however, that statement in paragraph 75 is that when they are working with Māori, they have a focus on by Māori for Māori. Thank you for the for that clarification. No problems, no other questions. Thank you, Chair. Kapai matua. Councillor Bartley. Oh, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, everybody, for your work on this. Uh, very uh, important uh, topic. Um, I wanted to ask in terms of the influence, leadership and advocacy part of the implementation plan, if there's any work that's going to be happening to look at 
how MSD deal with emergency housing because I only know what I know on the ground and I've had to help people that I see living in their cars in the parks in my ward um, and I've noticed the difference uh, between when I used to be able to ring Kahui to Kaha directly, the crisis line after hours, because you know people aren't homeless nine to five Monday to Friday, um, and the situation that it is now, which is ringing the 0800 number for MSD and waiting hours in line, and the homeless people person that I'm dealing with doesn't have a phone. You know, it seems very bureaucratic, and to be honest, it's not working. Um, how they're dealing with emergency housing. So it would help with our advocacy to be able to have some research as opposed to my anecdotal experience that the way we're dealing with emergency housing is not sufficient for our city. Um, but is that something you guys could look into? Kia ora, Councillor. So we're, our focus is really around supporting the sector, so we are keen to support them, and that is obviously an issue. I think there is a broad recognition um, that a large part of the solution to the, the homelessness crisis is around housing and making sure we have enough, and we're probably not in a position that we have sufficient housing, so that is always going to be a challenge for us. Um, so we really will support the sector around um, making sure that they can connect people, the people that they are working with, up into those types of um, the services that they need in including housing, but as well as the others. So we're happy to work on those those types of issues, but in partnership with the sector. Mm. Okay. Kabai? Yeah, yeah, but the sector is not working. Well, MSD is not working. That approach is not working. If it was empowering the sector to be able to do what they do, then that would work. But I suppose that it's something we can raise with MSD directly. Um, yeah, I was going to suggest that as well, that the team, because they're obviously in consultation with them, um, would be a good thing. Um, Claudia. Uh, so kia ora, and thank you very much for that comment. So I can, uh, I'm happy to reassure you that we are um, also at quite a senior executive level in discussions with our ministry colleagues around um, these matters too. And we've had some very, very positive um, engagement with MSD to, um, who are also very keen to help resolve this issue, find simpler ways of working and help support our communities better. So we will continue to do so. And, um, and I can also raise some of that feedback perhaps directly with them if that helps. Kia ora. Kia ora, thank you. Kapai, Claudia. So, look, uh, any whakaro before Councillor Collins closes the debate? Yes, Chair. Ah, kapai, matua. Yeah, Chair, look, I'd, I don't know whether we need to put this into amendment, but I think the, the, the kaupapa that Josephine has brought up it's very clear, the sector, it's all right, the sector, but what about the homeless? And my quarter rule would be actually that we actually um, ask the team to advocate, um, as, as an amendment, to advocate for a more responsive process for homeless to to get housing. I've been at a, I was at the opening of a place in, in, at Atkinson and Ava, down there at Otahu, and the minister uh, said straight out, we'd rather they be in a motel than sleeping outside on the, on the road. But, you know, if you've got to wait eight hours or whatever to try and organise that process, there's no manakitanga and there's no aroha in making people jump through a hoop to get, that, to get, a, to get a room. So I don't know whether we need to make an amendment or, or, or just make a strong representation to our team to really advocate because Claudia has said so. That's all I have to say, Chair, and, and I'll see where you think it should go. Thank you very much. Kapai Matu, I think the, 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 the team have taken what, what you have said on board, so I would suggest we do that instead of putting a formal recommendation um, and and I know I've no doubt at all that Councillor Collins will follow that up with the team as the portfolio holder as well. Matua, uh, your worship, the mayor. 
Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Look, um, just to pick up um, on comments uh, that, that Glenn and Tony made earlier, uh, firstly, it, it is a situation of frustration because uh, the homelessness situation uh, in Auckland has not got better, uh, it's got worse. And we largely know the reasons for that. Uh, and equally, we know that the instruments to, to properly tackle the problem of homelessness don't rest with council. Uh, predominantly, they rest with central government. Uh, if it's about supply of housing, uh, particularly uh, affordable housing through um, uh, social agencies, it's a, it's a million dollars to provide a house. And uh, you don't have to look very long at council funding to know that we'd only scratch the surface of it if we were to be a direct provider of housing. But as Glenn has suggested, uh, it is a case of advocacy. And over the last five years, we, we have been using our voice for, for that purpose. Uh, advocacy, first of all, to lift the number of houses uh, being built, because if you've got um, a, a supply of housing that doesn't meet demand, the people that fall off the bottom are the poorest people, uh, and it pushes the prices up. A supply uh, of affordable housing, and we've pushed hard uh, for more kaianga ora, more community housing. And the government's making some genuine efforts there, uh, but those efforts aren't yet um, meeting the growth in, in, in demand for housing because of the uh, situation with people on, on low income. Uh, the third sort of intervention is actually to lift the income of people that can't afford to get decent housing. And that's where, you know, the little things that we can do ourselves, like a living wage at council, but to push for higher minimum wages, to push for higher social support for those at the bottom of the heap, uh, to push for um, more support for uh, groups like Housing First, and 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 we've been doing we've been doing all of that as as well. Um, there is some stuff that we do directly, and we we obviously um, have helped with the Auckland City Mission and put some millions of dollars into the Auckland City Mission and the home ground that they've built and provided other support for them. Uh, we do provide um, some support for in, in terms of elderly housing. But, you know, constantly when we come up with um, work programs, we all know that you can't live in a plan. Uh, what What is important uh, is what is happening on the ground. It's about sustaining people's incomes. It's about tackling the causes of homelessness that are not just housing supply and demand, but mental health and uh, uh, addiction, uh, drug and alcohol uh, addiction. We all know what causes people to be sleeping rough because we've been out there, we've listened to them, we've talked to Housing First, uh, we, we know what's happening. Uh, and we'll continue to push for those things. But in terms of direct provision ourselves through council, um, we, we know that, that that simply is not a possibility uh, given the source of revenue that we have and the financial challenges that we face. So it is, as Glenn said, largely a matter of advocacy. But I acknowledge Tony's point, you know, five years ago we were sitting around talking about the same thing. And the frustrating thing about the plan that we've got before us is that no matter how much we plan and how much support we can provide indirectly through helping providers, uh, that doesn't solve the homelessness problem. But we are active on that. We are talking to government about that. We are pushing for improvements. We are highlighting uh, the social costs of, uh, of homelessness and what needs to be done. So, yeah, it will always be frustrating to look at what we can do. Um, and that's why we've got to look at the, the partnership that we can create uh, with central government because they have the funds that can make a difference and we want them to do more. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I'll get Councillor Collins, um, you to close the debate, please. Kia ora, Chair, and thank you uh, very much. And thanks, Chair, that uh, you invited me to participate in an earlier discussion as well when this report was coming to the committee. Sir, I just wanted to firstly acknowledge the officers. I know that the officers who are involved around supporting uh, the activities for rough sleeping in our homeless community are really committed to this work. And I can't see everyone on the screen in front of me, but people like Ben, Bonnie, Taff and Dickie have done fantastic work. And I'm really grateful for the work that they're doing because they're really supporting the sector. 
I, um, I, I think Councillor Bartley talked about just how frustrating it is when you're on the ground and you're trying to get things done. And so we've got to strengthen those partnerships. And look, I don't want to have a go at some of the public services here, but I would really welcome a way in which we can cut through some of the challenges we've had in connecting with government departments so that we can have the kind of results and outcomes that have been mentioned already by our um, by our members, uh, Tony Kake and Glenn Wilcox. So I think there's real work to be done there because that will only enhance the activities of the sector, of groups who are doing amazing work like Auckland City Mission, LifeWise, Vision West, Salvation Army. There are so many groups doing some great work and we want to be able to support what they are doing perhaps from a strategic level so that they feel like they've got the ability to get out into the community and support our rough sleeper and homeless community. So for me, I think that's where council can have an ongoing impact because that's our role as we're supporting some of these functions. We're leading in some areas which we've had, uh, which has already been mentioned this afternoon. But I think this is another opportunity for us to say, well, where there's other gaps, this might be something that we can hold the breach for until the sector is happy with where that leadership is developing. So I think it's really important that we we understand where we sit, that we look towards ways in which we can encourage and energise the leadership and the activity of the sector because we know they've been ultra busy, especially over the last couple of years, but it has been a discussion we've been having for a long time. And finally, Chair, this is going to be a politicised issue. We've already seen it. We've already seen some what I would regard as horrific comments made in the media about how we treat the homeless. And I'm I'm very weary that we want to support people. And the mayor has already spoken about these activities. He's expressed his own frustration. But the mayor has also been pivotal in leading discussions with uh, the sector as well. And so everyone is committed to working with this community. But this is not going to change overnight. And this is not going to have an easy, simple unrealistic answer and solution to it. And so my encouragement today is to continue to work alongside the sector. They know what's best. And the officers have reminded us today that they're doing everything they can. What do we do to continue to support their activities so that we can reach and humanely part of our community because they are a part of our community. So thank you to the officers. Thank you, Chair, for bringing this to the meeting today. And I think this is something we've got to keep our eye on and ensure that the sector is successful in their activities because when this particular sector of our some of our most vulnerable in the community will be successful in, in housing and supporting our rough sleeper and homeless community, then actually all of Auckland is successful because they're about all of our community. Thanks, Chair. So uh, the debate has been closed. The recommendation is on there. I will put the recommendation. All those in favour? Aye. 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 Against. Aye. Carried. We'll move now to item 18. Item 18 has um, is a mover and seconder for item 18. Um, and please, Mai, if you could note with item 18, if you could note the um, conflicts of Councillor Cooper and Councillor Newman. And the mover is Councillor Bartley and second, uh, Councillor Collins. And uh, I'll put it on the table for discussion and um, we will let both Councillor Cooper and Newman know when this particular item is finished. Kilda. And Ben, um, Ben, you and Dorothy. Tēnā kōrua. Kia ora, councillor, um, and kia ora, members and councillors. So I've got Dorothy Guthrie with me, who's been leading this piece of work, and will make some brief introductory comments. Uh, and then I will hand it back to you, Mr Chair. We're happy to answer any questions. Kā pai. Kia ora, Chair, councillors, and mātua, tēnā kōtou katoa, talofa lava malo lele. Katanoa te kumiti mona pare, mena mai toi, mete hapore, mena kaupapa, whakae kia mai tai te whakaiti e te kino kahua e te waipero. We are seeking the committee approve the Council Fano Statement of Commitment on Alcohol Harm Minimization, kia mai tai te whakaiti te kino kahua e te waipero. 
In May 2021, the committee agreed to implement changes and refresh the 2016 Auckland Council Fano internal strategy to minimize alcohol-related harm. The refresh included developing a statement of commitment, a revised framework, a coordination plan, a refreshed implementation approach, and a monitoring and evaluation framework. Kia mai tai te whakaiti i te kino kahua i te waipero expresses the Council Fano collective commitment to work together to minimize the harm from alcohol and builds on our existing strength of an established program of work, coordination, and collaboration. The statement of commitment guides Council Fano staff towards our vision for a safe, vibrant, healthy Tamaki Makoro, Auckland free from alcohol related harm, and provides us with an improved frame of reference for holistic well being under a Te Māori lens. The scope is focused on and limited to collective internal Council Fana action and activity to strengthen existing levers and expand connections and collaboration with teams in relevant CCOs and with our sector partners. Council Fana do not hold all the levers or resources necessary to achieve our vision. The impact of our contribution is constrained by the legislative framework and financial resources and requires us to maximize our contribution by working together across Council Fano with the sector and community. Our revised implementation and evaluation approach allows us to adapt to internal and external context changes and new evidence over the Kaupapa life cycle. If the committee approve Kia Mai Tai Te Whakaiti e Te Kino Kahua e Te Waipiro, Social Wellbeing Policy staff will continue to facilitate and monitor implementation in line with the included evaluation framework and update the relevant committee on progress in mid-2023. Kia ora koutou katoa, patai mai. Tēnā koe, Dorothy ngā mihi ki a koe mō te kōrero, te reo, ka pai tera. So, just um, opening it up for any part time. Yes, but can't push the button fast enough. Uh, Kapai. Part time. The dog, the dog wants to have a quarter or two. Um, thank you. Mihana Kia, Kia Kwe, Kawe Maya, not the quarter or me. Um, I just wanted to ask. How does the local alcohol policy, if it, ever, if it actually ha- ever actually happens, how does that fit into this co-power? Kia ora, councillor. So, uh, sorry, member, apologies. Uh, so, as um, we've, uh, there's been a lot of uh, attention on this. So, at the moment, that is with the Supreme Court. So, uh, it's been a, a long and drawn out process, and we would like to um, to be able to implement that. Unfortunately, there are some steps in the uh, that we need to take before we can do that. So, if we, if and hopefully when we reach a position of having a local alcohol policy in place, uh, it will be part of this piece of work to support the implementation of that. But at the moment, we're we're not there. And because um, some of the key decisions uh, around being able to implement that are uh, outside of our control, uh, we don't really entirely have confidence about the exact timing either. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I think what I'm asking is, is, is there flexibility within this COPAP uh, to incorporate what may come out of the Supreme? Where's it going to? Supreme? Yeah. Or P- I don't know. Yeah. Don't know Kia, ora. It is now. Kia ora, Matua. Um, yeah. Yes, there, there, if there was an operative um, LAP, this would be implemented under the regulatory work stream, um, and there's an action for that. Thank you. Kapai uh, there's, there's no further part, so I'm going to open it up for any whakaro. Um, Looks like there's no Fakado as well. Councillor Bartley, do you wish to exercise your right to close 
uh, the debate. I know just to thank officers for their ongoing uh, work on this, something extremely important to um, to our community. So just a note of thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bartley. Look, I just got, just as you started to speak, um, Matua Kake, I know this is out of order, but Matua Kake, did you have any whakaro, I'm assuming? Yeah, just, uh, yeah, thank you. Sorry, when I, my typing isn't as fast as it used to be, so uh, if you're going to allow a long three seconds, then you, can you do it, brother, that would be appreciated. <laughs> um, uh, hey, look, uh, just just uh, continue, just want to acknowledge the staff, continue the work with the Māori, uh, Independent Māori Statutory Board officers in terms of addressing this and recognition of the Y2624 claim that's, that you've stated, uh, I think it's paragraph 39 in your report, uh, and the significance of that, you know, the harm that we see every day out on the streets is, is significant as a result of uh, alcohol, so, you know, family abuse and all that uh, stuff. Eh? But so um, just just uh, just encourage the staff to continue to work with the state board, independent Māori state board staff in terms of coming with uh, resolutions. And, and they follow Dave Ratu as well from Ngati Te Ata, out wa Waiku Ways. He's, he's a legend in this space. So uh, I, th I think, you know, it's not an easy one to tackle, can get politically... Um, uh, huge, but um, I think uh, you know just to address the inequities, to continue that that work with uh, our step board would be appreciated. Thank you. Kapai um, matua. So the motions on the table. I put the uh, recommendation. All those in favour? Aye. 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 Against. Carried. Item 19, investigation of Papatua to a community provision. Councillor Collins is the mover and I will second um, this particular item. So uh, we've got Katie and Korol. So uh, welcome, ladies, and you can introduce any other members of your team. Uh, kia ora, cool. Chair. Thank you for that. Uh, I'm Carol Conner, Senior Policy Manager com for Committee Investment, and Katie today will do the introduction. Thank you, Carol. Um, kia ora koutou katoa. Uh, the report in front of you presents the findings of investigation for Papatoitoi community facility provision. This is a desktop research that looked at the gaps and duplications against the provision guidelines in the community facilities network plan. Staff recommends the committee to endorse with the key move, which is to investigate opportunities to optimize the community facilities portfolio and to provide an integrated facility that provides library and arts, arts and culture spaces as well as deliver additional community services space in Papatoitoi. The Ōtara Papatoitoi Local Board endorsed a key move and the next step is for the regional service planning investment and partnership team to progress with the key move and the findings from that will inform the Unlock or Papatoitoi Work Programme led by Ekipanuku. Thank you Chair, happy to answer any questions. Kapai tēnā kōrua ladies. Um, so I just, um, any pātai? Matua Wilcox, I'm assuming with the finger up, the thumb. <laughs> Sorry. But I know Tony, I'm getting getting bad at finding the right button. Um, look, this might be out of the, the scope of this, but um, I remember a previous mayor, and I think this goes back to Monaco City days. What's happened with the – did we include the, the railway station, the old railway station in this, in this kaupapa? Thank you for the question. Um, through the chair, that is outside uh, the scope of the study area. So just the Papatotoi subdivision. Okay, then. thank you. Kapai, if there's no more partai, I'll have an elongated three seconds. Any whakaro before Councillor Collins closes if he wishes? No, Councillor Collins, if you wish to close. Just a if short not, comment. Yep. 
Thanks, Chair. Just a short comment. I'm really glad that this is happening. The local board are fully supportive of this. There's, this is a growth area. Uh, the Eke Panuku team will know that that local board in particular would uh, li like to have everything as part of that area as transformed. But this is really good for them. They're uh, uh, very uh, supportive of this move and look forward to the developments uh, once we get these key moves um, consulted on and, and looked at carefully. So thanks heaps to everyone that's been involved with the work. And I think this is going to be really progressive for that part of Papatoetoe. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Collins. It's been moved and seconded. I will put the recommendation. All those in favour? Aye. 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 Against? Carried. Item 20. I just want to let uh, our committee know that item 20, um, over the break and during the meeting, I've had a discussion with our staff around this. And there are two recommendations, and they're going to be Chair's recommendations moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Casey. Um, Maya, if you have those two, please, in regards to item 20, I can then at least explain to the committee what we're looking at. Um, thank you, Maya. So as a result, and, and listening to um, the local boards that, that presented, but also um, listening and, and taking advice from staff, as we always do. Um, there's uh, Chair's recommendations that have been moved and seconded, and it's um, to defer the consideration of the findings of the Auckland Council's Millwater and Silver Day community provision. Um, I'll read it from my emails. Um, in provision Investigation 2021. Um, Maya, if you could move. Oh, yeah. And the second one is request staff conduct primary research to refine the stock take of courts and aquatic facilities that the Millwater and Silverdale community has access to and to de develop a gap analysis against the provision guidelines in the Community Facilities Network plan. The reason this has happened is because it allows our staff now to do the work and get the update information in regards to, to uh, Millwater and Silverdale. We, we heard the discussion in Pathai and um, everything else we had um, during the local board input. So working with our staff, this has come up and um, it's like, like I said, it's been put in here uh, for discussion. So um, I've got uh, Councillor uh, is there anything that you wish to say? I can just go straight to Partai um, in regards to this. Okay, we'll go straight to Partai. So, look, um, I've got Councillor Newman first and then um, Councillor Cooper. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Chair. Um, Kataraina, um, good afternoon. Uh, the initial, the, the report as it's, it's, it's set out at the moment effectively represents a desktop study. Um, are you resourced to actually go and do some field research? There needs to be some um, some work done in the field up up there, as well as some conversations that go much wider than a uh, a desktop study. So, um, the the comments I got this morning tended to lead to the conclusion that the staff just didn't have the resourcing to be able to do the work that was required. I'm not sure if it is a resourcing issue. But um, does this revised uh, research that is proposed uh, provide for the things that I think um, are missing from the research as it's currently informing the item on the agenda? Uh, through the Chair, Kia ora, Councillor Newman, thank you for your question. So yes, it is, it is a desktop research, and so we have acknowledged that there are data limitations and assumptions based on the age of some of the, the desktop uh, research that we've undertaken. So generally, this is the methodology um, undertaken for all of these community provision investigations. The item before, item 19, with Papatoitoi followed the same methodology as did the previous Pairata Pukekohe, uh, the Northwest provision. So the initial look for gaps tends to try and use resources efficiently and use desktop research 
to identify whether there is a gap and therefore we do much more of the primary research after that. However, in this case, if we don't do additional primary research, then we only have the existing desktop uh, information available. We will have to go through that desktop research and look at what parts we can update, how much that will cost and how long it will take. Um, some work is underway in terms of aquatic more broadly. So it's it's not just, it's a, about the level of effort for investigations as a methodology that we apply consistently across all of these. So in order to get to a decision, we're going to have to have a look and do some more primary research, which, which will be different than the normal methodology. OK, look, I think that, yeah, look, I think that the, um, yeah, we could talk about the wider methodology that's applied elsewhere, but in relation to this, um, I mean, your researchers have, will, will have the ability to, to have conversations um, beyond the desktop, though, won't they? I mean, the teams and, and the, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. There, there are people that are only a phone call away and that, that will be, that will be part of the methodology revised yes. moving forward for this. You said okay, we'll be All right, thank you. We will pick up a phone. Kapai Patai Matua Wilcox. Thank you, Chair. Um, looking at the maps and whatnot, and this is a side question, but I don't know where Millwater is, but I do know where Wainui is. Um, I've not heard in the New Zealand Gazette or in the New Zealand Geographic um, board a place called Millwater, but I have heard of a place called Wainui. So I'm happy for it to be the investigation of Wainui brackets Millwater in Silverdale Community Provision, but I'm not happy for us to use a name that's just presented and that and the and because we're giving mana to a name that that actually has no mana. And so I, at every council meeting that I've been on and workshop, I have said, I have stated, there is no place called Millwater. There's maybe a location that there is no place called Millwater. The place is called Wainui, and it's known, to, known locally as Millwater, and it can be in brackets, but the place we're talking about is Wainui. Thank you, Chief. Uh, member Wilcox, we will correct that. Apologies. Oh, bye. Councillor Cooper. Thank you. It was a question, but it was answered around the resourcing. Um, so I'd like to um, just have a comment instead, but I'll wait my turn. Oh, bye. Councillor Watson. Just following up a little bit on the, you know, the picking up the phone theme, just checking, um, given, um, given the prominence, the uh, the ro potential role that uh, the local schools might have in any provision that, that was certainly apparent in the report. Um, I, th I think it'd be useful than, than the, even just, you know, a verbal conversations if, if that was actually, um, you know, committed to some sort of written form sc schools. Um, ability to to cater for their own communities far less the public communities often differ from year to year depending on role um, roles depending on numbers of teams and, and whatnot and and the general trend in this area is for roles to you know to be going through the roof so I think um, five years on or whatever it is since you know this this may have happened previously um, it'd probably be useful to to um, <clears throat> capture that in a, in a more cohesive and focused manner than perhaps even a conversation because if it is going to be a, a central central tenant of provision then it'll be useful if it's uh, recorded not just as accurate at the moment but but also going forward because the schools do project these things out so if that can be accommodated that that'll be a, a wealth of addition to the research I think thank you Kia ora. Councillor Watson, yes, we can make sure we're really clear in future reports around some of the assumptions made 
about the information we have at the time of reporting the investigation and some of the future constraints on how that may change quite quickly. Kia ora Katarana, thank you. Uh, Pātai, Councillor Hills, and then we'll move into Whakaro comments after that. Kia Chair, and thank you, staff. I guess uh, my question I sort of paced to the chairs earlier when they spoke from the local boards. Um, my, uh, I guess, concern or question would be, can this be used in our future um, discussions around uh, future urban zoning and things like that? It seems, it feels uh, like we could be making similar mistakes we've made with other areas and the lack of provision we do have um, in, you know, say the West Auckland pool situation. So I guess my question is, um, how are we using this information of the lack, future lack of provision when uh, we have a lot of subdivisions and extra um, populations growing that we don't clearly have the ability to fund um, the facilities that people expect quickly? Kia ora, Councillor Hill. Oh, this is a very big question. So I suppose the answer to the wider question around affordability of the Community Facilities Network Plan Provision Guidelines. So it's actually that piece of policy where we need to look at what are the provision guidelines we've got in there currently and what is the affordability of those. Because that question has become so pressing recently, um, staff are looking at work to see if that Community Facilities Network Plan is fit for purpose. And we had planned after the election to bring back a scope to the relevant committee to look at reviewing because that some of the core issue sits with can we afford the provision guidelines that are currently in there? And that's a really hard question to answer. And so we will bring that back for you to look at and tell us whether you want to look at that. In terms of these kind of provision guidelines, they are normally based on, you know, fulls. So the future urban land strategy, they're based on, we identify areas which have already been developed, not just agreed for development. So because this is enhancing infrastructure, not enabling, it's about looking at, for example, Wainui slash Millwater and saying, we know there was growth there. We expected this number of people to be there. Let us check how many people are there and what facilities we've got and how does that fit against the current guidelines. So they're meant to be an indicator for quickly have a look, see whether we need to do more work or to identify when we need to have another look to see if we need to um, have an, this enhancing infrastructure. So these the investigations are meant to be at that quite high strategic level where you're just trying to get a feel for where is growth relevant to current services. They're an indicator of do we need to do more work? And uh, thank you very much for that comprehensive answer. Is this also being able to go into uh, policy discussions around development contributions and those sorts of things to try and ramp up uh, this situation where we get tied into decades uh, without provision because we haven't backed up the funding at the other end? So, and that's one of the things when we bring back our discussion about what scope you'd like to look at for the review of the Community Facilities Network Plan, because um, it is the network plan that provides the guidelines to enable us to understand what we can do, what we've said we'll do and how that costs. But there are also ways to improve the network plan so it works better with DCs. And, and the legal requirements for DCs and making sure our policy is really robust if we get challenged around development contributions. So that will be one of the things I think we need to look at. Kia ora, thank you very much. Yeah. Kia ora, Councillor. Kapai. There's no more part time, so I'm going to go to uh, our comments for Kado, and that's Councillor Dalton, then Cooper. Kia ora, Chair. Um, I think Katarina sort of addressed a little bit of what I was going to say too, but these these reports are really important because they they affect decision making both for local boards and for the governing body. And I looked at the Papatoi report 
And the methodology was the same, but the, the I guess a benefit Papatoitoi had was that it is it does have ikipanuku alongside, and that's a significant difference because they are helping to deliver community outcomes and community facilities, and they will continue to do that. But I listened to Victoria this morning and and in her passion around her presentation, and I completely got it because there's, there's been $2.5 million in the Manurewala, well, actually in the LTP for 10 years now, and the board has funded different reports. And, and sometimes I feel like I'm not even reading about my own community. And that money still sits there and we still wait for a community facility because we await for reports and there's, there's assumptions on provision. I get concerned about assumptions on provision, particularly when it comes to facilities that are owned by schools because we've been trying to really create those relationships for many years now. We can't rely on the assumption that we're going to be able to use these other facilities just because they form part of a stock take in a report that is presented that does impact on decision makers. It's inequitable, it's unfair and that's why in this case I'm, I'm really pleased that it is going back out to be had another look at. Um, the local board may have to fund that resource if they have it in their LDI. And it, that's what local boards do. They fund these reports to make sure that they do get a, a decent report to just, just about justify what they know about their own community. Because sometimes, as I just said, these reports coming back are quite foreign to what you actually know about your community and the facilities. So I just think that we need to be, and you know, just the comment around um, we're going to have a look and see if the, the I think it was the network facilities policy that Katarana was talking about to see if it's fit for purpose. It concerns me that we adjust a policy to adjust to a budget because we get taken further and further away from what we do as a council and we, we just end up on this different different tangent in terms, in this case, community provision of facilities because we continue to change a policy because the budget doesn't fit it. Let's have a look at the budget and let's have a look about what we're actually here to do as a council and decide what those priorities are. So I think that the local boards were quite justified in bringing this back today for the reasons that they've given. Um, I hope that that scope gets widened into the fuller future urban area so that it is projecting for that larger population that was cut, that could possibly come through potential plane cha changes, but that it gets looked at thoroughly. So um, thank you, Chair, for the recommendations, and I hope that um, we get to see it again and we see what the changes might be for the future for this community provision report. Kia ora. Kapai, um, and it will come back to us. Um, Councillor Moore Holland, I just want to let you know that the part I for our staff has finished. Um, we're into Fakaro now, and I've got Councillor Cooper, then Matua Tony, then Councillor Watson, Kilda. Um, Thank you. Councillor Moore Holland, is there anywhere you can um, either get hold of the staff? Sorry, Councillor Cooper. Oh no, sorry, I'll form it in a comment then. Happy to do that, Chair. I, I have been listening and it's just what I've heard makes me want to raise more questions. So I'll put it in a comment if that's all right. Kapai. Councillor Cooper, sorry. It's okay. Um, yeah, I, so I, I don't know whether I can actually support these recommendations, Mr Chair, and I know that you've changed them to kind of meet the call of the local board, two local boards. Um, you know, we went through a process talking about how we were going to deliver community facilities in a different way. And I've just heard people saying, no, we can't assume that, we can't do that. But we actually put that through consultation and we said, we're going to try and deliver community facilities a different way. And this is what the staff were suggesting in the report. And as Katarina said, it's high level. We haven't got down to the detail. Um, and... The actual approach to these have been consistent right across different local boards and no one raised it an inkling, but you get some some local boards will do this and they're often the ones that have a lot already that have got a good radius where they can get to places, you know, and I, I, 
I'm I feel um, really feel for the staff actually because they've in good faith used the same process, um, and you know provided that high level detail, you know, and I know I know as an elected member that sometimes my view of something when it's deeply analysed and here's look at the actual facts quite different from sometimes anecdotal. So I think there's a place for both. Um, but I feel like this has just been rejected out of hand because the answer wasn't what people wanted to hear. And that's what concerns me. Um, because now we're going to have to go back to all the others. Oh, I don't like what was in that, but we didn't say anything. You know, we've actually, I'm repeating it, but we actually said we we're going to try and deliver things in a different way. And here was a report that said, look, here's some other possibilities. And we're basically saying no. And people have already decided, oh, that pool's not OK, that pool's not OK. That's not for us to do. Um, so I want to support you, Mr Chair. It looks like it'll go through anyway. Um, but I'm really disappointed that we we adopted a way of approach and now we don't like it. So we go, oh, no, we change our mind. So that that's what – and I'm sure I'll get um, a backlash from the next speakers, but that's OK. I just need to say my piece. Thank you. Kia ora, Councillor Cooper. I hope you don't get a backlash. Um, but look, yeah, so look for, for me, and, and, and I will close it after Councillor Newman at this stage. So Matua Kake, then Councillor Watson, and then Mole Holland, then Newman. Yeah, kia ora. And uh, yeah, Councillor uh, Cooper, uh, not at all a back, um, any backlash from me. Uh, I, I think your point is really valid. Uh, but I think it's also an opportunity because there's such a conflict or or difference uh, in the outcome. It, it is work. It is worth. And as you say, we're high level. Going down to the next level is 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 obviously the next stage, and and to come to some kind of agreement or conclusion. So I think I think um, you know not that I'm, I like sitting on the fence either, but I, I do agree. You know, with with Councillor Cooper's view and also Hills and Dalton. You know they. They both put up, um, you know, um, good arguments for this, and but I, so I, I support I support you all. Uh, I guess my only comment is as the opportunity to go back and do a bit more uh, more than a, just the desktop uh, coverage of this is, is that opportunity. I know it's only 5.4 percent Māori in the area, but it's still worth um, um, engagement in ensuring that we've got the right cultural. Uh, po and cultural significance in in the in the area that reflects the history, even though it might be smaller numbers, it's still uh, significant in terms of getting getting that uh, history understood and and there. And I think uh, you know I, I don't support the recommendations, Mr. Chair, because you've got no water there still. And and was it was it Wainui or was it Tainui, Glen? Kia ora. Kapai. Uh, Councillor Watson, then Mon Holland, then Newman, and I'll close. Yeah, thanks, uh, Mr. Chair, and um, I think you you have made the right uh, call here to 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 defer this and and to, to see if we can come back with some uh, more up to date information that is relevant to the investigation. I mean, surely if you're going to make decisions with respect of any area, uh, not least of which of fast growing areas, then you want to be as accurate as you can in the information you've got. And, and I do have a bit of sympathy for the officers here, just with the sheer scale of what's occurring in this part of um, of the Albany ward. You, you know, there's the, there's the Hibiscus Coast, which most people are probably, you know, familiar with in one way or another. But basically what, what we've got almost unfolding before our eyes is another inland Hibiscus Coast of Milldale and Millwater, where you know one's got about 10,000 10, people and already probably 80% developed, the other one's on the way to 15,000 more, again f developing incredibly fast. So the scale of the development and the community provision that will be required to you know to cater for it is is quite um, is quite daunting. And um, if you do go around and look at um, community facilities, yes, you know, there's there's some lovely community facilities there that we are very grateful to have, um, numbers of which I might add um, provided by legacy councils going back to the 1980s. Uh, we've certainly benefited from um, Auckland Council's intervention in terms of, um, you know, sports field developments in this area and, um, you know, the 
the, the local community are very pleased with that. But there are other areas, and this goes to the accuracy of information, where um, you know the community facilities are just in, in in dire need. So you know the library was mentioned in the report today. The the, the massive population that is serving now um, is just really beyond the pale. It is totally inadequate, um, and it, it, it <clears throat> there is some substantive intervention required there just, just to code, cater with the sheer numbers. So I, I would say, Mr Chair, that um, that uh, an investigation that just has a, um, a little bit more rigour to it, that, that in particular uh, um, quantifies the potential contribution of schools because that's often not just in this area but across Auckland that's kind of thrown into these assessments the notion oh well you know we can work with the schools or leverage the schools um, really that's not really that viable in, in most parts of Auckland far less here numbers of the schools are gated you can't actually even get into them okay in a, all over north of the bridge you know my old schools they're all gated they put in half million dollar million dollar fences the community can't get anywhere near them the schools roles are very high which means the call on those facilities as such as indoor courts is very very high when my children were going to the schools in this area they were having to go to their practices at seven o'clock in the morning because there's no time available after that so in reality the notion that yes a school has its gym and a couple of basketball courts that somehow that'll be open to the public is very very hopeful uh not to say not least of which in areas where you have uh you know big increases to the school roles so I, I welcome in particular the revisiting on the information on the potential contribution of schools because i'm i'm pretty certain that, that will be negligible if not nil given the demand that's made from within you know their own their own communities so good on you um councillor al for for intervening in this manner um i think it'll be a a more robust outcome and it'll be one therefore that you know any future decisions will be able to be made on the basis of up-to-date information in an area that is transforming at a phenomenal rate thank you Thank you, Councillor Watson. I'll go to Councillor Mahalo Newman and then I'll close the debate. Gilda. Kia ora, Chair. I'm just going to um, firstly acknowledge you for um, listening to everyone because that's what our job is to do and for proposing the changes. I do support them. Um, this is not a pushback or anything like that. I, I also agree with the principles that uh, Councillor Cooper talked about, but I believe more in democracy and listening to the people whom we um, work for. Given my love of data, and I've just finished a study of 50 businesses in my area, um, hearing their views and opinions on where to from here on some other matters, I like to base things on evidence. So I want to support the notion that we enable the staff to have current data, because I know they want to do the best they can for us, for our people. There is no doubt in my mind, and I've had that experience, as we know, as being a staff member, Monaco and Waitakere, and if you don't have current data, like I've just had recently for my business community, you, you know, it makes it so hard to just depend on old or existing, and it doesn't give um, a true vision for where we're at. So therein lies probably some of the difficulties, Chair. And I just want to acknowledge that travelling in and out of Auckland sometimes as you do, and it, um, it's been widely shared now that, you know, I've got a little property up on the Kaipara and I, when I drive um, out of Auckland to go there some weekends, I look and I go, whoa, <laughs> that is a lot of growth. And then of course I go down to the Waikato where I've got property as well and the same thing. This is such a high demand chair on our staff and our people and our resources. So I suppose therein lies the fact that I am elected to make fair, reasonable and democratic decisions because I would otherwise colour the budgets and um, I would say put it into this sort of data so that we um, enable the executive leadership team 
and their staff then to give us um, reports that do help our decision making um, and it is good governance practices. But I, so I can see all of those lines there. I just wanted to share those views and, I, and that's what I was going to say. Why don't we look at some other budget lines and go, actually, <laughs> We need to make those changes so that we can enable our staff and our people to do the job they want to do for the best of our community. And, and we are growing. So, you know, I get the whole budget thing and there is pushback on me too for issues around my views and opinions. But I believe the good thing is we are in a democracy and we've got to treat each other with that dignity and respect. So we have to look after our people and the staff and be able to have um, current data because they're asking us, or we're being asked to make decisions based on information that does need um, a little bit of a review. And that's why I will actually support these changes. So thank you, Chair, for your foresight and open-mindedness. Kia ora. Thank you, Councillor Mulholland. I'll go to uh, Councillor Newman. Oh, look, thank you, Chair. Look, and I accept that um, we, the Royal We, the Council decided um, that it wanted to support a different way. Yeah, I didn't support that myself um, because I've always felt that um, it was always going to be necessary for Council to be active, proactive in, in investing in, in capital assets. And the problem here is that... Um, you know, the, the issue is that the assumption um, is that what we're doing is a high level analysis. Um, that's not quite where I want to be. Even even at this early stage, I want to be I want to be in a better space with with a line of sight to better research than than a, than a high level desktop analysis. Um, because the reality is that. This report would almost certainly form the basis of well, what would we look at if we're framing this future investment, for example, a contributions policy. Um, you know, and I'm really concerned about that because, um, you know, I, I know firsthand the sort of gaps that exist, you know, in, in my ward because of decisions taken previously around uh, zoning and consenting and, and future. I mean, my predecessor was was famous for just wanting to get on with it, get on with rezoning. But actually, you've still got to deliver the facilities to ensure that that community is a success. And the problem, Chair, is that I think that these high this high level analysis, which isn't based on good information, it forms the basis of information that flows into future policies such as a contributions policy. And the council does have a disincentive uh, to, to flag new assets which are going to be paid for in part by DCs because, of course, the council doesn't want to fund its share of the new infrastructure because really we don't want to do that sort of stuff anymore. We'd sooner lease stuff out. So for me, I'm I'm very nervous about about um, the direction of this sort of research at a high level, um, and if it is an issue of funding for the resources for the social scientists within the council to conduct um, rich research beyond the desktop, then if if the resourcing of that research is a problem, then tell. Tell us what that what what it is that that is a gap, and how much is it going to cost to fund it, so that we do have the social scientists with the facilities available to do that work. Um, you know, John Watson is right. Um, you know, pools that are privately owned are not the grist of for information to be flagged and highlighted in council stock take reports. Um, you know that that that's just not something that we should be referencing because if you if you don't necessarily have access to it because we don't own it, then don't hint at that because it becomes, in my view, an alibi for council to not commit. We have to be able to, you know, be candid and say, um, actually, there just isn't the infrastructure there, um, and therefore that is the gap. Um, have to either look at what the community expects in terms of uh, what can be delivered um, and say to the community, well, actually, the gap is there and we're not going to deliver it, or we have to figure out a way to deliver it, 
which may mean that we have to uh, fund a greater level of investment in the future and be more um, ambitious with respect to how much we're going to require from contributions from developers for those rapidly, rapidly, rapidly expanding areas of, of Auckland, which are, which are growing, um, you know, including around Silverdale, Wainui. Um, so th thank you, Chair, for taking the uh, taking on uh, the feedback that you got this morning. But I would like to think that the senior managers within council can advise council as to what it's going to cost to resource this work uh, to a standard that I think is reasonable um, so that we don't face the feedback that we got this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Newman. Um, to close the debate, Katarana, I just want to acknowledge you and Koro um, for the work that was done, but also um, when I contacted you during uh, this particular meeting in regards to what we heard at the local board input, I want to say thank you to you um, for allowing me to, to put this recommendation in because it is a compromise, but it's also a compromise in, in regards to the mythology that we use and it allows us, hence the um, um, B in the recommendation, hence it allows the staff now to get into primary research. Now, all the councillors who have spoken, I respect all your views and say thank you. And I, I just really wanted to, to sort of support what has been said across everybody, which is it allows us now to, to, to get that data that, that we really do need, but it, more importantly, what our staff need. So to you, Katarana, to Korol and the team, thank you so much. Um, I um, That's the reason, Katarana, I rang you to see a way forward. I also rang um, the chairs and left a message with both chairs, but spoke to one of the chairs that presented, spoke to also uh, Victoria, spoke to them. I spoke to Councillor Watson and my apologies for calling so late after I'd spoken to the respective uh, local board chairs and, and members, but just, just wanted to acknowledge their input in regards to this and a way forward. So look, um, that, that's it from me. I just want to acknowledge our staff in particular, not only for the report that we ended up discussing at our preprint, but also our pre-agenda. Um, but uh, getting this way forward is, is, is a win-win for us. So I'm going to put the recommendation. All those in favour? Aye. 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 Against. Against, uh, Mr Chair, just on the basis that okay. we got the wrong name there. Kapai, kapai. I, I, so I got uh, Matua Kaki. Any other um, uh, members uh, committee yeah, against? Yeah, okay. Ah, yeah. Kia ora, uh, Matua Wilcox. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, kapai tera. So look, um, um, that's been moved um, and with, it's been put. So thank you so much, everybody. Um, next item 21, I'll move and Councillor Casey will uh, second the, sub the, the officer's recommendations and it's now put on um, the, the papers for discussion. And I'm going to ask um, for Korol, I think it's you, and um, I think Sarah. So I'll in, in, in invite yourself and, and Sarah to, to open up the discussion, item 21. Kilda. Aroha mai, uh, Mr. Chair. Can I raise a point of order? Kapai. Uh, you know, just in terms of the previous item and the naming uh, of, of Wainui, that, that is a tonga, the name is a tonga to, to, to us. I think yeah, that's a breach of, of, uh, of Article 2. So I just want to want to note that that uh, it should have been rectified at the time. All right, and and so my point of order is in giving the the name um, Wainui as opposed to Muwara. I know it's going back to the previous item, but that's why it's a point of order. And this is the the mana that 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 uh, place has, and it's just like that noted, please. Now, Kapai Mai, can we get that noted? And I know that uh, Matu Wilcox also. Um, mentioned that and um, was taken on board by Kataraina. Now, kapai tera, matua. So, Korol, um, all yours. Thank you, Chair. 
So this item presents the finding of a staff assessment of the merit of uh, designating Chelsea Sorry? and surrounding yeah, reserve. Right. As uh, a couple of bits, no, uh, uh, oh yeah, no, it's off now. All yours, Coral. All right. So uh, it's a staff uh, assessment of uh, designating Chelsea and surrounding reserves as a regional park uh, at the request of uh, the Kaipatiki local board. So you would have heard this morning. Um, both uh, the chair of the local board and member Kendrick, um, their vision for um, those reserves and uh, their views of uh, the values that those reserves bring as regional parks. So um, we have uh, assessed a proposal against three criteria uh, and uh, our conclusion are in the report. Uh, overall, we found that uh, the parks have some values of original parks, but not all of them. That uh, changing the designation to original park may not um, um, work out to solve the maintenance issues that the local board has raised. And that in terms of uh, local government allocate, uh, decision allocation, the decision is best allocated to the local board. So those are our conclusions and our recommendation is a status quo. Happy to answer any question. Kilda, um, any part I, but I think Councillor Watson, you may have an amendment and I've, I've had a look at it and, and Councillor Watson, um, I my, my belief is, and, and I stand corrected, but I'll wait for um, uh, Maya to let us know that it's a direct negative to the um, recommendations that are here now, because the recommendations are saying that it not be um, uh, a regional park. And um, depending on how that uh, goes when it is put, we can then um, have a look at at, at, at any um, uh, replacement as a result. So I'm going to end up going and just, to... Just, Mr Chair, just, yes, I, I agree with your interpretation there. So yes, Councillor Watson. Yeah, so I've, um, I will therefore foreshadow that okay. motion uh, in light of this, um, this motion not being passed, Mr Chair. I think that'll be the correct way to proceed okay. and I'll reserve my right to speak uh, to this at the appropriate time. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Watson, and um, no problems at all. Um, so I got part I, um, Councillor Hills, then Councillor Coombe, and then a Deputy Mayor. Uh, kia ora, and thank you, um, as the local board said, to the staff for the significant amount of work that has gone in here and acknowledging the passions and the advice um, from the community as well. Um, I guess my, my main question is what would... Um, happen if we uh, supported a regional park. So I guess the, the, the concerns the, the board have and the community has around maintenance budget, um, you know, highlighting the park, could some of those be done without or would it? Um, I know you have disagree with the regional park, but how can we, would changing it to a regional park improve those um, things? Thanks for the question, Sue you, Mr. Chair. So the mechanics of making those three reserves a regional park is uh, fairly straightforward. So it's about you know making those um, um, resolutions to to change the decision making and include the parks or reserves uh, in the uh, schedule one of the long term plan. Uh, so that's you know very straightforward. Uh, and in terms of amalgamation, it would be also just uh, changing the name of those three reserves as to one new uh, regional park's name. In terms of what I would mean in terms of the um, level of service for maintenance, uh, the advice that I was given by both uh, my um, regional parks colleagues and local park colleagues is that because uh, it's the same um, contractors, there would not be any difference in level of service unless there was actually a change that is agreed to a different resolution. Okay, thank you. And how come, it, uh, could I just ask for clarification, how come it was considered the park wasn't being used regionally when, as the board says, you could say half the people were not coming from uh, the local area or, or were coming from outside the area already? And as uh, the board mentioned, it 
you know, obviously as an advertiser of the regional park, so those are fairly high numbers already. So um, we didn't have uh, good data regarding uh, visitation to the park, so we conducted uh, a people's panel survey and ask people whether they uh, visited the local park, the, the park, the three reserves in the last year. Uh, and uh, we found that primarily uh, the majority of uh, visitors came from um, the North Shore Ward, uh, so Kaipatiki and Devonport Takapuna. Uh, and uh, quite a number of those visitors also visited uh, exclusively for the cafe. So the, um, okay. the actual draw was not the reserve themselves, but um, the Chelsea Cafe, which is very successful, as you know. Uh, so the other um, uh, consideration when we looked at lo um, local decision making is those reserves are critical to um, the uh, Greenway Connections plan that the Kaipatiki Local Board has developed. OK. If, if it was changed to a regional park, would the um, current decision making come to this committee, if, if all the decision making? Indeed, yes. And what, I guess, are the, you've said why it maybe doesn't reach the threshold, but are there negative implications if it became a regional park? Because I'm not clear on the, you know, why making this regional park would be a terrible thing. Thing or a bad thing? Um, so our advice was, is there any merit to making it uh, a regional park? Uh, and in terms of maintenance, unless you change the levels of services, uh, there's not uh, a, good, uh, a good case for it. But we haven't made a case that it's a terrible decision either. Um, so uh, the first assessment is that the park, the parks, the three reserves, meet some of um, the regional park values, not all of them. So it becomes a, a matter of judgment as to whether that's enough to become a regional park or not. And sorry, Chair, very last question. Um, we've tried when I was on the local board to discuss, uh, and they have come to the party on some things like pest control, that the defence force and what the future provisioners for that land did, were staff able to get much out of uh, defence on what could possibly happen and if there was a change, if this would be stay in public hands um, and become part of the future regional park potentially? So we have not been made aware of any proposal to sell the land uh, and we've not approached uh, the New Zealand Defence Force directly as part of this assessment. Kia ora, thank you. Cut by Councillor Hills. Um, Deputy Mayor Cashman. Well, sorry. Um, Councillor Coon, ladies first. Sorry. Kia ora, Chair. Um, thank you. Um, just have a couple of parti around the process, just more clarification. One is if this has come through the, the, the um, consultation on the regional parks management plan as a proposal. I, I can see from the report that it's had a few steps before that, but it was also submitted in that context. Why are we not working through it as a response to that draft, um, which I would have thought would make us step through this? And even if um, we're not going to consider it as part of the feedback on the draft and when we review all of the feedback. I would have thought that the merits or otherwise of this proposal should really be workshopped um, with us in terms of, you know, the, the pros and cons of, of the proposal and the implications, because I just feel like this coming to us today and we're hearing, you know, strong representations from the local board. That's that's all good. But also, I know how quickly there can be real lots of, you know, big misinformation campaign that we saw with the regional parks management plan um, that can really twist what is actually proposed and what's the reasons behind it. So, I'm kind of chair. I just think it would be really useful to get some clarity around why this is not a different process and why we're receiving this as a report separate to the consideration of the feedback on the draft regional parks management plan. Thank you. Um, through the chair, so Councillor, um, 
The request has not come through the draft uh, regional parks management plan. The request has come directly from the local board. Um, That's not what the Chair Gillan said that it had been submitted in that process. I think the the, um, the board would have had hoped that uh, this could have been discussed as part of the draft uh, regional management park, um, regional parks management plan, sorry, but that's not what has happened. Uh, so we have run a process which is separate from that plan. Uh, and the process that we have run is very similar to the process that was run for um, the designation of Colindale Park last year as a regional asset. All right. Thank you. Um, Chair, I mean, I do feel like there just still needs to be a bit of consideration around the, the process and whether this can be looked at whether there does need to be a step of a workshop, but obviously that is with with you um, because I just feel like there's lots more that I'd like to investigate and ask questions around, but we're not going to be able to do that in this this forum now. And um, particularly around the, the subsidiarity question that was brought up in the, the comments to the local board, um, it's, this is sort of the reverse of what local boards normally ask us. So, you know, I would really like to be able to drill into that more. So a lot of kind of, I think, is a bit of quite a few loose ends to be making this decision at this point, I feel. So with the regional park management plan, it was um, decided when it came to the committee that no other work will be done in regards to new regional parks. So that went through its consultative process. What happened was this particular one, it, it was very similar, but not exactly the same as Colin Dale Park, where the local board ended up coming through the finance and performance. So that's where that process happened here. And this is why Carol had, had mentioned the fact that it was the local board that requested the work to be done. Okay. So that's why it didn't go through our regional park management uh, plan um, at the time. Thanks, Chair. Kapai. Um, Deputy Mayor Cashmore. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm on similar lines to Richard Hill, I think, here in this one. So, again, like, my question is that I don't know if the local board have figured this out yet, but with the responsibility going from a local park to a regional park, the accountability and decision making goes from local to, to regional to a governing body and the budgets that are associated with that park at the local level would also come across. So the local board's budget will be reduced. OK, I just want to make that point very clear. Thank you. Thank you, Katarina. Kapai, look, I've got a part time from Councillor Fletcher that I will ask on her behalf because she had to leave. And, and, and her one is, what is the strategic importance of this particular area as a wildlife corridor? Uh, so it is in the report in the uh, value assessment. Uh, and uh, yes, it's uh, in a significant um, bird flight zone. So it is a, a very uh, important ecological area. Uh, it is also an area with um, very mature carry um, trees. Um, so yes, um, significant um, ecological area um, among other things. Thank you. Um, Carol, if you could get back to Councillor Fletcher with that particular answer as well, but it was important that it was said at this committee at the moment. So uh, bonjour for that. Um, Matua kake. Uh, kia ora, Mr Chair. Um, hey, look, just um, wanting to acknowledge, I think it was said this morning too, um, with the deputation around the historical past site uh, on this particular uh, uh, whenua, and uh, in particular in the Māori uh, impact statements, um, the engagement with iwi uh, and uh, iwi who have got that affiliation to the, to the park, to the whenua. But my question is a, a noted theme from iwi Iwi within the Māori Impact Statement is the need for active protection of, of the te taiao, of the environment. In your, in your view, does the current arrangement ensure active protection? Um, so the, um, maybe that's a question for Sarah. 
just noting that uh, in the last year there's been an uh, increase in uh, maintenance levels. Sarah, are you able to answer, please? I'm sorry, Sarah is not online. Uh, kia ora, Member Kake. I think when we're looking at this, this is about governance decisions. And so it's really about whether under, you know, it would be managed under a regional reserves management plan in terms of looking at a whole range of factors on the site or whether it's managed through a, you know, Kaipataki local board decided plan. So they are the two mechanisms for looking at how the site's protected and how it's managed. And so Māori Iwi were saying to us, actually, some of them have said it's easier to interact with the local board for some of that. So they've, they've got their own views around which part of that is easier to interact with, but it's still the same mechanisms. It's just changing who the decision maker is for those mechanisms. Thank you. Yep, I appreciate that. It, it's just, I guess, at a governance level, making this decision, wherever uh, or wherever this sits comfortably, it's this understanding that they have that same appreciation of that protection. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, whether it's, I don't care whether it's Mickey Mouse, as long as they've got, you know, that same kind of level of protection of our environment. And that, that, that's really the, the key point. Actually, I do mind if it's Mickey Mouse. I think that there were some views that perhaps that's easier to do at a local level. Atua Kaki, I know that Claudia, are you okay, Claudia, in regards to the response, or did you want to say something to, uh, in response to Matua Kaki's part? Uh, so, kia ora, Matua Kaki. Uh, the, um, kia ora, Chair, thank you. So, perhaps uh, just to reinforce the message that the team has given, I also know that our community facilities team, and unfortunately Sarah cannot be on the line at the moment, but they that they are really um, quite looking really closely into the maintenance issues as well. And they have been in liaison with the um, Chelsea Estate Heritage Trust, which is a voluntary group that is taking a very active interest in the park around a number of matters, including potential damage to sites. So they do have a CapEx work program, which is focusing on tracks, furniture, car parks, heritage cottages. And, um, and what we can also just ensure is that that's appropriately also considering some of the other items that you've raised. The, the challenge if we move to a regional park or a local park, the maintenance issues are likely to be the same. And um, and if we do move to a regional park status, yes, there would be a shift in where the funding portfolio would come from. Um, we may also need to consider additional potential operating costs should we bring in summer ranges or other items like that. So I just wanted to make uh, the committee aware through the chair that there are some of the other operational considerations underway, but we are very mindful of the maintenance concerns raised and also the importance of the past site. And I know our teams are looking actively into this. Kia ora. Kia ora. Thank you, Claudia. Um, we'll move on to Councillor Cooper, then Matua Wilcox, and then Councillor Dalton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I've got a couple of questions. One was, um, is it necessary that a special ecological area has to be a regional park or we've we've got other local parks that are significant ecological areas? I mean, I know at least one in my area, Rangahena, is significant ecologically um, for flora and fauna, and it's a local. Through the chair. Thanks, Councillor Cooper, for the question. So, um, with the assessment, again, the values uh, that uh, are typically displayed in regional parks, we're not looking at a single value. We're looking at uh, how many of those values are met. That's why uh, we concluded that uh, our assessment was uh, halfway. Um, so, as you can see in the assessment, the ecological value um, criteria is met. Some other values that you find in regional parks are not necessarily met. Um, so, yes, local parks have also some of those values, but not all of them. Okay. And the other um, 
question was this thing around the defence land next door. Um, where did that idea come from? From the local board or staff? So if I understand well, the, the idea that that would one day become part of the um, the local parks. Sorry, I missed that first part. It went a bit. So, so did the local board suggest that. So there's always been a, a an assumption from the time where um, the North Shore City Council bought the land that one day that uh, New Zealand Defence land uh, could become part of that that park. So there's been, uh, I suppose, an aspiration that one day that could yeah. become okay. uh, part of it. Thanks, but hard to make a decision on an aspiration. Um, yeah, last time we sold an Air Force base, um, another department had to buy it, and it's full of houses just across the harbour. Thank you. Kia ora, thank you, Councillor Cooper. Matua Wilcox and then Councillor Dalton. Um, yes, thank you. Perhaps you can help me here. I'm trying to understand this, uh, this, this, this quarter or that there's more people from out of town than actually from the local board of visiting the place. Um, is Totara Park down there in Monaco, is that in Monaco, is that a regional park? That's not a regional park, is it? Sorry, Region which park? Can, I didn't hear very well. That's Colin Dell park. park. It's it's a regional oh. asset. It, it's it's now a regional asset, Matua. It's not a regional park. That's right. Okay, thank you. Metals Farm, that's another one that's not that's not a regional park, is it? Okay. No. So so that yes, okay. Um, the second point, and I think we've alluded it to already, but the New Zealand Defence Force land, that would be subject to Public Works Act and treaty claim, wouldn't it? Under the under the Tamaki Makoto Collective Settlement Act? Potentially, I'm not sure of the, the details, but I think more uh, to the point is at that stage, there's no indication that uh, the Defence Force is uh, looking to move out. Uh, so uh, there's no yeah. no timeline for uh, a potential okay. acquisition, whatever takes uh, form it takes. So I'm just asking here. I think the main corner rule seems to be deteriorating maintenance standards, and from that.
was one of the um, areas where there were a number of concerns about maintenance. So we put in place some work with my facility managers um, and a relationship with the trust um, and talking to elected members about sorting some of those out. So the, the general grounds maintenance is good now, is up to standard under the contract that we have at the moment. The residential buildings, there's three cottages and a manager's house, were handed over from Panuku in late 2019 in poor condition with um, lack of maintenance and investment in those. So they have caused problems. Um, and we've we've done um, operational maintenance to sort the, those out and they're in the work program to do CapEx works to improve the quality of those as well. There's um, work program items to do furniture and tracks and all lots of stuff like that. So the the maintenance concerns from my point of view are under control, given the, the budget constraints that we're all working under. So in terms of whether a regional park will help improve that, my view is it, it won't because the regional park funding has as many demands on it as the local park funding. Um, and at least as a local park, it has the priority from my staff and from elected members as in the work program it's it's a priority because it's it's a special piece of land one of the one of the biggest problems that are left or two of the biggest problems that are left are the quality of the water in the historic dams which healthy waters are working on and the pest species in the bush and volunteers and the ecological contract and the arborist contract are working through those slowly it's going to take a huge amount of volunteer effort and contractor money to do that, but they are being prioritised, so it's been worked through as best we can. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. And that's answered yeah, look, my previous I... question, Alf. Thank you. Copy. Yeah, Chair, can I just ask one final question? Aye. Right. That's, cool, cool. that's about the lack of management plan for the park. Surely, surely at least North Shore City Council must have had something. Surely there's, there is a management plan for this part somewhere along the line. Thanks to you, Mr. Chair, um, our colleagues in um, uh, regional um, planning investment and partnerships are looking at developing uh, uh, a parks management plan. Uh, which would uh, provide management uh, standard for this uh, parks as, as well as other parks in Cape Atiki. So this is being worked through with a local board and should be finalised by December. Goodbye. Thank you, Chief. OK, then. Um, Councillor Dalton, and then we'll get into Fakaro comments. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just had questions, perhaps from Sarah, um, just around the investment in the park. So is the local board investing their LDI to help maintain that park as well? Sure, through the chair. Um, no, there aren't any LDI projects at the moment, but the the things that need doing tend to be um, you, we can do them through renewals. So there there aren't things that need doing there that aren't already assets, um, but they are investing in LDI opex in um, the community park ranger and the volunteer programs with uh, working with the volunteer groups to do tree planting and pest management and that sort of thing. So there's, there is some focus, but not LDI capex because it's not needed at the moment. So for OPEX and uh, mm. just a follow up chair, because um, just getting back to member Wilcox referred to Totara Park and at one point I wondered if it could become regional because of the same reasons the board was really struggling to maintain the park with the use that it got from people from outside of the area. Um, Claudia made a comment about remembering that if it comes into regional, it might create extra OPEX because we might put in a ranger. I think I heard that right, Claudia. So, but then we're hearing that actually it doesn't matter if it's local or regional, the budgets are the same. Now, I know that that local board knows that their budget will come back to regional, that they will lose any budget they have for that park if it becomes regional. So what are the budgetary implications for it coming to regional? I mean, I'm, I'm understanding that the, it doesn't meet all the criteria and that's why 
where the recommendation is that it stays local, but what would the budgetary constraints be? What implications? Yeah, no. So, okay. Claudia. So, Kilda, through the chair, unless Kahol or um, Katarina have any additions to this, I'll just give this a quick update. So, we don't have the details of that in this specific instance. Uh, we have asked our um, parks team to provide additional information, and if there were additional costs for example, they would likely sit into um, additional car parking management costs, such as uh, because most regional parks have significant car parking, so we would likely need to look into that. We may need to look into additional toilet facilities, summer park ranges. Um, there may be questions regarding the heritage interpretation um, of information. And also, um, there may be a possible ability to currently rent out the four residential properties that are currently under the reserve rules. So there, there can be there can be some further um, costs, but there may also be, as the local board mentioned today, some potential revenue through using those residential homes in a different way. We haven't, I'm afraid, at this stage of the analysis, done a detailed analysis on what those costs may be, and if that. If the committee were to decide today to progress down that way, we would need to do that as a next step. I hope that answers your question. Kia ora. I think it's it's open. It's got more questions for me. Perhaps I agree with Councillor Coombe. <laughs> Thank you. Can I just please clarify in terms of the paper? Those are all future choices. When the decision making delegation changes made, then those are future choices that would require future funding to implement. So the park would come over as that they would come over as they currently are, because we're not trying to foreshadow future choices, because that is the budget and service levels that exist currently. If more is required, then they would need to yeah. look at those budgets relevant to other regional budgets and prioritise or go for unbudgeted expenditure. So just to clarify that, that those are future choices not yet made, so therefore not yet costed. Kia ora katarana. Yeah, okay. Right. Councillor Dalton, I know you're shaking your head. I'm only shaking my head because I think it forms part of my decision making. Yeah. You know, if we move this to regional, then there's a whole other implication. And I is. just feel that I don't have enough information yeah. right at this point in time. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Katarana. Kilda. Um, Councillor Hills, um, you had a question for Sarah now that she's on. And welcome, Sarah. Apologies, Chair. I didn't realise Sarah was here. And just want to say thank you, Sarah, for the work um, and the significant uptick in, in work since um, you've taken over responsibility for the area. I guess my concerns, I know that we've had significant uptick in the tracks and actually the, the work on the healthy water pipes and different things, but on the contractor issues, and I see Chirp has said that Wildlands is doing some significant pest work, but do you feel that there is ongoing work to improve the kind of relationship and uh, and the work between the contractors and the volunteers? Because I know that's been a big sticking point is that there's kind of a lot of people jumping in, jumping out, and then it feels like the volunteer work is kind of not as valued sometimes. I guess that if that could be explained a bit more. Kira, um, through the chair, thank you. Um, yes, so I, I've i done a lot of work getting um, Wildlands together with the Chirpa team, the trust team, um, and, and and actually we we need to, we're talking to each other and, and where are the trusts next bits of work that they want to do and how can bits of my budget and bits of the the wildlands contract work within the constraints that we we've, we've got within those contracts how can we make that work best for what the trust sees as the best way to um manage some of the pest problems in there um and then we've also got them the million trees project which i was involved in and, and i have been sponsoring part of this one is we we um suggesting that they can use some of those trees after the volunteers and wildlands have done some pest management work to then start the next lot of native planting in those areas that are being worked on. And there's there was one example, there's a, an area down on Colonial Road 
on the right hand side as you go in which has been covered in orange mesh for about two years because the yes. volunteers were in there and they cleared the wattles the and then discovered the landfill that was yep. um ex chelsea so, sugar yeah. stuff um so we've i finally got closed landfill to actually go in and test it and they've added it to their system um, and now the volunteers are back in there and they're allowed to continue clearing and we've got some million trees planting for them to go in so Dan the, the the ranger is is working with them so we're working as a group now rather than I can't deal with that bit of the problem it's someone else's problem off you go and do that so it, it's much more holistic how do we solve this with with the constraints that we all have at the moment so my view is that relationship with those volunteers is a lot better okay. with our contractors because we're spending a lot of time and effort to help make those relationships work because those volunteers are so important in that part we can't do everything that needs to be done within the OPEX budgets that we have and the contracts that we have. So we need to harness those volunteers. Kia ora, Sarah, and thank you again. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Councillor Hills. Um, there's no further part I on that. And Councillor Fletcher, I saw you log on earlier and just wanted to let you know that your question was asked of Sarah, hence her uh, response in the chat bar for you. <clears throat> so look, I'm going to go through to uh, Fakado, any comments? And the first is Councillor Watson, um, followed by Deputy Mayor Cashmore. Kilda, Councillor Watson. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess the four first point I'd make is that this uh, notion of a regional park in this location, it, it's not new. It's It's been around since the 1990s with the Chelsea Regional Park Association. And over those years, it's garnered some support some, from pretty... Um, high level and high caliber individuals um, such as Dame Kath Tizard, Sir Paul Reeves, Professor John Morton, Stephen Tyndall, Jim Holdaway and a number of others who have really uh, endorsed the notion that has been picked up by the Kaipataki Local Board. If we uh, flash forward now to you know uh, 2022, we've just received a um, presentation from Sir Peter Gluckman, Reimagining Auckland, Koi Tu, and one of the prime movers that uh, Sir Peter and his researchers have advocated is for Auckland as an indigenously inspired national park city. And what have we here before us today? We have a notion of a, of a national park, a, a, a regional park in this instance, uh, almost not quite in the heart of Auckland, but just a stone's throw across the bridge. Um, I felt the local board today did a very compelling job of presenting the case of why uh, this should be a regional park. So much of the commentary I've heard um, in the last little while has kind of revolved around the notion of, the, of just the Chelsea Estate Heritage Park. But I, I remind you that the local board was proposing an amalgamation with the Carry Point Centennial Park and the quite extensive Chatswood Reserve too, which reaches in inland. So these are two further big components of, of parkland with the potential at a future point to, to expand yet further into um, the New Zealand Defence Force land, which is you know uh, certainly a lot less certain, but not with uh, the Carry Point domain, another big chunk of land on the other side that, that um, is in, is in our, our ownership. So as far as kick, picking off the criteria goes, um, most of our regional parks are on the fringes of the region, but we have something here that's right in the middle, an urban regional park, uh, just at the same time as the, that inner city population and inner suburb population is going through the roof and will continue to do so. I would have thought that was a wonderful opportunity. We know this park has extensive history and heritage um, going back, you know, to the New Zealand's early sugar industry, there's man-made dams, there's workers' cottages, managers' houses, heritage trees, and um, the whole area has a, a Category A historic places uh, listing. If you look at the photos, I defy anyone to say after the photos that were put before us by the local board that this is not a regional park quality environment. It supports wetlands, ponds, native forest, including a lot of cowrie trees, 
grass, promenades, and, and quite a diverse range of fauna and flora. Um, so there's some spectacular sights here. Some of the photos I saw today look like the, you know, you're looking at the unspoiled Amazon jungle. Um, similarly with recreation, quite a wide usage that we have here in terms of, you know, people just sort of relatively passive recreating to, to more active recreation in terms of tramping, dog exercising, and, um, you know, get, getting in and around the many network of tracks that, that are included uh, in the network as a whole. Um, the opportunity to amalgamate them takes it, that must surely take it beyond just this one kind of Chelsea estate to, to, to a much larger entity that has a, a far larger, more significant coverage that, that takes in much of the headland, in fact. Um, in addition to that, um, a regional park that, as presented to us by the local board, would have a, a pretty diverse coastal habitat, um, has some great scenic look, outlooks. So look at that Kendall Bay beach there. It looks like a beautiful beach. So there's a beach included in all this. There's historical par sites. I think Councillor Fletcher mentioned the the Northwest Wild Link, with, you know, with the extensive list of bird species that have been observed there, and and again the the, the cowrie trees that are more prominent in the Chatswood Reserve. Um, so if if we look at the expansion um, conceivably and leave the 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 Fence Force Force land out at the at the moment, but if we go more towards Chelsea Bay and Rawani Reserve, again we're taking in yet further areas that that have a kind of high quality that we associate with regional park um, landscape. So I, I think, Mr. Chair, if if I look at the the visuals that have accompanied the presentations, when I look at the fact that um, this comes at a time when we we're being encouraged to be a little bit more daring in terms of um, Sir Peter Gluckman and, and the, Gluckman and the, the, the kind of the regional park type city, then, then this surely is appropriate timing here. The, the, the local board um, has, has pointed to the fact quite rightly, I believe, as much as the, the kind of 40% visitor from within the local board quotient that was mentioned. Obviously, people are largely unaware of this of this area. It's it's a it's a bit it ha has a localized presence. With Birkenhead uh, Wharf um, and, and the ferry. So to interrupt, Chair, the speaker has had more than five minutes. Okay, I'll I'll, Thank uh, you. I'll I'll look to round it off. The the connections to the city, the connections to an intensifying inner city region. The very high quality heritage, um, environment, and recreational opportunities all scream regional park, or, or 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 at least the potential to expand to have an urban regional park. So I think this this is an opportunity to grasp, to, to forward, um, and and to look look to the future rather than to be kind of with all due respect, to be stumbling along the way it has for the last couple of decades. We had people like Dame Caff and um, Jim Holdaway who have seen the opportunities, who have seen the vision. They saw that back in the 1990s. Uh, we're 2022 now. I, I support absolutely the local board's vision. I support, more importantly, the arguments they've put up for meeting a regional park threshold. And as a consequence, I'll, I will be opposing the... the um, recommendations has been put up and I foreshadow a motion to actually support the furtherance of this wider Chelsea Park region um, into a regional park or at least begin that process for investigation. Thank you, Thank Mr. You Chair. Thank you, Councillor Watson. Uh, Deputy Mayor Cashmore. Thanks very much, Mr. Chair, and I'll be quite, quite quick. Um, I'm going to be supporting the RECs as they are for the simple reason I think there might need to be ongoing discussion, but there, we made, it was made very clear to us the budget comes back regionally to the governing body if this becomes a regional park, and the budget would remain the same. I presume that the people who have been advocating for a regional park status for this area, and it is a beautiful area, I spent two or three hours there um, in my first term as Deputy Mayor uh, on a public consultation day that was very quiet and had a good wander around. It is stunning, but it looked very well maintained to me from what I saw and well used. But if the budget comes 
out of the local board's books onto council's governing bodies books. Um, I'm not sure the local board will be so happy around that. They'll lose influence about to be able to deliver things. They'll only be able to advocate. <clears throat> will there be any extra budget in the immediate future? No. We'll struggle just to maintain service levels as we, as we have them, quite frankly. And um, this is an area that's already very well provisioned for um, community assets as compared to many other regions around the city. So, Mr Chair, I'm supporting the recommendations as you have them for the very reason that there is no extra money to do anything with for the foreseeable future until we, at least until after the next LTP and possibly after that. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, Your Worship. Thank you very much, Mr Chair. Look, um, <clears throat> I've listened quite closely to the debate because I came into this undecided as to whether um, it, it met the qualities and would be worthwhile to make it a regional park or advantageous to make it a regional park. I find I'm pretty much in the same uh, situation as Councillor Dalton and Councillor Coombe. Uh, I don't feel I yet have enough information to support a change. And in the event of not having that information, uh, I'd vote for the status quo, which are these recommendations. And the information that I don't think we have enough clarity around is the financial implications. If this does have operational financial implications uh, for uh, the governing body, then we're not in a position to be spending more money at the moment. And if this, if the change to an a, a regional park, um, you know, were uh, were not to involve any uh, extra funding, well, it, it doesn't solve the underlying comments or, or concerns that the local board have. The second thing is um, I'm, I'm kind of struggling to, to realise whether or not it meets the threshold uh, to be a regional park. And there are people that have got a better concept of that than me, the people that uh, are responsible for running the regional parks. And the staff advice to us clearly is that it doesn't meet that threshold. So I'm reluctant to start uh, renaming things regional parks uh, if if the advice, the professional advice to us is that it does not meet the threshold to qualify as a regional park. Because if it doesn't meet the threshold, then what we're really doing is devaluing the concept of what is and what isn't a regional park. Uh, is it a great park? Yeah, I've been there a, a number of occasions. Uh, I, I think it's a I think it's a lovely area. I think it's a real asset. If there were to be uh, in the future uh, a headland park that involved the defence force land and the land out at uh, Kauri Point, um, then I think you, you might have a, a stronger case for it. But I've heard absolutely no evidence today, nothing even approaching evidence to suggest that the Defence Force is ready to give this up or that any steps have been taken towards um, acquiring that. And if the Defence Force were to give it up, I think as uh, as um, uh, the members of the IMSB have commented, then likely it would uh, would probably have to go through a treaty process and wouldn't necessarily be part of the regional park anyway. So in the evidence, in the absence of strong enough evidence to justify the change, uh, I'm going to I'm going to go with the officials' advice that the status quo should should prevail. That does not mean that sometime in the future uh, a a stronger and better supported case could be made uh, to reconsider that decision. But at the moment, uh, the evidence is not there, in my view, to support the change. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Worship. Councillor Hills and then Councillor Fletcher, they're not close. Kia ora, Chair, and thank you. And thank you for, um, I did ring um, the Chair earlier to see <laughs> an amendment similar to what um, Councillor Watson uh, was talking about, but I was obviously reminded of standing orders that you cannot amend uh, in a direct negative. Um, so I will be not supporting the um, B um, on this around, because uh, I would in all intents and purposes, want to support the community and the local board who have passionately worked on this for some time. Um, both Councillor Darby and I supported the board and the community on pushing this forward for an assessment. Um, obviously, a ton of uh, good work has gone on. I know there are risks, um, and it is unusual for a board to give away um, their decision-making uh, power over this. Um, I do have concerns um, that maybe there is potential for 
uh, less maintenance. I know that obviously if it's a regional park, things like bins will be removed and um, different uh, things that we get as a local park will be removed. Um, and the other thing is that it will be uh, balanced against all regional parks. So the, prior the priorities for these parks will then be balanced against all the other regional parks. So as a councillor, I should know that that is the risk of moving it into a regional park, but um, that is what the community feels is the best approach um, to go forward. So I must support them on that. It is a, an amazing uh, spot. These parks are phenomenal. Um, that I remember when I first got elected to the Kaipatsuki local board, David Roberts um, saying, I need to take you and see all the different tracks and all the different parts through Cody Point, Centennial Park and Chelsea. And we went up, down and through the, the a lot of the tracks that are now been beautifully upgraded that were in a terrible condition back then. Um, I need to acknowledge Sarah and the team. I think that um, Chirpa and the community members do have concerns about maintenance um, because we want to protect every part of this beautiful spot in Kaipatsuki. But even I'm sure they would admit that over the last um, few years and in talking with the staff teams and Sarah Jones and others, that there has been a significant uptick in maintenance and support. We've got millions being spent on tracks in this area. A bridge just got craned in not long ago over one of the ponds. Um, a number of years ago, we had another bridge built, um, significant track upgrades, um, healthy waters upgrades, which unfortunately took a, a lot of the recreational side of the park away for some time. Um, but there are concerns, and we do have concerns over the ponds. They are very old. Um, it's great to hear from Sarah. We had been advocating on the landfill and the use of that space, um, but that has been um, uh, supported to for volunteers to access that space now. So. Um, I think there is merit in having this as a regional park. I can imagine, you know, on local board, we had all these ideas for the cottages and what could be used in the a manager's house. Um, it's great to see those upgraded, but I think there is massive potential here. Um, there are risks and pitfalls, but that is the, the community members and the local board are aware that those things will be out of the local board's control. There is no, um, you know, everything has been told to the local board that they they are very aware of that. But um, there is a feeling that if we are able to uplift this with regional park status, more of Auckland, Tamaki Makoto know about this space, that it will help improve um, the over time and, and the focus on this space. Um, so I'm willing to give that a try and unfortunately not support with, um, the, the staff's great work here. So thank you on that, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Hills. Councillor Fletcher, then I'll close. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'm sorry that I missed part of this discussion. And thank you for having my question posed uh, for, on my behalf. Um, I, I want to reflect on my own commitments on this. Um, Jim Holdaway invited me along with himself to be the founding trustees on the Motutapu Restoration Trust. And I I enjoyed the, the company of John and his wife Anne, and I spent a lot of time with him. Um, he was the chair of, of the trust, not only the the founder, uh, but he he then went on to be involved with a number of other um, very significant ecological restoration programs. And in fact, the Motutapa Restoration Trust uh, created an award in his name when he died, and that was conferred and gifted onto the Auckland Council. And it's interesting that the highest environmental award that we have on Auckland Council is in the name of the late Jim Holdaway. Um, Jim and I spent a great amount of time traipsing over this area for Jim to explain the strategic importance of it. I understand the, the concerns that people have in terms of funding, um, um, just just the, 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 the scale of the problem, the financial problem that the council has. But I, I would implore you to think about the big picture. One of the, one of the important points that Jim highlighted to me before he passed on, and he remained passionate about this until his death, 
was that he knew that this would attract funding. He knew that through the Friends of Regional Parks, through all of the many others who've wanted to see this get off the ground, rather than just being a liability, it could be a possibility. Others have spoken most eloquently about the vision uh, that has been put to us, you know, in terms of using our regional parks going forward. Um, You've, you've had the discussion around the importance of wildlife corridors. Um, I made a commitment to Jim prior to his death that if the occasion ever arose, I would support this being um, a regional park. And from my perspective, and having spent a great amount of time on that site um, with some of the real luminaries in the conservation world, um, I am persuaded uh, that there, there really is a strong case for it. If if there is information that others want, well, maybe we should defer today. Um, but I am disappointed that senior officers, given that I'm supposed to be the park's portfolio holder, didn't bother to come and converse with me on this before it came to the agenda. Um, and I, I think that is a bit disappointing because all of us have got to work together. Regional parks, uh, our local parks, the, these are ones that where there shouldn't be a political divide. Um, I I am persuaded that it does meet that threshold. I I think the local board are right to bring advocacy to us, and for that reason, I would like to see us supporting it today. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fletcher. Um, to close the debate, um, I'm glad that the local board came through for advocacy. But I, uh, when I took this role on, and same with Councillor Casey, we both of well, both of us actually said that all the recommendations that will come through the committee are going to be evidentially based, evidence, not on any assumptions, but evidence. And in this particular case, what's happened is that our staff have done the work that requires for us to make a decision. It's evidence based. They have come to us and they said, not only at the preprint, but at the pre-agenda, and said, we have looked at all of the evidence that we have in front of us. We have spoken with our teams across to, um, the Auckland Council, and there is there is not enough evidence to, to confirm that this should be a regional park. So... From that perspective, I will be supporting um, the staff in regards to this. I also will be uh, putting my regional hat on and looking at the regional parks that we currently have. And look, I, I cannot personally say as chair, and um, I'll leave Councillor Casey to speak for herself, but as chair, I can't say that that, that the monies will be spent if this becomes a regional park. I can't say that because that's not my decision. Um, but look, it, 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 it could happen that we won't have um, the monies that's currently being spent there spent if this is a regional regional park. So for me, my regional hat is on. We had an item here that um, the Mangere Otahu Chair and they opposed the three of the sites that came through to the agenda. But from my perspective, I had to take my regional hat, put that on, and 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 look at, at 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 the role that I have as chair of this particular committee, and I will be um, supporting this as uh, myself and Councillor Casey as the seconder, because we um, have faith in um, the information that has been presented to us. So I'm going to put the recommendation on voices, and I will all those in favour of Division, the recommendation. Please. Division, please. Aye. Okay, division has been... By division. Division has been called. Maya, can you please conduct the division? Thank you. Will do, Chair. Thank you. You're voting on the recommendations on the screen in front of you. Councillor Bartley. Four. Councillor Casey. Yes. Deputy Mayor Cashmore. Aye. Councillor Coombe. Oh, Coombe had to leave, sorry. Councillor Cooper. Four. Councillor Dalton. Four. 
Councillor Darby. Go on, sorry. Chair Filipina. Aye. Mayor Goff. Aye. Councillor Hills. Against, thank you. I'm SB Member Kaki. Four. Councillor Mulholland. Um, against. Councillor Newman. Uh, well, Myra, I actually favour A and C, but I'm not so keen on B. I'm not quite sure how that. We can that record. Can be, sorry, we can, we can. If you want to uh, vote for this, we can record um, that you're against A and B, was it? No, well, well I, I, I'm for, for yeah. A and C, but if I can be recorded against on B. Yes, we could do that. Thank you. Councillor Simpson. Four. Councillor Stewart. Councillor Walker. Councillor Watson. I said against. Sorry, did not hear you. Against. Recorded as against. Councillor Watson. And, um, and against. against as well. I've got a problem with my. Did you get me? Against? Yes. We've recorded you as against. Councillor Watson. Against. I must be member Wilcox. Or. Councillor Young. Or. Madam Chair, uh, 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 you. you Mr. Chair, I have, my name hasn't been called to vote. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. Against. Uh, against. Okay, we will record you. your vote against. Thank you. So that's carried 12 votes to six. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Maya. Um, now I'm going to move um, on to the next item, and that um, there's no extraordinary business. Kathy, sorry, Councillor, uh, myself and Councillor Casey will move the procedural motion to exclude the public. Um, I will put that. All those in favour? Aye. 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 Against? Carried. If we log out of this particular um, link and then move into the confidential, it will also allow people to go and have their stop um, and then come back to the confidential Kilda.